You are about to learn how to use .NET 5 to create a REST API. The creator of this course is a senior software engineer at Microsoft, and he is an excellent teacher. A REST API allows your app or system to expose its functionality to multiple types of clients both inside and outside of your network, including clients across the internet. This is what you would use if you wanted to write a program to collect data from, say, Twitter, Yahoo Finance, or even NASA. If you're looking into building your own REST API and you're considering the .NET platform for it, please stay with me as I show you how to do this end-to-end -end using the latest innovations provided by .NET 5. I hope you enjoy it. In the first part of this tutorial, you're going to learn the scenario to be used across the tutorial, how to create a .NET 5 web API project from scratch, how to use Visual Studio Code for building and debugging the project we're going to work on, how to trust the development certificate installed by .NET 5 and that's going to be needed for HTTPS access, and how to use Swagger UI to interact with the API. To follow the tutorial, you're going to need a few things, including the .NET 5 SDK, Visual Studio Code, and some basic understanding of the C Sharp language. Now let's talk about the scenario that we're going to be using uh, uh, as the domain for this tutorial. So let's imagine that we have some sort of a catalog system uh, and that we have a bunch of items available in it. So in this sense, uh, like I am a video, uh, video gamer, so I like to think of these items as items that I would use within a video game. So items like potions, uh, swords, shields, and stuff like that, right? So that's a system that we have in place. It has a catalog. And uh, of course, we're going to have uh, users that are going to be, uh, would like to manage this catalog uh, via their, their browser, right? They have a browser, they want to manage this catalog of items somehow. So, and things that they would, they would like to do is, well, uh, how are we going to create items in the catalog? Uh, how can we retrieve uh, the, the list of uh, items uh, currently available in this catalog? How can we update properties uh, of, of the items? And how can we delete items in this catalog? So as it is today, uh, we do have the catalog uh, available, uh, but uh, we lack uh, or we don't have uh, uh, a way to expose this catalog uh, to the internet so that people can just go ahead and manage it from the browser. So that's where we're going to introduce uh, a REST API for this catalog. And uh, during this uh, tutorial, we're going to see how to build this REST API from scratch using .NET 5. So here we are in Visual Studio Code. And the first thing we're going to do is open a brand new terminal. And in this terminal, we're just going to switch to the directory uh, where we're going to create our project. And to create the project, uh, we're going to be using the .NET CLI. Uh, so to do that, we're just going to say dot, .NET new and the type of project that we, want, that we want to create for our REST API, that's going to be Web API. And the name of the project is going to be catalog. Hit enter. And that creates, generates uh, all the files based on the Web API template. So now I'm going to open that folder that got generated, catalog. And uh, as you open, uh, as usual, as you open a .NET project in Visual Studio Code, it will prompt you to add a few additional files for building and debugging the project. So I'm going to say yes, and those files get generated under that VS Code. So on the left side, you can actually see all the generated files. And let's take a quick look at uh, each of these files as a quick like lab around. So the first file we're going to look at is the csproc file. And this file uh, is used, it, this is called the project file, and this is used to declare how we're going to build this project. In this case, we're saying that we're going to be using the .NET Web SDK uh, to build the project, which includes a bunch of tools and tasks uh, to specifically design for web kind of projects. The next interesting thing will be the target framework uh, moniker or target framework, which in our case is Net5. Uh, the target framework defines uh, the API surface or what kind of APIs are going to be available uh, to your project. In this case, Net5 is perfectly good for us. And, and the next thing is going to be a bunch of uh, Nougat packages that we're not going to be diving into right now. But those are just dependencies uh, that we already acquired um, uh, on this project. 
close that. And the next file that I'm going to take a look is just program CS. Program CS is what we call the entry point of the application. And uh, what this will do is just uh, pretty much uh, raise uh, or stand up the host that I mean, the, yeah, the process is going to become the host of our program. And it also declares uh, a bunch of defaults and it also sets up what it uh, what we call the startup, uh, startup class uh, for our project. So let's actually go to a startup and see what's going on there. Uh, really, the main things in startup are uh, that uh, we have this property called configuration uh, that we receive as part of uh, the startup constructor. And this uh, you can use uh, anytime you need to read some configuration information from multiple sources, uh, like from uh, environment variables or files, different kinds of files, or a, a bunch of other uh, places, a configuration that you don't want to hard code into your service. The next interesting method is configure services. And this is the, the place where you would uh, uh, register uh, all the services that you're going to be using across your application. And we'll talk about this uh, later on in this video. And the last interesting piece is the configure method. This is what we configure, what we call the uh, 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 the pipeline, right? the request pipeline uh, on ASP.NET. And so this just defines uh, a bunch of what we call middlewares, which are uh, uh, additional components that will execute uh, before uh, your uh, before your your controller or your your code actually executes. So each of the each of these can, can execute uh, uh, as a request comes into uh, into the ASP.NET process and from there all the way into when your code executes. Uh, but uh, we're not going to be exploring this part in, in this video. Um, a couple of other things are uh, so we have a weather forecast. So this is a, a model that gets auto-generated for the sample application here. Just have a, a few uh, very simple properties here. And uh, alongside this, uh, this model, there's a, a controller. Now the controller in, uh, in ASP.NET is just uh, pretty much the class that handles uh, the routes, uh, yeah, pretty much the routes that uh, your service exposes, right? But we're not going to be using this in this video, so let's not dive too much into that. A few other files, uh, upset in JSON. This is where you can declare configuration. Uh, that's going to be that you don't want to use hard code into uh, your into your your program, your your source code. Uh, so and right now it just has some configuration for logging and the hosts that are allowed in the app. There's also a variant of upset in JSON, which is upset in development JSON. Uh, so developing, I mean, the fact that it that says uh, does say upsetting that developing that JSON means that when we are running in development environment, uh, uh, these settings will take precedence on top of the upsettings JSON. So you could have a bunch of these upsettings files for each of your uh, environment, like production, test, integration, all all of these environments. Um, now, if we talk about environments, uh, maybe a good time to take a look at the files generated by VS Code. Uh, which are uh, task.json and launch.json. Task.json is just a file that it declares the tasks. Uh, which, this is a, a key concept on Visual Studio Code. Uh, you can declare tasks, and, and a, a task is can be a bunch of things. And in our case, the most interesting task is the fact that we want to just run the .NET build command, so .NET build, which is going to be used for building our code. And uh, in terms of launch.json, this is the file that controls what is going to be launched or executed uh, when we do like an F5 or when we start debugging the code. In this case, it's already pointing to the right DLL for start to start debugging. Lastly, uh, we also have launch settings.json. And really the only interesting part here that, that I'd like to, you to take a look is the application URL. Uh, here we are defining the URLs, uh, URLs in plural, for our uh, application. Uh, in which case, in this case, we're saying we're going to be serving our, our, our server uh, in uh, localhost 5000 and for the HTTPS version, we're reserving it, in, which is going to be the default version, uh, is going to be 5001. We're also declaring the actual uh, uh, ASP.NET Core environment, environment variable uh, and we're setting it as development. And so, uh, all to in Visual Studio Code, this is not the actual one that's been honored. The one that will, is going to be honored is in launch.json. Uh, as you see over here, this is the one that takes precedent in Visual Studio Code. So, so that's good. Um, 
what we want to do now is actually to test this this uh, project just to make sure that everything is running as expected so what i'm going to do is i'm going to switch to the debug hub over here let me expand this a little bit and so what i want to do is just click and start debugging let's see what happens all right so a browser pops up and then if you're getting this page here it, what it means uh, is it's pretty normal it means that uh, we don't have uh, the self-signed certificate that comes with .NET it has not been uh, trusted right and so and there's a very simple way to go around this issue and to properly trust the certificate that comes with .NET so let me actually just close this and stop and let's switch back to the terminal the Actually, let me open a new terminal here. Yeah, there it is. So in order to trust the certificate that comes bundled with the .NET SDK, uh, what you have to do is just type .NET dev cert HTTPS trust. So when you run this, you're going to get this pop-up uh, asking you to confirm that you actually want to trust that cert. And I'm going to say yes and then uh, that pretty much should do it so i'm going to uh, run it again let's see what we get all right so yeah so we still are not getting pretty much anything here but we are not seeing any trust uh, issue anymore now if you actually want to see something meaningful here although it doesn't matter too much for us at this point what you can do is just go to swagger and then you're going to get this this nice ui so this is uh, what we call swagger or also a open api specification uh, so this is a component that's is bundled now with uh, .NET 5 uh, so you don't have to do anything to make it uh, available as you saw we did nothing uh, so it's just there uh, in the slash swagger uh, url and uh, what this does is allows you to uh, easily uh, uh, describe uh, all the operations all the actions all the routes that are available in your api and allows you to also interact with them easily so if, for example if i just go to the get route and i click uh, try it out click execute it will go ahead and run it and we can see already uh, some results uh, for that route and then one thing that i, that I like to do uh, as i work on these projects is to uh, really not uh, open a browser every single time that i, that I run uh, the project uh, so let, let's actually switch a little bit the behavior of VS Code so that we'll just keep this window open and then uh, anytime we just hit a 5 or hit run uh, it will not open more windows so to do that I'm going to stop here and we can go to launch the JSON and close this the only thing that you have to do is just remove the server ready action section here and that's pretty much it if i run again and by the way you can do this by just pressing uh, f5 which i'll do right now f5 that starts the host as you can see but we did not it did not open any more windows which is fine because we have the browser ready to go right there then the last thing that i like to do uh, in terms of a project setup is to simplify how we build our project in Visual Studio Code. So for that, let me minimize this and go back to Visual Studio Code, stop this, close that. What I'm going to do is to go to Task Adjacent. And the only thing that I'm going to do is uh, to add this little section here under the build task, uh, which is uh, just the, what we call the group, uh, which is kind of build, and it says it's default true. What this does is that allows us to more easily build the project. So now, I can go to, let me just save this, saved. I can go to uh, terminal, uh, run build tasks, and it immediately uh, builds. Uh, without that, we, it will just have pop up yet another menu uh, to do the build. I can also now do Control Shift B, and it will do the same thing. So yes, that just speeds up uh, our build situation. In this second part of the .NET 5 REST API tutorial, we introduce the foundations of our API which includes the core entity used to represent the items in our catalog, the repository class responsible for all item storage related operations, 
and the controller that will handle all the requests sent to a REST API. Here you will learn how to model an entity via C# -sharp record types, how to implement an in-memory repository of resources, and how to implement a controller with get route to retrieve resources. All right. So now that we are comfortable with the initial setup of our project, it is time to start uh, setting up uh, the, the entities and the repository uh, that's going to be used to uh, store and retrieve the items that are going to be used across the service. So the first thing we're going to do is, well, let's actually just close this and the terminal. And let's get rid of a few of these classes that really make no sense for our, for our project. So I'll just delete weather forecast here and I'll delete the weather forecast controller. So we can start cleaner than that. So let's introduce our entity, uh, the item entity. Uh, so for that, let's add a folder here called entities. Some people will say domain, and some other people may say uh, models. Uh, in our case, entities should be good enough. Um, let's create a file here. Let's call it item.cs. Uh, let's follow the right namespace here. So the next page should be catalog. And since we're in the entities folder, let's say entities. And then uh, uh, what you would usually do uh, at this point is declare a, a, a class, right? So you could say public class and let's say item. However, since uh, .NET 5 and C Sharp 9, there's a, a new option here for you, uh, which is what we call the record types. So record types are pretty much uh, are pretty much classes, uh, but they have better support for uh, immutable data uh, immutable data models, right? Which means that uh, once you get uh, one instance of this object, it is not possible to really modify it. And that's pretty convenient, especially for objects that you receive over the wire. So objects that are coming from, uh, from the web, uh, usually you just want to take them and uh, do something with them, but you don't want to modify them, right? Uh, also, uh, record types uh, have this thing called the width expressions, which we we're going to see uh, later on in this tutorial. And uh, they also uh, uh, provide ability to compare based on a uh, value. So value-based equality is what they call, which this means that uh, when you compare uh, two instances of this uh, of an item in this case, uh, those instances uh, will be equal uh, only if uh, all of the properties of that uh, instance are the same, as opposed to just the identity of the object itself, which will be the case of classes. So record types are pretty handy. Uh, and I think are a great option for the uh, for the objects that we're going to be using uh, over here. So let's switch class for uh, record right there. And it is time to introduce uh, the, the properties for this record. So let's add uh, just a few properties here. So let's see. So let's use a uh, GUID for our ID. And let me import that using system. Uh, yeah, system namespace was missing there. And then uh, before adding more properties, let me actually make a small change here. So instead of using get set, let's switch to init. So what is init? Uh, this is another addition in the uh, in C sharp nine in .NET five, uh, which uh, it's a, a great fit for uh, for uh, property initializers uh, that where we want to only allow a setting a value during initialization, right? So this means that, uh, for instance, uh, in the past you could say yeah you could say get set. Uh, what this means is that uh, after you create the, the object, you can just modify, in this case, the ID anytime. So that's not really desirable. We want an immutable property. Uh, so for immutable, we will have set uh, private set, right? And so, yeah, so this makes it immutable, but now it is pretty challenging to construct any instance of this object. So now we have to introduce a constructor and then our customers uh, don't have a, a ni really nicer way uh, to construct our, our objects. So to get into a good middle ground there, they introduced the, uh, the init uh, accessor here. So this means that uh, you can use a creating a creation expression uh, to construct this uh, item object um, as you would do with a with a set but after the creation uh, you can no longer modify this property so it's a very nice uh, balance uh, between the, the the two worlds in there and we'll see how this plays out uh, later on so at this point let's just define our, our properties 
so let's see let's add uh, of course uh, a name a name uh, it's going to be string name also in it let's add let's add uh, a price for our item price uh, also in it oops and finally let's add a uh, um, daytime offset this is a uh, create a date so this is going to be the uh, the date and time uh, where the item got created in the system let's also not forget to change this to init and now it is time to introduce our repository which is the class that is going to be in charge of storing the items in the system to keep things simple for now we will only use an in-memory repository and a few episodes later in the tutorial we will bring in a proper database so let's create a new folder here called repositories and here we will add a new file let's call it um, in mem items repository let's put uh, the right name space here let's not forget that it's going to be catalog that repositories And now uh, let's create a class. So, holy class, I'll just grab the name from the name of the file. Right? Uh, what we're going to do here, like I said, this is in memory. So, we're just going to define a very simple list uh, of items uh, that uh, are going to be the initial items that we're going to be working with. So, let's declare uh, a list here. So, let's see, write rate. Uh, I'll make it read only because it should not uh, change. Uh, I mean, the, the, the instance of the list should not change after the, we construct this uh, repository uh, uh, object. It's going to be a list of item. Oop. List of item. And I think, uh, yeah, so list of item, uh, items. And yes, we need to import the couple of namespaces there collection generic for the list and catalog entities for the item and we're going to say this is uh, new and here we're going where we're going to declare the list now this is one uh, another addition in c sharp 9 uh, as you see here in the past you may have needed to say okay so this is new list of items right but that's a bit redundant uh, since we already know clearly this is a list of items so why why so much ceremony so let's just remove this and that's all you need to do at this point so nice addition c sharp 9 and so let's add a few items here so let's say new item and let's uh, let's do uh, the initialization here so let's just do random goits new goit for the id and again let's import the missing name space and so for the name and so, so like I mentioned in the introduction, uh, I like to play with these items in terms of video game items. So the first item that I'm going to introduce here is a potion, super classic in, in these video games. And then let's say the price for that one is going to be just nine. And for created date, well, I'll just say date time offset. You uh, see now. So that means right now in terms of UTC so not the local time just the UTC time and just as we did this one let's add oops a couple more so same a uh, good uh, I mean yeah a new good for each of these ones uh, but let's call this one uh, it's going to be a items word items word and let's say it's going to be more expensive let's make it 20 and then for the last one, let's say we're going to do round shield. It's going to be a bit cheaper. So let's say 18. All right. So there it is. We have our initial list of items uh, ready to go. 
Now, in this uh, repository, um, we're going to have to deal with a bunch of things, right? So how do we get an item? How do we get a collection of items? How do we create an item, update, delete, all these things? So to keep things simple, let's start with a get. So we're going to do two get methods here. And the first one is going to be get items. And for getting items, we're going to do, we're just going to get return an enumerable of item, get item. Right, so enumerable is pretty much the, the very basic, enumerable is a basic uh, interface uh, that you can use to uh, return a, a collection of items. Um, and then, yeah, so it's going to be as simple as say, well, let's just return whatever we have in items right now. That's all it is. So that's our get items method. And the next one is going to be similar, but this guy is going to return uh, just uh, one item is going to be named get item, but this is going to need to know uh, the ID of the item to return, right? Okay, it's that, and then uh, so in order to retrieve the correct item, what we're going to do is just say, okay, so let's return from the items collection, and I'm going to say where, and this requires importing yet another namespace system.link importing now and so we're going to say okay so from that list where the item id uh, equals the id that we got in the parameter and that's going to return a collection but we don't want the collection we just want uh, the one item that that it should find or default where default is going to be null so if it finds the item it will return it if it doesn't find it it will return null all right, so that makes up our repository. And so the next thing to bring in is a controller. So like I said, the controller is going to be uh, the class that receives a request that uh, has been sent uh, by our client and that handles it properly. So let's add our controller class then. So new file under the controllers folder. And uh, since the resource we are dealing with here is uh, items, so the convention will be to just name it Items controller. That's yes, right? And again, let's declare the right name space. Catalog. In this case, it's going to be controllers. Controllers. All right. So this controller is going to be public class items controller. And then the interesting thing about controller classes is that uh, you always want to inherit from controller base. Uh, that gives you, uh, and let's also import the namespace here. So that will effectively turn this into a controller class, right? So let's always inherit from controller base. That's the first thing. Uh, the next thing is to uh, uh, mark this class as an API controller. Oops, right there. Yeah, API controller. So this brings in, in a, a, a bunch of additional default behaviors for your controller class that just makes our lives easier. So yeah, don't forget to add API controller there. And yeah, and by the way, there's tons of documentation on each of these uh, uh, attributes over there in the web. Um, next thing is to declare the route. So the route defines uh, uh, to which uh, HTTP route uh, this controller is going to be responding. And uh, uh, by default, what uh, you would put here is just the name of the controller. So if you do this, uh, this, this will mean uh, that uh, whatever the name of the controller is, that's going to be the route, right? And so in this case, for instance, let's say for a get, you would do get slash items, right? That's going to be part of the URL that we'll be using. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you can do it either that way or you can explicitly declare uh, the route that you want to use. Like I could say, do items, which is perfectly valid. And in fact, let's stick with that. And let's move forward. Now here in this controller, of course, uh, uh, for any action or any operation we're going to do, uh, we're going to be needing that uh, repository uh, that we worked on uh, a moment ago. So let's bring in an instance of that we're going to declare private read-only uh, again because it's not going to be modified after construction um, items repository 
for C30, right? And uh, yeah, for the space, uh, we have it ready. Now, before moving forward, let me just tell you that uh, we'll be making a few not so ideal choices as we move forward, just to explain a, a bunch of concepts, right? So the fact that I'm introducing explicit dependency into in-mem items repository, uh, it's uh, it's not ideal, but I just want to, you to, um, to keep it simple and then improve uh, as we move forward, right? So just, just don't take this as a final word on how you should do this. Now, um, we're going to construct this in the in the constructor of this uh, controller. So let's add a items controller as the constructor. Okay, and then let's say yeah, so repository equals new in main items repository, right? So boom, we have a repository right there, ready to be used. So let's define our routes. It's time to define our routes. So let's see. How do we define a route to retrieve all the items? So let's, let's do it. Let's, let's declare a method called um, enumerable of item. Sorry, item. Get items. Okay, so this is a method that's going to return an enumerable of item, just like the repository. Uh, let's import the right spaces. What are we missing here? Okay, uh, but then also uh, in order for uh, for this method to actually become a, a, a route and, and react to some HTTP verb, uh, you have to declare uh, the right uh, the right attribute. In this case, HTTP get is what we what we want to declare for this. So by doing this, it means that when somebody goes to uh, performs a get uh, against slash items, uh, this is a method that's going to be uh, reacting to that. Right, and you'll see how uh, uh, in a few cases uh, we pretty much have the same route, but it is the verb that makes a distinction into which method is going to be invoked. Then, what do we do in this HTTP get? Uh, so, fairly straightforward. What we're going to say is okay, so we have uh, items is going to be repository. And uh, you remember we created this get items method, so we just invoke it. We have the items, and then we return the items and that's all it is okay so with that we should be able to test this out and see how, how that goes so I'm going to uh, hit a 5 here all right I'm going to go back to swagger and I'm going to just refresh uh, the page that we kept open from the previous video uh, as you can see, everything got refreshed now. There's no more weather controller. Now we have a items controller, and we have our first route here, which is a get for items. Uh, we not, not only that, we also have a schema that describes uh, an item, uh, how an item will be laid out. If we click on items, and let's see, try it out, let's see what we get. And uh, right here, as you can see, Swagger will uh, show the uh, the route that would execute it. Like we said, it's a get uh, on slash items. This this is here is, is our host and the port. So it gets uh, local host, 5001 items. And uh, here's the result. So we have our three items that we declare as a, as a static, uh, well, as uh, the initial value for our items collection, right? So the potion, the sword, and the shield, right there. This is working great. So now let's stop this and add our second route, which is the route to return one specific item. So this is going to be public uh, item, get item, and then we need to receive a GUID, right? And then are we missing a namespace again? Let's see, yes, we're missing a namespace. That's what it is. And then just like before, we just say, well, bar item equals repository dot get item okay so this is the other method that we added to the repository we just pass the id and we return that item now again we need to mark uh, a, a, to apply the right verb here so it's going to be an http get but in this case there's a little additional detail which is the template so we have to provide a, a template where we specify um, how are we going to treat uh, another piece of the route? Like in this case, the route is not going to be just get 
slash items it's going to be get slash items and uh, the the id of the item right which is is that piece of the template i'm just just going to put it like that so when you request the items slash and a specific item id then this this piece is going to get executed right so yeah let's see how that goes i'll do f5 again okay this is running back to swagger i'm going to just refresh a page and as you can see now we have our second route available and like i said this is slash items slash id so in order to execute that let's uh well uh, let's actually execute the first one items to get a list of all of our um uh, items that we know about and uh, let's grab the first one so theory we should be able to get that item via the the other route so get by id so let's try it out i'll paste the item here so this is how in in, in open api swagger you can uh, introduce values right and i'll execute that see what happens so here's the executed route so you can see slash items and the slash the actual id and then uh, interestingly we are getting a 204 right so this means that something didn't uh, go quite as expected so what i'll do is i'll go back to uh, visual studio code and i'll put a breakpoint over here see what we're getting so i'll go back to swagger ui and execute here we got a breakpoint and uh all right so we're getting null so that's what's happening so the item is not being found so why could why would that be well let's see here's our items and here's our get item um, method and so yeah so really what was happening here is that uh anytime we make a request to this to our controller to our uh, to our service uh, we are actually creating uh, as you can see over here a new instance of the inmem items repository right so that new instance is created a brand new list is created which a random set of new GUIDs here and of course when we try to use a previously used GUID uh, it will not find it because now we have a, a brand new list so I'm going to, going to do f5 uh, just to let it go and uh, uh, this is a good actually a good thing because it helps us realize that uh, we need to deal with that situation properly in the uh, in the controller so in this get item uh, method uh, we should be uh, not just returning a null right so how do we handle this so let's stop it so the thing that we probably want to do is to return the proper status code HTTP status code in the case that we can find the item so uh, let's say so if item is null right so let's return actually something different so let's return uh, not found so that's the way to actually ask a, a .NET uh, to create a proper status code for not found so we don't have to actually figure out so what's the actual status code um, and then yeah if it is found then we will just go ahead and return the item now we do have a problem here because now uh, in, in one branch we're re trying to return this type uh, not found result in this other branch we're trying to return just an item so what is it going i mean it's not liking it right uh, we're expecting to always return an item how do we deal with this uh, is uh, by the use of the uh, action result type so if we do action result that actually allows us to return more than one type from this method uh, so as you see there's no more errors because now this is saying okay if if uh, if you want to return not found return not found or if you want to return the type that is in the uh, the generic type right here you're also uh, able to do that right or we can also say something like okay item if you wanted to that's that would be fine too uh, but now in this case uh, we can handle both cases so let's run this again and see what we get the idea is to get the proper status code uh, for each of these actions to be properly restful so let's refresh this let's again let's get one of these items i'm going to try it out um, execute so again yeah again, you just get one of these we know it's not going to find it but 
let's get that good and then open up here try it out put the id and execute so this time we do get a 404 which is a correct status code for not found as you can see here in this third part of the .NET 5 REST API tutorial, we learn about the dependency injection technique and how to leverage it to properly inject a repository instance to the items controller. We also introduce the concept of data transfer objects and how to use them to establish a clear contract with our API consumers. Today you will learn what is dependency injection, how to register and inject dependencies in .NET 5, how to implement data transfer objects, also known as DTOs, and how to map entities to DTOs. In a previous video, we were able to actually uh, create uh, our entities, repositories, and even a controller uh, to be able to get uh, items and, and our specific item. However, we found an issue where we're trying to retrieve one item. We can't retrieve it because as we found, and just go back to the code, um, uh, anytime we uh, receive a request in our items controller, we're creating a new instance of a repository and that's bringing a, a bunch of uh, new items uh, in such a way that we are never able to, to find it, right? So how can we go around it? I mean, how can we actually fix this uh, the right way? Uh, so for this, uh, there's a, a pretty important concept that we need to learn here and uh, which is called dependency injection. So let's talk about that. So what is dependency injection? Let's think about uh, our class, right? So we have a class uh, which wants to make use of uh, some other class. When we have this kind of relationship, uh, we say that this other class is a dependency of uh, our class, right? And um, in more concrete terms, in our case, uh, we have the items controller, which in its constructor is uh, creating a new instance of uh, the repository, right? The InMem uh, items repository. Now, what we really want to do in terms of dependency injection is flip things a little bit. And instead of have items controller construct that instance, uh, and I'll just uh, open up my highlighter here, um, uh, we will receive the repository in the constructor and then just take that, that, uh, that reference uh, into the class. So at this point, we are uh, injecting the repository dependency into the items controller class. Now, this is also uh, brings in something uh, very important, which is the dependency inversion principle, in which, uh, again, so we have a class and we have some dependency, and let's call it dependency A. And, well, this class depends on dependency A. But uh, what we want to do is just not take that kind of uh, dependency and instead, uh, have our uh, our class uh, depend on a, an abstraction, which is uh, in this case in in C sharp, it is an interface, right? So the class no longer depends uh, on dependency A; it just depends on some interface that dependency A will implement, right? So we have inverted the dependency by having a, a class only depend on an interface, and dependency A implement that interface. And the same way, uh, I mean, as we do that, uh, we could bring in uh, dependency V or any other dependencies that also implement interface. But in this case, you can imagine now the repository that uh, items controller receive is just an interface. So class in this case has no idea of which explicit dependency it is working with. It could be A, B, or any other dependency. As long as they implement the contract, which in this case is the interface, uh, this abstraction, uh, class is very happy to work with it. Okay, so that's, that is the dependency inversion principle. And uh, well, the thing is, okay, so why, why do we want to do this? Well, really a couple of reasons. Uh, and yeah, like I said, like it says right there, so by having our code dependent, dependent upon abstractions, we're decoupling implementations uh, from each other. So it gives us much more uh, freedom in terms of moving around these dependencies without ever having to touch our class. And uh, this makes the code cleaner, easier to modify, and much easier to reuse. Um, but if, and by the way, it's also much easier to, to test. But then, if we're going to do this, uh, how are we going to construct these dependencies, right? Because now we're just receiving them in the constructor. So if we have uh, all these dependencies, dependency A, B, C, uh, how are we going to construct them? So 
because uh, our class wants to receive them, right? We're going to inject them there. So comes uh, into play this thing called a uh, service container, which in terms of uh, .NET 5 uh, is um, uh, an ICE service provider. So, and what happens is that uh, during uh, application, the application startup, we're going to register uh, each of these uh, dependencies are going to be registered into the service container. And then uh, eventually when the class gets uh, instantiated, the, the service uh, I service provider, the service container is going to take care of uh, resolving uh, any of the dependencies needed by this class, like it has a map of all the dependencies that are needed by each of our classes. So it resolves the dependencies, constructs them if needed, uh, only the first time, of course, uh, and depending, well, actually depending on the application lifecycle that has been set up for those uh, dependencies uh, for the class. Uh, so if needed, constructs this, otherwise it will reuse it, and then it ejects the dependencies. And uh, this is, in fact, what's going to help us uh, with the little problem that we have right now in the in the project, where we don't want to be constructor, uh, constructing. I mean, we don't want to get explicit dependency on the repository, and we don't want a construction explicit construction of one instance every time we create the, the controller. We just want to receive an instance if it's available and only construct it, get it constructed first time, and get it constructed by the service container. Let's see now how we can use dependency injection to our advantage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get back to Visual Studio Code. So let's stop debugging, close terminal. And so let's fix this situation where we have this explicit dependency on in-mem item repository. So the first thing we're going to need is some interface so that items controller uh, does not really uh, operate on concrete instances of the repository. So let's go to uh, in-mem item repository. And what we're going to do is just Right click on the class and um, actually in the light bulb and let's extract interface. So that's going to create uh, the interface for us and makes uh, in main item repository implement that interface. Now we probably want to take that interface out into its own file. So let's do that. A new file. And let's actually call it. Uh, I items repository it should be a better name for this. Okay, and so namespace uh, catalog that repositories, and here's where we're going to bring in our interface. I'm going to just cut and paste here. There it is. Need to import a couple of namespaces. Let's see for the entities. Force is for good, uh, collections generic, that should do it. All right, so we have our interface and uh, here's the repository. Repository implements the interface. And now that we have the interface, let's go back to our controller and uh, uh, let's switch this into, uh, I mean, this, this type into I uh, items repository. Oh, what is it? I items repository. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure this is. Oh, yeah, we have to do the right naming here Sorry for that. Okay. And uh, now we're going to receive it here. So I items repository. Uh, this is the repository. And then uh, just to not confuse uh, things, let's say this that repository equals repository. All right. So yeah, so now we got the pens injection working here and uh, no longer this class has any idea of which repository uh, is going to be used behind the scenes. Now, uh, the other thing we have to do here is to, uh, oh, what's going on here? Actually, I item repository just fixing that in our repository. The other thing is that we have to do the registration, right? So to do the re registration of uh, our repository, what we're going to do is just go to startup, configure services. So this is the place where you register all these services that are going to be used across your service. And the service that we need now is our repository. So let's do services dot 
add singleton. Now there's a bunch of ways uh, to add uh, your uh, to register your services here. I'm going to be using a singleton. So and a singleton is nothing nothing else other than just having one copy uh, of of the instance of a type across the entire lifetime of our service. So only one will be created and uh, it will be reused whenever whenever it's needed. So that's going to help us resolve the problem that we have today. And so to add a singleton, first we specify the interface. So I add a repository, which we may need to add. Uh, yes, we need namespace. And then, so that's the interface. And then the concrete instance is uh, in mem items repository, right? And that's it. So that's how you register uh, your dependency. And so at this point, we should be ready to should be ready to go. So I'll do F5. And now I'll switch to Swagger. Uh, so we have uh, the same uh, APIs as before. I'll refresh anyways. And then let's try an exercise now. So let's see. I'll try out our items uh, endpoint. So I'll get one of our items. And I should be able to find it now. So let's see uh, items ID, try it out. I'll put the ID here and then let's try to find it. Execute. Still have a breakpoint here. Let's see. Yes, so this time we can resolve it. No more null. Remove the breakpoint. Run. Back to Swagger. And then here it is. We got a response code 200 for the request of that item. And here's all the body, uh, the description of that item. So, uh, as expected, uh, now we only have one copy of repository hanging around, which is injected into the controller, and that allows us to actually find uh, the item we were looking for. Now, there's one more thing to notice here that we should fix uh, as, uh, right away, and which is the fact that uh, these uh, uh, these uh, routes that we have enabled right now are uh, enabling uh, or are exposing our item entity directly to the outside. And we have to understand that as we build a REST API, we're also establishing a contract with any of uh, the clients that we're going to be using, which is a contract that we should not be breaking easily. And the problem that we have right now is that since we're exposing item, which is the item that we are using for dealing with persistence with, with the repository, uh, Anytime we want to add field, I mean, anytime we want to modify or remove uh, any of the fields that we are that we are using in our in a storage right now in the repository, uh, we can potentially break our clients, right? Break that contract, which is a really no go uh, for uh, as you build these REST services. So how can we avoid exposing this uh, item contract there? So let's let's take a look. Let's go back to the project. Let's actually find that entity. So we have item here, and as we said, we are returning it both in get items and in get item. So what we're going to do now is introduce what we call a, a DTO or a data transfer object. So a data transfer object is nothing else other than the uh, the actual contract that's going to be enabled uh, between the client and our service. And to do that, we're going to do, introduce a new folder here. Let's call it uh, DTOs. And let's add a new file for our uh, item DTO, right? Item DTO. So again, uh, namespace, catalog. In this case, it's going to be DTOs. And the item DTO is going to be fairly similar to our uh, item, actually. So let's, uh, I'm going to just copy the, the item. And so, going to add missing nine spaces here and there yep and uh, yeah I mean in this case it happens to be that the item that we want to return uh, in our methods is pretty much the same as the item that we're going to be storing in, in the repository uh, or retrieving from the repository and so which is okay uh, seems a bit redundant right now, but the benefits uh, become evident as you move forward, uh, as you start modifying your database. Uh, you don't have to be touching this contract, uh, or you can be very careful with the contract as opposed to be breaking our clients uh, anytime. So this gives you a lot of flexibility as you evolve uh, your uh, data store. So now that we have, uh, actually, let's rename this to item DTO. Sorry for that. Okay, item DTO. 
And now that we have that, uh, it is time to start uh, using it, right? So let's go back to items controller. And so at this time, what we'll need to do is uh, to convert the items that we're getting, let's starting with get items, right? We have to convert this in, from item into item DTO. So one way to do this would be to just do a simple projection uh, with link. So we would do uh, select, and then yeah, I may be missing the link name space here. I'm going to add it. I'm going to say okay, so item project into a new item DTO, and I may need to add any space here. There it is. And so here we're going to bring in the, the properties, right? So I'm going to say, all right, so ID is equals item dot ID name equals item name, same thing, price, create date. Okay, so now we have uh, our items collection is actually a, a collection of item DTO. I think we're missing a parenthesis here. And we return uh, those items, no longer item, it has to be item DTO setting up the contract. Okay, so yeah, so that should do it. We have transformed the item into item DTO. And as you may guess, we have to do pretty much the same thing over here, right? Uh, but at this point, it, that, that will be a bit redundant, right? So why would we want to do this transformation twice with exactly the same properties? So one way that we can uh, overcome this is by adding a, an extension method. Uh, so let me show you what I mean by that. So I'm going to add a new file here. I'm going to call it extensions. Okay, so catalog. And then uh, what extension does, extension method does is it just really extends the definition of a uh, one uh, type by adding uh, some uh, method that can be executed on that type. So in this case, we're going to uh, add a class public static class. So for extension methods, you have to use a static class. That's the way to go. Uh, extensions. And then we're going to declare one method here. Public static It's going to return item DTO and it, we're going to call it as DTO and what is going to it's going to operate on uh, the current item that's, that's what this method means so again let's add some namespaces here um, there it is so this method receives an item right and um, by by using this here it means the current item uh, can have a method called as DTO that returns its uh, item DTO version so at this point, we can probably uh, take advantage of what we did here. So let's see, this is what we used to create item DTO. So we can say, well, return new item DTO out of the item that we received. So there it is, we have an extension method ready to be used. So now when we go to items controller, what we can do is instead of all of this, we can say, so item is projected into item dot as DTO, and that's all it is. Let's collapse this a bit. And with that, we can also use the same method over here. So when we get the item, we all will say as DTO. Of course, we need to change this into our DTO contract. And then the rest, actually, I would do this. So let's just get the item first, check if it is new. And if it's not, then we do the as DTO. Okay, so now that we have done that, uh, let's see how that goes. So I'll do a five again. Okay, back to Swagger. And I'm going to refresh this. And let's see if this still works. So items, I'm going to try it out. Execute. And yeah, just like before, we can get the list of items. But this time, if you scroll down, you'll see that the schemas, the contract that we're exposing to our consumers is no longer item, but it is item DTO with the properties exposed right here. In this fourth part of the .NET 5 REST API tutorial, we introduce additional controller actions for creating, updating, and deleting items. We will also learn how to validate the incoming DTOs to prevent invalid data from landing in the service. 
Today you will learn how to create resources with POST, how to validate the values of DTO properties, how to update resources with PUT, and how to delete resources with DELETE. It is time now to introduce uh, the rest of our uh, our routes, right? So a route for a POST to create an item, a route for update to update, update the item, and the route for DELETE to be able to delete uh, the item. So uh, let's start with POST, right? And before doing anything else, what we're going to have to do is to uh, update a repository to be able to have that uh, create uh, that route for creating an item, right? Uh, so let's do that. And I'm going to start again uh, by going to the interface. Uh, that's the first thing to do. And so let's declare void um, create item 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 okay so this new method just uh, returns nothing and it only it just receives the item that needs to be created into the uh, repository now let's switch back to the our uh, concrete in mem item repository and i'm going to say implement interface so that brings in uh, the new method right there and uh since it's an in memory repository this, this is as straightforward as just saying uh, items that add item that's all it is and then uh, now we need to expose this into the controller right so it's time to add around the controller but before doing that uh, we got to realize that uh, so the client is going to be sending uh, this uh, this item and we will have to establish another contract for receiving that that, that item it cannot be item dto because we don't need uh, as many uh, uh, properties as in item dto for the creation of an item so let's see what i mean uh, by that so i'm going to go to our details folder i'm going to create a new file and uh, let's call it um, create item dto and add name space catalog that dtos and then uh, okay just like before uh, we're going to be using uh, a record for this pretty convenient for DTOs and so now if you look back at item DTO uh, let's see so what would make sense to be sent by the client as we create an item so normally the ID is auto generated uh, in, on the server side right so we don't need to be passing in that ID we do need a name and a price and likely the created date is going to also be generated on the service so we're only going to be including these two there it is so we have name and price and that will be it for our create item DTO and now let's see how we can use it in the controller so back to the controller um, let's see how do we declare this a uh, post route uh, so it's going to be yes, public uh, an action result because again we could return more than one thing in this method things could happen and uh, the, con uh, the convention for a post or a create method is to create the item and return the item that got created so if you're going to do that we are going to we should be fine to return the item DTO now the, the conventions here are going to vary so some people will create their own response object here it doesn't have to be item DTO it happens to be that it works fine for us in this case so that's okay so it's going to be called create item um, create item DTO that's going to be our input contract item DTO okay and then let's qualify this uh, with the right verb so it's HTTP post and then uh, just for documentation we'll say so yeah so this is going to be invoked when somebody does a post into the items route with the correct body of course so how do we create an item so very straightforward we're going to say well item item equals new we don't have to specify the type so thanks C sharp nine uh, and then yeah so let's just say ID equals uh, here's where we actually uh, uh, generate the ID for the item so it's going to be good that new good so the name is 
identity.name, same for the price, that price, and then the created date is as you would expect uh, the time uh, offset that UTC now. So that's the item. And now we have to, well, we'll take advantage of the repository method we just created. Create item, and then item goes there. And then uh, once the item has been created, uh, the convention here is to, uh, yeah, I mean, to return the item that got created and also uh, to return a header that specifies where you can go ahead and get information about that created item. So to do that, what we can do is use uh, created at action. Uh, you could also use created at route. That's another way to do it. Created action will work fine for us uh, because what we can do here is say, okay, so what's the action uh, that we want? What's the action that reflects um, the route to get information about the item? That's going to be our get item action right here. So what we can do here is say, well, that's going to be the name of get item. And then uh, we need to specify uh, uh, the ID that's going to be passed to that other route. So for that, let's create just a simple anonymous type here uh, with ID equals item ID. So that's a generated ID. And then finally, the actual object that's going to be returned, which is item. And again, let's take advantage of our extension method as DTO. So we take the item that got created and then we just convert it as a DTO. And yeah, that's it. Let's do F5. See if this works. So back to Swagger. Let's refresh this. So now we have our post route over here, as you can see. And also our great identity is showing up as a new contract that we are exposing to our clients. So let's go to post, try it out. And as you can see now, we only need to provide a name and a price. So let's see for the name. So let's see, let's bring in something like uh, another type of sword, I guess. So let's see, uh, Latinum sword. It's going to be a bit expensive, let's say 35. And yeah, so that's that. Let's execute, see what we get. So as you can see, here's the request URL, the same as the get, but in this case, it is a post. Uh, we have gotten a 201, meaning uh, created at route. So it got created, the new sword. And as you can see here, we have a location header that specifies where is that we can find that item. So if we actually take this, uh, this good here and we go to our, uh, let's collapse this and go to our get route, I'm going to try it out. We're going to paste that here, execute. Uh, as you can see now, this is the route that was provided in the location header for post and it actually is able to find the platinum sort that we just created. And in fact, if we just get, get the full list of all the items, try it out, execute. So now we don't have just three, we have four items, including the, that platinum sort. But then let's also try one more thing. Uh, what happens if I try to create something without a name? Does that make sense? Well, let's try it out. Uh, turns to be that that was accepted and now we have an item uh, with a null value, which is totally unacceptable. And um, and again, in fact, we just go to the get route and we say uh, execute, and we can see we have an item uh, with null, which is pretty bad. How can we uh, protect ourselves against that situation? So there's this thing called uh, data annotations, uh, which is something we can add to our um, uh, DTO in this case uh, to prevent that situation. So back into create item DTO, what we can do is just uh, request that this field is required. And I'm going to add uh, the data notation thing space in there. Uh, so it name has to be provided and price has to be provided. And for price, not just that, let's do one more thing. Let's say, uh, there's going to be a range of possible values for price because we should probably not accept a negative value or even a, a zero here. So let's say that we're only going to accept values from, let's say from one to 1000. That should be a valid range for us. So just by doing this, we, we are protecting uh, the, the values are going to be coming into the controller. So I'm going to do F5 again. 
and uh, let's see how that goes so back in Swagger I'm going to be collapsing this route so back in post I'll just try to do the same thing again I'll try to execute this and this time now we have a 400 so bad request error uh, and clearly it says here that name field is required so now data validations are coming into place and so we must provide uh, a name uh, let's say actually play with the price here let's say I try a negative number right see what happens the field price must be between one and a thousand right so data notations for validations pretty useful uh, for validating our, our, our DTO now it's time to implement our uh, update route. So let's go back to so Studio Code, close terminal. And just like before, let's go back to our uh, repository, I, I, items repository interface and add the relevant method. So let's say this is going to be a void, again, update item. And this is going to receive the item to get updated. Very similar to create item. Now, uh, back to the concrete implementation. I'm going to say again, implement interface. That brings in the method, update item. So how would we update this item? Uh, so since it is an in-memory uh, list, uh, really the only thing that we have to do is just find the relevant item and update it with the incoming item, right? So to do that, let's do, let's just find the index of the relevant item. So I'm going to say items, find index, and then, uh, and so this is the existing item. So you're going to find the existing item where existing item dot ID matches uh, item dot ID. Okay, so that's just finding the index of that of the item that we're looking for, and when we found it, we can do items index equals item that's all it is so we will update the item in the right location so it's time to go back to the controller well almost time to go back to the controller because uh, as you may realize at this point uh, we do need uh, some DTO to receive the input for the uh, update route and um, even when the, that this input is going to be pretty much the same as with create item DTO it is a good practice to actually have a, a, another a, DTO for this case because you don't know like right now it's the same thing but eventually it could be that an update means something different uh, than a create so let's just do update item DTO um, yeah it's a copy of create item DTO pretty much has the same properties it's the only thing that you can modify the name and the price and uh, required and the range right so now let's go back to the controller items controller uh, let's create our update route. So this is going to be again public action result. Um, in this case, uh, the convention for a put is to actually not return anything. So just what we call no content. Uh, so it's going to be no type here other than action result. It's going to be called update item. Uh, we need to receive two things. The first thing is the GUID of the uh, the ID of the item and then the our new update item DTO let's call it item DTO and then let's not forget to add the correct verb here since an HTTP uh, put and just like we did before the route is going to be just for documentation it's when you do a put into slash items and then uh, slash, uh, that's a piece that we're missing actually here. We need to also specify here the, the, the template, which is in this case is the ID. So that means that when, when we do a put, we have to specify the ID in, in such a way uh, uh, like this, right? So put items slash the ID, and then we'll hit this method here. So let's see, so first thing, so how will we do an update? First thing to do is uh, find the item so system item and we'll use the, our repository for that we already have a method for this which is get item passing the id and then uh, it will be great to verify if this id if this item actually exists so if existing item uh, is null then 
Well, we couldn't find it, so we will just return not found. And that's the end of the story for that, that branch. And then if we find it, if we found it, uh, what we're going to do is just, uh, well, proceed to do the, uh, we're going to create a, a, a new item, which is the updated item in, in our system. So in this case, what we're going to say is item updated item equals, it is actually our existing item, but with a couple of differences. Uh, like we need to use uh, the name, of the uh, provided item DTO and the price of that also provided item DTO. So now here I, I just use one uh, one uh, nicety of uh, record types uh, that I mentioned uh, when I was talking about record type, which is the, the width expression here. So what's happening here is that we're saying, okay, so we're taking this existing item here and we're creating a copy of it with the following two properties modified for new values. So that, that's a very nice addition into uh, uh, records and allows me to use uh, what is really an, an immutable type, but still I can go ahead and modify uh, some properties on initialization. So updated item is just a copy of existing item with a bunch of uh, updated properties. Very nice addition in record types. When we have this updated item, uh, we can go ahead and say, okay, so repository dot update item, the method that we just created and send the updated item and like I said the convention is to return no content so nothing to report so just return that let's try this out f5 and back to swagger refresh so here it is our put um, our put route and uh, before doing a put let's actually get a uh, one of our uh, uh, items so try it out, execute. So let's say we're going to modify our potion here. Okay, so the potion, I'm going to collapse this, open put. So for put, we have to provide an ID and updated values here. So this is a potion, let's actually rename it to, uh, let's say super potion. And let's bump the price uh, to, I don't know, let's say, um, 29. So execute and then just as expected uh, we get a 204 which is uh, no content and you can see the route that was executed here and then if it succeeded we should be able to get uh, um, an updated uh, portion there. So I'll just get the full list of all the items that we have now. Let's see what happens and uh, there it is. No longer portion, super portion with updated price. Also notice down here that we do have uh, uh, this update item DTO available now here, the new contract. So with update ready, the last thing to add is our delete route. So let's go back to controller, uh, sorry, back to the project. And just as before, back to the repository interface. And let's do uh, void delete item with ID. Only thing that we need for deleting an item is just to know the ID of, of it. So back to the repository. Let's implement the interface for delete item. And actually delete item is going to be very similar to update item. First thing that we have to do is find the item, I mean the index of the item. And now we can just say items that remove at remove at uh, that index. That's all it is. Ah, sorry, we have to say ID here. So we have the repository ready and now uh, we can move forward to the controller. Uh, in this case we're not going to need uh, another uh, DTO because the only thing that's needed here is just a simple ID. So let's just implement the controller action. So public action uh, result uh, delete item, and just like with update, we're going to return no content. So action result, delete item, uh, good ID, and let's add the verb. So this is going to be an HTTP delete. And again, documentation. So this is going to honor delete slash items, 
and then slash uh, let's not forget our uh, template which is the ID so slash items ID and to perform the deletion similar it's actually a bit similar to update uh, so let's try to find the item first I'm going to just copy that piece there so not found if we can find it and then we go ahead and do repository dot delete item and the ID and just like we did before return no content and that's all it is so F5 and back to Swagger refresh again and now you can see we have our delete uh, action available so let's capture the name of one of our items and see if we can delete it we'll execute this so let's try to delete that potion copy collapse expand try out put the ID and execute so here's the route and well, we got 204 it's expected uh, no content so if I try to get the items again let's see what happens only have two so no more potion available here and uh, yeah so that will be uh, the end of our routes in this episode of the .NET 5 REST API tutorial we will see how to store our entities in a persistent store specifically in a MongoDB database we will implement a simple MongoDB repository that can replace our existing in-main repository with minimal changes to our service today you will learn how to implement a simple MongoDB repository, how to run MongoDB as a Docker container, and how to use Postman to interact with a REST API. Starting with this episode, you will need a couple of other things to follow the video step by step. Docker, which we will use to run a local MongoDB instance, and Postman, which we will use to interact with our REST APIs from here on. Now let's think about the scenario as it is right now. We have our user who is trying to manage his items via the browser and he will do that by reaching out to our REST API and more specifically uh, by reaching out to the items controller which is where uh, or all of our uh, routes land at this point. Now items controller uh, will interact with the in mem items repository um, to manage his items and the items are actually stored inside the in mem items repository as a simple uh, items uh, collection, right? Now what happens if the REST API for any reason stops? Either it stops or it is restarted and it could, could happen uh, either explicitly or uh, non-intentionally, uh, but it is a really common scenario that a service will need to be restarted. If this happens, of course, our items collection is going to go away because it's just uh, a collection in memory, right? Uh, this is undesired and uh, we need to figure out a way to uh, keep these items alive beyond the lifetime of the REST API. So for this we have a few options and uh, uh, you can think of a first very basic option will be to using files. Uh, so you can think of, uh, well, I'll have uh, one file for each of the items in the repository. But really the most common option these days would be to use a, a database. And in terms of databases, uh, we have dozens of options, but you can categorize them uh, into uh, relational and NoSQL databases. In this tutorial, we will go for a NoSQL database. And the reason for this is, uh, well, because of the benefits that it, it offers. Uh, beyond the fact that uh, NoSQL databases are one of the most popular options these days, uh, there's the, the fact that uh, you won't need a, a schema uh, or SQL to interact with the database. I mean, you don't have to learn SQL, yet another language here. Uh, uh, you can just stick to your object-oriented programming and in our case to the C-sharp APIs and uh, you also have low latency, high performance and this because um, uh, there's no need for strong consistency as it, as it would be in a relational database and also uh, these are highly scalable. In our case we'll go specifically for MongoDB uh, which is, uh, it is a NoSQL database and specifically is a document storage type of database. So it stores uh, 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 the entities as documents, uh, specifically as JSON documents inside the database. So this is what we're going to use for this tutorial. 
So you can think that now we will have this database living outside of our REST API. And now when a ITES controller receives uh, a request, it will actually uh, hand it over to a new repository called uh, the MongoDB ITES repository. That's what we're going to create here. And uh, even if our uh, service is stopped and restarted, uh, the database will not uh, be restarted at all. Our data will be safe in there, and that way we can uh, keep our items beyond the lifetime of the REST API. Before we start implementing our MongoDB repository, I wanted to show you one more tool that you will probably find useful as you interact with your REST APIs. The name of this tool is Postman, and you can get it in the uh, Postman downloads page if, if you had not done already. And um, why would you use Postman for? So if you remember, so far we've been using this page, the Swagger UI, uh, for interacting with uh, all of our APIs. Uh, however, uh, the problem here is that uh, eventually you may not want to be opening, you know, web pages uh, to interact with each of your APIs. And uh, these APIs may not even be in your host. They may be somewhere, somewhere else where you there may not be a Swagger UI. Uh, so you do need a way to interact with them. Plus, you may need some additional capabilities that are just not available in this page. So that's where Postman can help you. So in this case, let me open a uh, Postman right here. And so how would you interact with your APIs in Postman? So it's as simple as clicking the plus sign here. And the first thing that you have to do is pick a, a verb, the verb you're going to use. In our case, let's just try a, a get. Then you're going to need the request URL. Uh, all request URLs are going to start with your host. And so in our case, um, let's see what's your, our host. Uh, let's do an F5 in VS Code. And as you may recall, our host is, and is, is one of the last lines here, uh, for the HTTPS endpoint is going to be localhost 5001. So I'm going to copy this back to Postman, paste that. And then if you remember, uh, our route, uh, going back to VS Code now, our route is in, uh, starts, all our routes start with items, right? Right here. So that will be the route that we want to use in Postman. So I'll just type here items, and that should be enough to perform a, a get. So I'm going to just, just going to click send. And then if you get this problem here, uh, this issue uh, that says SSL error, unable to verify the first certificate, uh, this is uh, because of the SSL verification that Postman is performing. But uh, this such a verification will just not work with the self, uh, self-signed certificate that comes with .NET 5. So in this case, what you want to do is just disable SSL verification, and uh, that should be fine. So you can just click here, and that will run uh, the, um, the request again. As you can see, it ran the request, and we had the results over here. Same results that we had in Swagger UI before, uh, but now uh, we are interacting more directly, more directly with that API. The same way that we did a GET, you can do POST, PUT, and a bunch of other verbs here. Uh, we will do so uh, as we move forward with this uh, with this episode of the tutorial. So now let's go back to VS Code. And I'm going to stop the host here and close terminal. And actually close items controller. So the first thing that we want to do is to implement a new repository uh, to be able to interact with the MongoDB database. For that, I'm going to create a new file. We're going to call it MongoDB Items Repository. All right. Namespace, catalog, repositories. Okay, so it's going to be called public class MongoDB Items Repository. And just what our just with uh, as with our in-mem items repository, we are going to implement i items repository. We may need to import a namespace here. Actually, implement the interface. And just by doing that, we have uh, VS Code has scaffolded uh, all the the methods that need to be implemented to uh, to comply with this interface. Now, in order to interact with uh, MongoDB, we're going to need uh, what is called a MongoDB client. 
So the Mongo to be client is a um, uh, is a component uh, provided by the creators or the owners of MongoDB that you can use to interface. Uh, with, it will be kind of uh, the adapter that used to interact with MongoDB. So we'll need to inject that uh, as, as we as as with everything else. We need to inject that dependency into our repository so that we can interact with it. So the first thing I'm going to introduce here is a constructor. So let's see public MongoDB items repository. And here is where we need to receive an instance of a MongoDB client. Where do we get this MongoDB client from? So to do that, we'll have to add a, a Nougat package. To add the Nougat package, what I'm going to do is open up a new terminal. And here I'm just going to type .NET add package MongoDB.driver, enter. So that's going to go to Nougat, grabs the a MongoDB uh, Nougat package, and if you go to catalog csproc, you're going to see that now we have we have the dependency right here. Now back to our repository, uh, we are able to start doing the injection. So let's see uh, what we're going to receive here uh, in the constructor is what we call an i Mongo client. So let's import the correct namespace here, MongoDB driver. And we will call it Mongo client. And now, what is it that we're going to store? Uh, what we're what we want to store here is not really the client, but what we call a collection. Right? So the collection is the way that uh, MongoDB uh, associates all these entities together. So I'm going to declare a variable here, hybrid read only, uh, because we only modified in constructor, so it's a read only uh, variable i mongo collection and then you have to specify the type that that uh, of the items the type of the entities or documents actually in this collection the, our type is going to be our item entity and let's call it items collection however before we can get a, a collection uh, we need a couple of other details uh, which is uh, the database name and the collection name so usually uh, like all of your document uh, yeah, all of your documents are going to be uh, grouped into collections and uh, you can have one or more collections in a database. So the first thing we have to add here is the name of our database. So let's just add a constant here. Let's call it database name. And probably a good database name here would be just catalog. And now uh, let's add a collection name, so private on string collection name this collection is going to be called items now that we have this available let's go back to constructor let me actually close the terminal for now and what we can do is the following so first let's get um, let's get an instance let's get a reference to the database so I'm going to say I mongo database database equals Mongo client dot get database. So database name. So that will get us a reference to that database. Now we need a reference to the collection. So items collection is the, the variable that we say that we declared before equals database dot get collection and then the type of the item and then uh, the name of the collection. And then the good thing about this is that uh, both the database and the collection will be created the first time that they are needed. So it doesn't matter which API we use uh, to interact with the database and collection. Uh, MongoDB, uh, or I guess the driver, will detect if we don't have them and they will be created automatically for us. So we don't have to worry about it. So we have a few uh, uh, a few methods to implement. So to get started, we'll go for the create item method. And we'll start implementing one by one and exercising each each one as we move forward in, in this uh, video. To implement create item, what you want to do is just make use of that items collection. So you can say items collection dot insert one, and then you just pass uh, the reference to the item. So in this case, it will be just item. So at this point, you may be wondering uh, where is this database, this MongoDB database that we are going to interact with. Uh, 
because yeah, I mean, we have the, the code here ready to create an item, but we don't have a database. So there's a couple of ways to get uh, a MongoDB database into your box. So you can either install the database um, uh, via the MongoDB installer, or you can run the database as part of a Docker container. We are actually going to go for the, this second one. And um, the first concept to understand uh, on that side is a Docker image. And uh, uh, I mean, we're not going to go deep into Docker concepts here. We're, we're actually going to talk about that in a future video. But for now, uh, you can think of a Docker image as a standalone package of software uh, that includes really everything needed to run an application. This application in our case is MongoDB. So everything is packaged in this uh, Docker image. Then when we run or when we execute this Docker image, it becomes what we call a, a Docker container. So it's, it's a running instance of a Docker image. And that uh, Docker container is going to run in the Docker engine. So uh, how do you get this Docker engine into your box? So you just go to the Docker download page, which I can show you now, right here. You, you go to this page, you pick your platform, and then you can go ahead and download and install Docker in your box. So then you have the Docker engine and you're able to run uh, any of the Docker images available publicly like MongoDB or perhaps some uh, uh, private uh, Docker images that you may be storing in your own container registry. In this case, we're going to go with the uh, 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 MongoDB uh, public Docker image. And let's see how we can acquire it and we can run it. So the first thing we're going to do is go to terminal, say new terminal, and we're going to type the following docker run then we're going to use the dash d dash dash rm modifiers this is so that we don't have to attach to the process so we just let it go and rm is so that uh, it, 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 the image is actually sorry the container is destroyed after we uh, close the process so then uh, we're going to give it a name mongo so that we can easily recognize which image is this and then we're going to open a port that port is going to be 27017 27017 so this syntax here means that uh, we want to open uh, let's say we're going to open kind of a window or, or a view into the, the Docker container MongoDB usually listens in port 27017 uh, and so what we, we have to do is we have to open some local port as in, in the local machine we have to open some port that can be mapped into the MongoDB port inside the Docker container. So this is the way that you would do it. You could assign actually any other port externally uh, on, on the left side, uh, but on the right side, you have to point to the to the MongoDB port. Finally, we're going to specify a volume. Uh, and the, the purpose of this is so that you don't lose the data that has been stored in MongoDB when you stop the Docker container. Okay, if you don't, don't do this, then you will lose all that data as, as you start uh, again the container. So let's declare this volume. MongoDB data is going to be the name and it's going to be mapped into data db. Here, slash data slash db is the, uh, the usual location where MongoDB is going to uh, store the data inside uh, the container. And we're just saying, well, we're going to map this location called MongoDB data uh, from our local machine into the slash data slash db directory inside the door container. And finally, we have to specify the uh, uh, the name of the image, in this case, Mongo. Then I'm going to hit enter. and uh, Perhaps I'll, I can expand this terminal a bit. And so the very first time that you run a Docker image is going to uh, pull it down from, in this case, from Docker Hub uh, into the machine. So that may take a while, depending on your internet connection. Uh, but as you can see, there's, there's multiple lines here. Each of them represents what we call layers. So each of them has uh, some piece of this Docker image, including all the dependencies. So, but like I said, this is just the first time. Next time it's going to be blazing fast on, uh, as long as you have uh, those previous layers already in your box. So now we have the, the Docker image pulled into the box and even Docker container running. If I actually do Docker PS, I can see that I have the Docker image up and running and listening in this port 27017. I'm going to close the terminal. And so what we need to do now is to uh, be able to um, point to that, uh, to that Docker image. So to do that, we need to write a little bit of configuration. So I'm going to open app settings, JSON. 
So the basic two pieces of information that we're going to need in order to talk to that database are the host and the port. So for that, I'm going to introduce a, a, a new, uh, a couple of new settings here, and let's call this MongoDB settings. And like I said, we're going to need a host, and we're going to need a port. So in the case of uh, a, a MongoDB instance that's running in your in your machine, uh, you can refer uh, for the host. You can just call it localhost. And as we said, uh, the port that we opened in that that container was uh, twenty seven zero seventy. So those are the details that we need to talk to the to the to MongoDB. Now, in order to uh, read these settings into our service, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of ways to, to do it, but uh, I think the best way is to declare a class that represents these settings so that we can easily uh, uh, interact with the multiple settings uh, from our C-sharp code. To do that, we're going to introduce uh, a folder here. Let's call it settings. You could call it configuration, options, uh, there's a bunch of ways. I'll go for settings. So let's add a file here. Let's call it, oops, sorry, MongoDB settings. And again, namespace, catalog.settings in this case. Let's declare a class. Let's call it MongoDB settings. And here we're going to declare uh, those settings that we saw in app settings JSON. Let's, let's declare them as properties. So our first property is going to be uh, prop string host. And the next one, public int uh, port. So this is an integer. And then uh, let's actually take advantage of this class here uh, to uh, calculate the connection string that's going to be needed in order to talk to MongoDB. So uh, what we can do here is actually a read-only property. So let's see. Actually, let's, let's do this. String, let's call it connection string. Okay. We're going to remove the set. We don't need to s uh, any setters in there. And this get we're going to open up, so that becomes a read-only property. Here we can just return uh, the calculated connection string. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, string interpolation here. So what I can say that they connect normally a MongoDB connection string looks like this. So MongoDB slash slash and then here comes uh, a host and then comes a port so those I'm going to get from the properties host and port the properties that we declared over there so with this we have an easy way to grab the connection string as long as we have populated host and port now that we have this it is time to perform the uh, registration of that uh, MongoDB uh, client, iMongo client, that we injected into the MongoDB items repository. So this client here has to be registered somewhere, right? And uh, as of right now, what we know is that we do that stuff in uh, startup. So let's open up startup. And here, let's go to configure services. That's where you register all your, uh, all your services. And we're going to do this. Services at Singleton because we only want one copy of the Mongo, the iMongo client uh, for the entire service. iMongo client, we may need to import a namespace here. Yep. And then here, instead of just uh, declaring the type of the, the explicit type of the dependency to inject as we did over here in, in, in this other at Singleton, what we're going to do is actually construct explicitly that type uh, so that it is injected with an additional configuration. And we do this we, because we have to specify a connection string that that a client is going to need. So to do that, what we're going to do is say, okay, so we're going to say service service provider. We're going to receive the service provider. And then we open up, 
braces going to add column there and then over here we can do things like first let's actually grab uh, the uh, the the settings so an instance of those settings that we have populated in app settings json let's grab them via our mongodb settings class so how do we do that so back in startup let's do bar settings you can use your configuration property the one that we have over here that has been populated by the runtime you can use that one to say get section and then uh, uh, so now you need to get uh, one of the sections in app settings json we named it mongodb settings which is the same name as our mongodb settings uh, settings class therefore what we can say is uh, just name of mongodb settings sorry let me type this properly db settings and then we need to import that namespace yep all right so that will get us a section and then let's actually turn that uh, object which is returned as a uh, i configuration section let's re uh, turn it into a proper mongodb settings like this okay so now we have a settings object and now we can actually construct our iMongo client instance with return new mongo client and then we will do settings that connection string the property that we calculated in that class so with that we should be ready to uh, register and inject the client into the repository now that we did that, it is time to actually flip uh, our uh, service to start using our new uh, MongoDB items repository. So that we can do in this line. You remember we previously registered the in-main item repository. So switching to this other repository is as easy as just saying here, MongoDB items repository. That's all it is. And then one more thing that we're going to do here just to make our lives a bit easier is to uh, tell uh, the MongoDB uh, client, the driver, uh, how to serialize a couple of types. In this case, it's going to be uh, the GUIDs and the daytime offsets. If you remember our uh, entity item, it has both a GUID and a daytime offset. And the thing about MongoDB is that if you don't tell it how exactly you want to reflect this uh, these types in the database, they may end up with a, uh, a representation that's not very friendly, uh, at least not for our learning purposes. So what I'm going to do is say, uh, le let's say this. So I'm going to do Bison Serializer. Let's see if I can get the right name space. Yep. Register Serializer. And then I'm going to say new GUID Serializer. And it's going to be Bison type. Let's collapse this. Port name space. That string. So that tells, tells it that anytime it sees a GUID in any of our entities, it should actually serialize them as a string in the database. We're going to do something very similar with our daytime, daytime offsets. So I'm just copying that line and I'm going to say daytime offset serializer bison type string and we'll see how these properties how this, the data actually looks like in the database in a moment uh, but for now we should be ready to start testing this out so i'm going to hit f5 here and i'm switching again to postman here we're going to start uh, not with a get because we have not implemented that but we can start with a post so to do a post, just uh, I, I just open a, a new tab and I'm going to switch the verb to post. We need the request URL, so we can grab that from our previous uh, from our previous try here. Should be that same URL, localhost 5001 items. But what we're going to do, uh, what we're going to need in this case is a body, right? So the body, the payload that we're going to send uh, uh, to our API. So I'm going to switch to raw here. And then I'm going to switch here to JSON. Let me minimize this a bit. So here we would just uh, type uh, the JSON that represents 
uh, the entity that we want to create. So that JSON is going to be uh, composed of, of a name. If you remember, it's just going to be a name and um, a price. So time to pick a name and a price. So for our first item in our database, let's say we go for a great axe and price is going to be, let's say 22. So that's all we need for, for a post. And then um, we're going to hit send. And as you can see, uh, the item uh, got created, 201 created. And we can see the response that we got from the API. We got an ID auto-generated in MongoDB and a created date uh, created by our, our controller. We can also check out the headers that we received here. And as, as since we returned a created at action, you can see how the location header has been populated as with the proper uh, URL to retrieve uh, details about that item. But then also, how does this item actually look uh, like in the database, if you're curious? So how, how can we tell that? So let's go back to VS Code and let's stop this and close terminal. What we can do is install uh, the MongoDB extension for Visual Studio Code. So I'm, I'm going to open extensions hub over here and I'm going to type MongoDB. In this case, it's the first entry over there. So just click install. And with that, we have a way to talk to uh, our MongoDB instance. I'm going to close this one. And if you see, there's a new item on the left side, MongoDB. I'm going to click it. And then there's a connection to uh, already established or defined there for localhost 27017. This may fail the first time you try to connect. So if it does fail, uh, what you can do is just, I'm not totally going to do it. I'm going to remove this connection. And I'm going to add it again, add connection. Localhost 27017 is the default. And um, close this, this and that. And then we're not, we're not using authentication at this point. So let's say no and then hit connect and you're going to see on the left side that you have a connection to your local instance of MongoDB. <clears throat> I'm going to collapse this and this. And as you can see, there's a few databases here. Uh, some of them are really uh, default databases for MongoDB. The one that we care about, I'm going to also close this. The one that we care about is the catalog database that you am going to open. And as you can see, we already have well, both the catalog database and the items uh, collection over there going to span this and you can see that we have one document for us open up that and this GUID here should match the GUID of the item created so let's see F027 open up postman it's right here uh, sorry the body of the response F027 so that's the item back to VS code and if you click over there you can see the actual data that's stored in there. So as you can see, this is a, a suspected as, as uh, of a document database. It is storing the data as JSON directly into the database. We have an ID, the name, price, and the created date. If we, if we had not done these two lines here, these register serialized lines here, uh, the data you would see either for ID and for created date would be in a pretty much in a different format that would not be very human friendly. But you may want to play with that serialization a little bit depending on, on your requirements. I'm going to close this and I think it's time to implement a uh, start implementing uh, our other routes where our other uh, methods in the repository. Let's actually go for the get items route first. So to implement get items the only thing you have to do is this. So let's say return let's go to our collection items collection we're going to say find and here, uh, since we want all the elements in, in that collection, we're going to just say new bison document. Oops. New bison document. I'm going to import namespace. And then uh, that will find uh, all the documents. And then I'm just going to say to list. So that will give us a list of all the items uh, in, the, in the collection. Uh, it's a bit of an unexpected uh, way to request all the items, but this is this is well one of the ways to do it. There's a, a few other ways, but yeah, this will get all the items in there. So with that, uh, we can try uh, trying to get items. So I'm going to do F5 again. Back to Postman. 
and uh, happens to be that we already have uh, the gate for items uh, open here so it should be as easy as running this again so I'm just going to click send and there it is we're getting our collection of items and uh, since we only have one right now why not create a few other ones just to have a, a small list here as we had before so I'm, I'm back into the post uh, page the post tab and I'm going to add a couple of other items so let's say how about an antidote let's, let's make it 15 so hit send see if we create it and then one more let's add a golden sword for the golden sword it's going to be more pricey say 40 hit send create it and then if we go back to get hit send now we have the, those three items available as you can see okay now what if we want to get just one item so that's what we for that we need to implement our get item uh, or our get item uh, method here um, but before we, we can implement this, uh, there's one thing that we're going to need, and it's what MongoDB calls as a, a filter definition builder. And that's a way that you can uh, kind of filter the items that you're going to return as you find them in the collection. Since this is a pretty common uh, object that we're going to do, use across multiple uh, methods here, I'm going to actually just uh, declare it uh, up here as uh, its own local variable, sorry, class variable. So I'm going to say private read only filter definition builder. Then we have to specify the type. In this case, it's going to be item. Let's call it filter builder. And then we're going to use the builders object of MongoDB of type item again dot filter. So now we have a reference to this filter object that you're going to see how we use it now uh, for get item. So back to get item, we're going to do this. So first we're going to build this uh, filter. So we're going to say bar filter equals filter builder that equals, so where the item, item.id. Uh, so the ID of the item has to match the ID that we have received as a parameter. That's a filter, the filter, and then we just have to do similar to before items collection that find, and we pass a filter, and then we don't want uh, all the items; we just want the one item that it should find. So we're going to say single or default. That's all it is. With that, I'm going to say F5 again, and back to Postman. So this time I'm going to open yet another tab. I'm going to paste the route for get, but now I have to specify one of the items. So from our previous exercise, let's say that we want to look information about the golden sword. So I'm going to copy this um, the ID and I'm going to paste it in the route items slash the item ID and I'm going to hit send. And here it is. We were able to query for one specific item as opposed to all the items. Back to VS Code, it's time to implement a, our update method, update item. So similarly to as with get item, we need to introduce a filter so that we can tell which item to update. Here. Now uh, we have to modify this slightly uh, because we don't want to have so many variables named item. Uh, so to avoid confusion, so the item, the existing item is going to be named existing item, existing item that ID should match the item that we got that ID, which is the item to update. And then what we do once we find it is items collection, replace one, filter item. So that will go ahead and replace that item into uh, the MongoDB database. Let's do a five and try it out. Five, back to Postman. And then I'm actually going to copy the get route and open another tab here uh, and use our put. 
so paste it there and then uh, we have to switch uh, switch to body raw I'm going to pick again uh, Jason let me bring this down and we have to put the body here so if we use if we do this we're going to be updating our golden sword right and so I'm going to get the body uh, of our actually yeah I mean the the format of this uh, put request I'm going to grab it from post and uh, so let's see what can we say about this golden sword uh, let's call it actually uh, platinum sword and let's say that the price is actually much more pricey uh, let's say it's 75 so golden sword should turn into a platinum sword with this change so let's see we're going to do a put click send we get a 204 no content as expected and then the item should have been modified so if you go now back to our get route for that item I'm going to run it and then as you can see it has changed it now it's a platinum, platinum sword uh, price 75 we get all the items hit send and we see that we have the platinum sword as the last item which is great so finally it is time to implement our delete method so back to VS code let's see delete and um, yeah the filter is going to be again very similar to our get item filter so just copy that here and in this case it's as simple as saying items collection that delete one here's the filter and that will do it so I'll hit it five once again back to postman and then again I'll copy the route that I use input open a new tab switch from get to delete paste the route we don't need a body because this is a delete and I'll hit send we got a 204 no content as expected and if you go to the get route once again and hit send now we don't have that platinum sword you see there's only two items the other one has disappeared if you wanted to delete yet another one let's say the great axe go to delete put it there hit send no content back to get get all the items and there is no great axe so yeah looks like it worked and then I'll just go back to VS Code and stop this and close that. What I want to, you to realize is that we did not have to really touch that uh, our items controller at all. Uh, the only thing that we did really here, besides adding uh, a few configuration and um, uh, you know registering the MongoDB client, uh, the only thing that we did is just create this new items repository that was plugged in into the service and that is able to by itself do all the logic of interacting with interacting with MongoDB. The rest of the service has not changed at all. And that's a great the great benefit that we get from dependency injection and in this case the repository pattern. In this episode of the .NET 5 REST API tutorial, we will talk about the asynchronous programming model in .NET 5 why you should care about it, and how to implement it in your REST API by using tasks, async, and await. Today you will learn what is a synchronous programming model, and how to use tasks, async, and await to add the synchronous programming to your REST API. To understand the concept of asynchronous programming, you can think of a common scenario which is, uh, say, uh, preparing a breakfast. So when you prepare a breakfast, uh, you're going to do a bunch of tasks. So for instance, uh, you're going to uh, prepare your pan, uh, you're going to heat it uh, in order to after that, you will go ahead and fry some eggs and that will be followed by perhaps uh, uh, toasting some bread. And after that, when the bread is toasted, uh, you may want to add uh, some peanut butter or use uh, butter or jelly, what you prefer. And finally, perhaps you also want to uh, prepare a glass of juice. So a bunch of tasks that in this case you have executed sequentially. And if done in this way, it could take, let's say, uh, 30 minutes to complete. But is that the way that you will usually do uh, this? Uh, uh, what about uh, something like this instead? Uh, so you go ahead and you heat the pan, but instead of waiting for the pan to be heated, 
uh, you will go ahead and immediately uh, start uh, tossing the bread, right? You don't have to wait for the other task to complete. And not only that, uh, after putting the bread uh, to toast, you could also start preparing your glass of juice. That's totally something that you can do at that point. And then, yes, eventually uh, the, the pan would be heated and you can go ahead and fry your eggs. And also while, while that's happening, you can, uh, if the, uh, the bread has been toasted, you can go ahead and put the peanut butter, jelly, or what you're going to put in, in, in that bread. Uh, so things are happening, uh, a bunch of things are happening uh, kind of in parallel. Uh, and as opposed to sequentially. And with this kind of um, uh, sequence of events, you can reduce significantly the, the time it takes to prepare your breakfast. So let's say uh, all the way back to 15 minutes. These two models is what we call, uh, the first one is what we call the synchronous programming model. Uh, I mean, making an analogy uh, to our programming models that will be synchronous. And then the other model will be asynchronous. So in a synchronous programming model, you are not waiting for every single task to complete before starting a, another one. So you start it when you can and you go back to the previous task uh, when it's time to do so. So then uh, thinking back to our current scenario, we do have a database, a MongoDB database, and then we do have a repository class that's interacting with that database. Now, interacting with a database is an expensive operation because you have to perform uh, input output, right? You have to go over the wire and talk to that database. That database will, may take time uh, to give you back results, depending on where it is, depending on how much load it has at that point in time. So it may take time. So you don't want to be waiting for that database to finish the work. So what you're going to do is instead of uh, doing a synchronous call to database, you're going to do an asynchronous call to the database. So you start the, the work uh, and then you, you let it uh, finish the work. And while, while that's finishing, you just go ahead and do something else if you have to do something else. And the same way, we will have our controller talking to the repository, but now we're going to turn it into an async call. So the controller uh, will talk to the repository. It will not wait for it to finish uh, doing whatever work it has to do with the database. It will just keep going, uh, doing anything else that it can do. And then eventually it goes back to that task to complete the work. And the same way, uh, whoever calls our controller should also uh, be able to call it in an asynchronous way so that they don't have to wait for our controller uh, to finish uh, whichever work is performing uh, in order to continue doing some other work. So this is what we call basically async all the way. So all your call uh, chain uh, is, is being done in an asynchronous way and that provides a lot of uh, performance and efficiency uh, to the execution of, of your code. In order to introduce the asynchronous programming model to our REST API, we will need to introduce a few changes to our repositories and our controllers. Let's start by making the necessary changes to our iItems repository interface. So let's open up repositories, iItems repository. And here, there are two things that we need to do. Um, first one is going to be uh, make sure that each of these items return task as opposed to item or enumerable or void. And the other one is to rename each of these methods to have an async suffix, uh, because that's a convention uh, when you create an API or an interface in this case, in this case uh, and you have, if you have an asynchronous method, you should be uh, uh, suffixing it uh, with async. That tells the consumer that the method is an async, an async method. And we will actually start by doing that because we're going to take advantage of the refactoring capabilities of VS Code uh, so that uh, this rename happens across the board as opposed to having us to go each, to each of the uh, files and make the changes. So let me show you what I mean. So I'll just right click on get item and I'll do rename symbol. And then what I'll do is just type the new name here, get item async, I'll hit enter. And as you can see, uh, not only the name changed here in the interface, also, if you see items, items controller has been modified. And uh, if we see here what we're calling the repository, get items async is a new name that it is using already without uh, us doing anything else. In mem items repository is also now, uh, it has been renamed the method to get item async and the same for MongoDB uh, items repository, uh, get item async. So that refactoring actually goes all the way. So we're going to do the same thing for all of the methods. And then to make things even faster, instead of a right clicking, what I'm going to do is just hit F2, which is a shortcut for this. So you do F2 and then just type async. And I'm going to copy this suffix here. Enter, F2, base async, enter, F2, async, enter. 
F2 async enter. So with that, all of our uh, uh, all of our methods have have been changed. Uh, now, like I said, the other thing that we have to do is make sure that each of these methods return task. And this is because uh, that is the way to signal that this is not going to be a synchronous method anymore, but it's going to be an asynchronous method. So what you do is you do task of item in this case, and let me import a namespace uh, system tree in tasks. And so, like I said, uh, this, this is saying that uh, when you get an item from this method, you're not going to get the item right away. It's not a synchronous method anymore. You're going to get a task that represents an asynchronous operation that eventually is going to return the item whenever uh, we have finished retrieving that item from the, from, the, uh, from the database in this case. So that turns the method into an asynchronous method. So we're going to do the same thing for the other methods here. So task of inumeral of item. And then for the void cases, we just turn into task. And that is it for this interface. The interface is ready to operate as an asynchronous uh, interface. Next, we're going to go to our, uh, let's open up this a little bit, MongoDB items repository. Okay. So let's see. Let's go one by one. So the first one uh, in this list is create items async. So I'm going to turn again void into task, and then I'm going to import the I'm going to import the namespace, the right namespace, and um, at this point what we have to do is start invoking the asynchronous version of the methods that in this case um, MongoDB's item collection offers, and this is a common uh, pattern. Like in this case, I'm actually going to open up uh, the intelligence here, and you're going to see that. Uh, for insert one, there's an alternative insert one async method. And for in this case, for insert many, there's an insert many async method. And this is going to be a common situation uh, for many of these libraries that have to uh, uh, reach out to some external service, since those operations can be uh, expensive and they represent input output operations. Uh, you want to offer the capability of executing the operation in an asynchronous way as opposed to an asynchronous way. When you do a, a, a synchronous operation like what we have before, just insert one, uh, you're actually doing a, a blocking call where you're, you just, you, you're making it so that this method just stops there. Nothing else can happen until the call comes back into the method, right? In this case, from the database. And uh, that's exactly what you don't want to do. So just turn, turn into using the asynchronous method and uh, uh, you will not have to wait. I mean, the code will not have to wait for that call to finish and, and that will make your entire application way more efficient. So that is one piece of, of what we have to do here uh, to make the asynchronous uh, call. However, we'll still have a little problem here. And uh, the fact is that we're missing one thing, which is the async await uh, keywords. Uh, so by doing async here, just next to task, and then await here when we made the call, uh, we are kind of adding a little bit of a syntactic sugar uh, uh, around uh, the, the whole method uh, to tell uh, .NET 5, uh, the compiler, that uh, this is going to be an asynchronous call and that it please help us to not have to write even more code uh, to tell it that um, how we're going to go uh, to go around uh, this asynchronous call. Uh, so async and await it really helps us a lot in terms of defining that the method is going to turn uh, into async so that we don't have to write even more code to deal with tasks and how to operate with it. And uh, that will be it for create item async. So now let's keep going uh, with the other methods. So let's go with uh, delete item async. So the same way, uh, we'll do uh, async task. And in this case, we're going to do, uh, here's the line where we call database. In this case, delete one, we'll do await, item collection, delete one, async. Yep, and that's it for delete. Next one, get item async. In this case, we're going to do async task of item because we have to return that item, but in, in as part of a task. And then we're going to do return await items collection, find by, by filter, single or default, async. Next one, get items async. We'll do async task of inumeral of item and then return await and then here to list async. And I think this is the last one, update items async. Once again, async task. And then we just await here. 
and we say replace one async and that's all you have to do like I said by doing this you're making sure that every time that you talk to the database you're not making a blocking call anymore you're actually uh, letting uh, the framework uh, I mean giving back resources uh, I mean giving back the chance to the framework uh, to keep doing work while we wait for the database operation to complete and like I said that that gives a lot of more efficiency and performance uh, back to your app now now we did this as you can see we still have the problem with uh, with uh, in mem it repository which is this is the, ori the original repository we were using in the first videos so we could choose to just delete really this repository at this point because we're not going to be using it anymore uh, but as a learning exercise we can actually turn this guy also into an async uh, 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 class i guess uh, even when we're not going to be calling anything external right so in this case we're just dealing with a uh, with an in-memory list of items, so there's not really that much of a need uh, of an async stuff here. But we need to um, we need uh, to uh, uh, honor the interface that we're implementing. So let me show you how we can do this. Let's start uh, with a uh, get items async. So same thing as we did before. This has to be async task of enumerable item, and then we have to import the import space. And what we do here is we say return await, but in this case, since we don't have anything to call, no asynchronous method to call, but we have to say, say, hey, I just want to do tasks that from result, and we're going to pass items. What this means is that we want to create uh, a task that has already completed, uh, and we want to introduce the value of this items collection into that task. So it's kind of the equivalent to saying, hey, go ahead and execute this, execute this is this other method and wait for it to complete and then return the results right but since we don't have anything to call we just say hey just return a completed task with the items in it and that's that's all it is so that's how you can handle this situation where you don't have something else to call let's see what we can do about get item async so we'll do async task of item and then in this case, we're going to just capture, in the case of uh, yeah, get item async, we're going to capture item equals items where. So we capture the item that we found, and we do something similar as before. Await tasks that from result item. Yep. So same thing. We return a result, uh, a completed task uh, with the item that we that we found. For create item async, again, we're going to do async task and then in this case we don't have really uh, anything to return so the only thing that we have to return here uh, is some some sort of a task right so we're going to say is await task that in this case we can do a completed task so this means uh, just create some task that has already completed and return it uh, without returning anything uh, inside it because there's nothing to return now let's move to update uh, item async so async task and then once again copy this await task that completed task finally we'll do the delete so a is in task and await task that completed task yep so it's as simple as that now just to let you know uh, it is not necessarily uh, it is not necessary to use a uh, async and await in every single case. Uh, you could go around and uh, avoid uh, avoid this combination in some cases. Uh, however, I would consider that to be a bit of a uh, an advanced concept that I, I'd not like to dive into that right now, just because it has some pitfalls that you have to be aware of, uh, and it is not trivial uh, to know them uh, beforehand. So for now. Uh, I would recommend you to stick to async await anytime you have to uh, run an asynchronous uh, invoke an asynchronous um, operation and define your own method as an asynchronous uh, operation. So now let's go to our items controller and do the final set of modifications that we need to introduce here. And so let's start with uh, get items, right? So same thing. Uh, let's turn this guy. I mean, this is async all the way, right? So we have to turn everything async. So now async task of I numeral identity of this is for get items so again important in space and let's not forget that this method now should be suffixed with async because it is an asynchronous method now here what we have to do is uh, again do an await 
uh, and await for the get, a, uh, get items async call. Uh, but it's it's a bit pro more problematic here because uh, uh, the await is separated from the from the actual method, and we are trying to chain uh, a select right away. So that's that's not going to work. We have to wrap this into into this parenthesis uh, to tell it that first go ahead and do this and when that's completed then go ahead and do the select right so that is just to comply with the with the syntax that the compiler is expecting from us i'm actually going to put, put this in this in a second line to uh, look at it better and just as before we go ahead uh, to get items async i wait for it and when that's done we select the uh, the items that we got and we turn them as dto and then we just return them uh, back to the caller moving on to get item we're going to do now uh, async task of action result item dto and uh, it should be get item async and here when we call get item async we just do await that will do it moving on to the next one post we will do async task create item async And then here is where we create the item. So we'll do await, create item async. And then remember that now the method is actually named get item async here. So we have to do the proper rename. Next one, update item. So let's see, async task, action result, update item async. And then let's see, here's what we call it. So we will say await, get item async. And over here, we also have to await for the call to update item async. And finally, let's go to our delete item method. It's going to be again, async task, action result, let item async, and then await. And then over here, await repository, delete item async. So now our, our controller is, is all async and is calling methods that are all async. Uh, and the repository is also calling methods that are all async. So we are doing async all the way, basically. So let's see how this goes. So I'm just going to do F5 now. And I'm going to open Postman. So let's see, let's start trying out the APIs. First one here, um, the first one that we have is uh, the items. So let's try to get the full list of items. So I'll hit send. And as you see, uh, we do have the antidote from the previous video still hanging around. Uh, that's working just fine. Now let's try to create a, a brand new item, right? So how would we call it? Let's say this is going to be a high potion. So a potion that provides increased strength uh, to the player. And uh, so the price is going to be, uh, let's say, Teddy. And I'm going to hit send. Let's see if that works. And so we do have an issue here. Uh, we're getting a 500 internal server error and no route matches the supplied values. So this here is actually uh, an expected situation. Uh, this is because of a breaking change in ASP.NET Core 3. And um, let me let me show you why this happens. Let me go back to items controller. So I'll just stop this, close that. And if you remember, uh, what we just did uh, in the create item async method is that we updated our created an action uh, call here to use uh, the name of get items uh, get item async as opposed to get item because uh, we just renamed it that method over here get item async. It was get item before. And now the breaking change that introduced in ASP.NET uh, Core 3.0 is that uh, at runtime, uh, the framework uh, is going to actually remove uh, the async suffix uh, from, from the method, right? So at runtime, this actually looks like just get item as opposed to get item async. Uh, given that when we try to do the created add action call here, it is not able to find uh, the, the route that represented by that action. And so that breaks things. So there's a couple of ways to fix this. And what I'm going to do is to actually tell uh, .NET that uh, I don't want that behavior. I just want uh, to keep using the async suffix. So to do that, uh, what we can do is, is just go to startup. And in startup, what you want to do is find uh, your call to add controllers. 
and there you just have to specify a uh, one option which is options let's see options uh, open curly braces and then you want to do options dot suppress async suffix in action names equals false with that uh, .NET will not remove the the async suffix anymore from any method at runtime so let's see uh, how that goes five back to postman and now uh, the one thing that you want to keep in mind is that the creation actually succeeded it just happens to be that we were not able to be uh, uh, we were not able to create uh, to invoke the created an action uh, call right so just to confirm that if you go back to get and we try to do a get here you will see uh, that we do have the the high potion created so it is there uh, but we're not we were not able to complete the creation I mean we were not able to call the created ad action successfully uh, so let's actually create something else here uh, to not confuse this with a high potion so let's call this one mega potion a mega potion is going to be more expensive like let's say 45 so now I'm going to do send and this time the actually the item was actually created successfully no issues there now let's use the the uh, this item to actually try the get route so just to get uh, for that item let's see if that that works that worked just fine and now let's try our put our put route for that item and so let's see we're going to uh, use the same name perhaps mega potion but let's put another price let's see what price we have here we have 45 let's say it's even more expensive 50 for the mega potion so I'll hit send and that should have updated uh, the mega potion so let's go back to the get make sure that, that the price changes so I'll hit send again and as you can see price is now 50 and um, let's see let's actually not delete that mega I mean we're going to try the delete route but let's delete something else let's say we want to delete this high potion actually which is kind of our failed experiment so I'll copy that ID so I'll try to delete that and I'll hit send 204 no content back to our get route let's see what we get and as you can see high potion is gone so we only have the antidote and the mega potion if you want to confirm that things are actually uh, getting uh, written to the database uh, it's as easy as going back to VS Code and close and I'll open up again our MongoDB extension here catalog items and we do have let me refresh this we do have two documents one for the antidote and one for the mega potion and yeah now you have a fully uh, asynchronous uh, uh, rest api which is going to give you great performance and great efficiency uh, from here on in this episode of the dotnet 5 rest api tutorial we will talk about secret management and health checks we will see how to securely store secrets during development that your rest api can use easily as with any other piece of configuration we will also learn about health checks and how they are a great way to report the health of our api today you will learn how to store and use secrets via the .NET Secret Manager, and how to use health checks to report the health of the REST API and its dependencies. So let's talk about secret management. As you know, at this point, we do have a REST API that is able to talk to a, a database, a MongoDB database. And in order to be able to talk to it, uh, we have defined a configuration source where we have specified uh, details like hosts and ports so to be able to connect to that MongoDB database. The configuration source that we've been using so far is our app settings.json file, right? So we have host, localhost, and port 27017. But now we're going to uh, enable authentication to the MongoDB database. So you're going to need uh, a username and a password in order to be able to connect to it. And we have to tell um, our REST API how to, uh, how to use this information. So for the user, we're going to uh, add uh, our user, uh, another user uh, setting into app settings JSON. For we're going to call it just MongoDB admin uh, for a username, and then we also have to specify a password. So should we just specify the password directly in the app settings JSON file? Well, the answer is no. Uh, you don't want to add any sort of secrets into app settings JSON or into any of the files uh, that you have that, that are part of your service, right? So that's a basic uh, good practice in terms of security never check, uh, introduce secrets in there 
uh, if we cannot do this, then how are we going to uh, pass that information into the service? So it turns to be that um, AppSense JSON is just one of the possible set of configuration sources that can fit into your REST API. There are other options, like you could use a command line arguments, uh, you could use environment variables, or you could even use a bunch of other cloud uh, sources, sources coming from the cloud, uh, that can provide configuration information into your REST API. In our case, we're going to use one that's called the Secret Manager. So this is just one more configuration source that's built in into .NET and that is already pre-configured for you uh, for any new, uh, brand new uh, web API. And in that Secret Manager, we can securely store uh, our password, uh, let's say pass in this case, and without having to put that password within our REST API. So it's not going to be in any of the files that compose our REST API. It will be in some place in our machine, uh, securely stored, but yet the our REST API is not going to have any trouble reading that uh, that password because just as, as anything else, it is coming just as a new piece of uh, information in, from our configuration source and the rest that the REST API can easily consume. We are now going to enable authenticated access to our Mongo database. There are a couple of ways to do this, but to keep things simple, and since this is just a development database for learning purposes, we will delete the volume where our Mongo container currently stores all the data. This allows us to start a new container with a brand new Docker volume where authentication will be enabled. So the first thing that you may want to do is verify if you're running the, the container already or not. So what I'm going to op do is open a new terminal, and I'm just going to do Docker PS. That will tell you if you have the container running already, and you are indeed, in this case, I am. So what I've, the first thing that I have to do is just stop this container. So I'm going to do docker stop mongo. That stops the container. And now what I want to know is uh, which is the volumes that I have available here. So docker volume ls, that will give us uh, the, the one volume that we care about right now, mongodb data. And now what I'm going to do is just delete it. So docker volume rm mongodb data. So now the volume is gone and we're free to restart the container with a brand new volume. So what I'm going to do now is just uh, grab the initial set of, uh, the initial command to run the container just as we did before. And, and as you can see, the same volume is, is here. But it's going to be a new one since we deleted it already. And what I'm going to do is just add a couple of environment variables that represent the username and password uh, that are going to be used uh, uh, within the database. So if I just do dash E and then specify the name of, of the variable, in this case, it's going to be mongo init db root username. And here we specify the name for our user. Uh, you could use any name here. I'm going to I'm going to use Mongo admin. So that goes for username. And now the password. For the password, you have to use Mongo initdb root password equals. And then you gotta pick a password. So I'll pick something here, not super strong, but still um, something like this. And finally, the name of the of the Docker image that we want to use. In this case, use Mongo. So with this, it's, uh, hit enter. And now uh, we do have with Docker PS, we do have a database that has authentication enabled with a user of Mongo admin and a password of pass uh, bound word one. So at this point, our database requires authentication, but our service does not know about it yet. So what happens if we try to query data at this point? What I'm going to do is just uh, hit F5 in the service. Okay. And then uh, I'm going to Postman. Uh, I'll just try to query for uh, for items and see what happens. So these are items query. Hit send. And yes. Command find failed. Command find requires authentication. Right? So which is good. Uh, uh, authentication is, is working. Uh, it's just that our service does not know uh, the correct credentials uh, to talk to the database. So how can we make a, how can we make the service uh, uh, aware of the user and password it needs to use? So let's go back to uh, VS Code. Let's stop and close this. 
And what I'm going to do is uh, first I'm going to declare a, a, a configuration setting for the user. So I'm opening app settings JSON. And in this section where we have MongoDB settings, I'm just going to add uh, one more section here for for user. Let's call it user. And we know that the user we specify for the database is Mongo Ad. Now uh, we also need a password. And of course I could specify a password right here, but that's it's uh, not a good idea. Uh, you should never specify uh, secrets uh, or confidential information in your app settings JSON file. That's a, a security uh, kind of a security hole. So you should not do that. Instead, we're going to take advantage of the uh, .NET secret manager uh, to store the uh, the password securely and still we should be able to uh, pull that secret into the service into the REST API uh, without any trouble. So to do that again I'm going to open a terminal and here's what I'm going to do. First let's initialize the secret manager for our project and that we can do via .NET user secrets init and if you take a, a quick peek into catalog csproc you're going to see that there's a new entry there, user secrets ID. So this represents a, the identifier of, of this um, secrets configuration for this project. So from here on, we can start actually adding secrets uh, to the for this project. And to add a secret, what you can do is .NET user secrets set. And here you have to specify uh, the name of the secret. Now for the name, what we want to do is follow the convention of the settings, uh, uh, the settings property that we have defined already, and just uh, add to it in the in um, in the in the format uh, accepted by .NET. So in the, in our case, that means specifying uh, MongoDB settings, and then we do colon, and then we specify the actual uh, property that will represent the password. In this case, it's going to be just password. And after that, we specify the actual value, in this case, for the password. And we know that the password is pass pound word one, Whoop, word one. okay? Uh, so just like I did here, uh, what I'm saying is, is that uh, the, the, the name of this secret is going to start with MongoDB settings, which matches a uh, MongoDB settings right here. And password is one of the properties that is going to follow uh, the other properties that we already have in the MongoDB settings class. And the actual value is pass uh, num, uh, pound word one. Hit enter, and the secret has been added. What we need now is a way uh, to uh, read both the username, uh, the user, and the password into uh, our service. To do that, we're going to go into our settings uh, settings class, MongoDB settings. Perhaps I'll just close this. Let's add a couple of uh, new properties here. So let's add string user and string password. So these are the two properties that will be populated at runtime by .NET uh, into, um, uh, into our app. Now, uh, the other one that we want to specify is a, a modified connection string because now it is not going to be enough to specify just host and port. We have to specify user and password. And the way that you do that uh, for a MongoDB connection string is by saying uh, user colon password. And then we'll say add host colon port. So that's the syntax uh, that MongoDB is expecting from us. And so just by doing that, let's try querying again and see what happens. So I'll do a five. And I'll go to Postman now. So let's see if we can query for information, send. And yes, we don't get anything because it's, remember, this is a brand new database because we modified the, the volume, but we are getting a 200 OK. So things uh, seem to be uh, running just fine. And uh, just to be completely sure, what we're going to do is, is do a post. I'm going to switch into the post tab here and see if we can uh, actually recreate this mega potion with price 45. And not just that, let me actually put a breakpoint over here and uh, to see how these values look at runtime. Uh, and uh, since this is a singleton, I'll have to stop and restart our 
uh, our service. So let's hit F5 again. And so the first time that the connection setting is needed, we should hit this breakpoint. So I'll go to Postman and I'll do Send here. And as expected, we have a breakpoint here. So as you can see, the user uh, has been read from our app settings JSON file and the password has been read from the secrets manager. So password is not uh, at all written in app settings JSON, it's just coming from secrets manager. And um, really that, that, that magic that takes that password in here is being driven by program CS when we do create default builder that piece takes care of uh, injecting the Secrets Manager as one uh, more uh, configuration source uh, to our service. So you don't have to do anything special for that to happen. So if this happened, and um, we just let it keep going, go back to Postman, and uh, in fact, yeah, the, the Mega Potion has been created. If we credit for them, we'll see that it is right there. So moving on to the next topic, let's now start uh, talking about health checks and how to enable them. So, but first let's, let's learn about health checks. So as we know, we do have a REST API uh, at this point uh, that is talking to a MongoDB database. However, it is not uncommon uh, to face uh, issues as time goes by, right? So a REST API could go down uh, for a bunch of reasons, or it, it could be actually intentional, right? We may be redeploying this REST API to our uh, to our server, to our cloud service, or to our server, whatever it, it is going. So even if temporarily, the, that REST API could go down. And there could also be issues on the other side with talking to our database, right? So uh, for any reason, that database, uh, we may lose connection to the database, either temporarily or, or for a long time. Uh, or something could be going on uh, while we're talking to that database, right? So communication uh, issues could happen. So with this, uh, we may uh, start getting um, uh, questions like, uh, is our REST API alive? So is it alive? Can, can we actually talk to this REST API, right? So you may start wondering this, or you may start wondering, well, can we reach a database? So is it there? Is, 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 is that connection uh, in a good state? And so, but really, what you're asking here is uh, the broader question of, is it, is it healthy? So is our REST API healthy? Uh, is it ready to receive requests? Is it ready to, uh, to do the, the job the right way? And to answer that question, uh, the, the right way to do it is to enable what we call a health check endpoint. So, to, so you don't have to guess. So we will have, a, you would have an actual endpoint uh, that you can call, it's part of your REST API, and you can call to it and it should be able to tell you if the service is healthy or not, right? And of course there will be uh, persons or people interested uh, in that information. Uh, so you as, 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 as a developer, as an engineer uh, that creates a service may want to query for that help endpoint and see if the service is healthy. But really the most important case, uh, the most usual and traditional uh, scenario is when you have an orchestrator system uh, that will be in charge of knowing uh, when your service is uh, ready to receive requests. Uh, so and we will talk more about this uh, in a few episodes in the future, but uh, having a health check endpoint is a key piece of any REST API that you have to think about uh, right away. Now that we learned about health checks, let's see how we can enable them for our REST API. So the first thing that we have to do is to uh, add, add the services for health checks, and that we can do uh, within Startup CS. Before that, let's stop debugging and close terminal. And I'll open up Startup CS, and I'm going to head into the configure services method. So in that method, we're going to go all the way down, and we're going to add just one line here services that add health checks and now so that adds the services and now we need to add the middleware uh, for it and that we have to do inside the use endpoints method inside configure so here we're going to say endpoints dot map health checks and then here you get to pick the route uh, that you want uh, to use for your uh, health endpoint so in my case I'm going to go for health but feel free to choose uh, something else, like you could do something like HC, or you could do health C. It's really up to you what you want to use. I'll go for just health. And now I'm going to do uh, F5, 
and let's try it out. So that should give us a very basic health check uh, endpoint for our service. So back to Postman. And uh, the way that you query for this health check is really very similar to what we do for the items route. So we just have to open, I'll open a new tab in Postman uh, for the get verb. And I'll go for my uh, local host colon 5001. And then you just add the uh, your health route. In our case is health. I'll hit send. And here you get a result. It says healthy. So with that, uh, you have a way to almost like ping your service uh, to see if it's in a healthy state. So this means that, so yeah, the service is, is up and running and everything should be fine. Um, however, this is actually uh, not super useful because even if the service uh, is up and running, it, it means nothing if the database is down, right? So if the database is down or if we cannot reach it, uh, our service is not really that much healthy. So how can we tell if we have any dependent service like a database in a not in a healthy state? And how what, how can we take advantage of health checks for, for this? So let me show you what, what we can do. So going back here, stop that, close this. What I'm going to do is uh, add a Nougat package um, uh, that's called uh, ASP.NET Core Health Checks MongoDB. That will allow us to add a health check specifically designed to verify if MongoDB is running properly. So I'm just going to open a, a new terminal here and I'm going to say .NET add package ASP.NET Core Health Checks MongoDB. So this is an, uh, an open source project. It's not part of uh, ASP.NET Core or .NET 5, but it's a very handy uh, project. And uh, with, this, with this package, the, let me show you what we can do. Close the terminal again, and then, um, so here. What we want to do is uh, add some options uh, to this call to add uh, health checks. Uh, but before we can do that, uh, we need to pull out our MongoDB settings in such a way that we can reduce them uh, later on. So to do that, I'm just going to grab this, uh, this line here, outside and into, let's say here, and we will call this MongoDB settings. So now those MongoDB settings can be used over here uh, for our MongoDB client uh, singleton, but also for our purpose uh, right now. Uh, after saying uh, add health checks, we're going to say dot add MongoDB. And here we will use MongoDB settings that connection string uh, to specify the connection string that uh, needs to be used to connect to the MongoDB database, right? So our health check is going to be based on can we reach this database or not? We will also add a couple of things here, uh, like a, a name, just to identify this specific health check. And uh, we will just say MongoDB. And one more thing is a, a timeout. And this is because we don't want this health check to take a long while to tell us if the database is is just down, right? So in this case, we'll say time span from seconds. Let's give it three seconds. If after three seconds, we cannot uh, connect to the database, we will consider that this has failed, right? The check has failed. So now that we did that, uh, let's try it out. So I'll do F5. And let me actually remove this breakpoint and back into Postman. So here, uh, yeah, I'm going to say health again, send, and it says healthy. And I suspected because uh, our database is up and running. But if I go back into um, VS Code, into our terminal, and I just uh, stop uh, our uh, uh, MongoDB container. So let's see, docker stop Mongo. That will stop our container, which is equivalent to just stopping completely our database, right? And the entire database service is just going down. So let's see what happens as I go back to Postman and I try to check for health. We'll take like three seconds and then yes, right here. So now health check is reporting uh, as unhealthy, uh, which is great because now anytime a uh, database is down, we can uh, easily tell uh, that, that as part of the health check that we're using right here. 
Now, there's one more thing that we can use to improve this scenario, uh, and it's the fact that uh, we may want to have more than one endpoint to verify not just uh, the fact that the service is, is up or not, uh, but also uh, if it is ready to receive requests or not. And uh, the typical uh, pattern here is to specify both a ready endpoint and a live endpoint. So our ready endpoint is going to tell us if we are ready to, um, well, if a service is ready to uh, receive a re incoming request, right? Which in our case really means, uh, so is the database up and running, ready to go, uh, can we use it? While the live endpoint is just going to tell us if our service, uh, just a service is, is up or not, is it alive or not. So to do this, uh, these two uh, endpoints, let's actually go back to VS Code. So I'll stop this again and back to startup. First thing that we have to do is going back to our uh, health check configuration, we have to assign a, a tag uh, to our health check. So let me show you what I mean. So I'll actually put these things down a bit so that we can tell it easier. So I'm going to open up a one more line here and I'll say tags. So I'll create a little array here and here I'll say ready. So here I am attaching a, a tag that I'm calling ready uh, that will help me a uh, group every single health check for which I want to apply a ready endpoint. So the endpoint that specifies uh, if uh, I'm ready to start receiving requests. How do we use this? So now let's go back to our map health check section and I'll add a line here. So now we need to, we need to specify uh, our two endpoints, one for uh, ready and one for live. So let's go for the ready one first. So instead of just having health here, I'm going to say, okay, so slash ready. It's going to be a ready, ready endpoint. And now I'll have to specify um, health check, health check options. Let's see if I'm missing a namespace right there. Okay, so I'll open up this. And so at this point, we have to specify what we call the predicate. So the predicate is the way that you can filter out uh, which health checks you want to uh, include in this in this endpoint. So remember that right now we only have one really, uh, but that one has been tagged uh, with ready. That's the one for MongoDB. So in the case of the ready endpoint, we want to include that MongoDB uh, endpoint. So to do that, what you do is, is this. You say check, and then we'll say check tags contains and then the tag name ready. And with that, uh, you have a ready endpoint that will, uh, well, we will only include those uh, uh, health checks that have been tagged with ready. And then we have to specify another endpoint. So I'm going to actually copy, copy this. This one is going to be just live. And really for the live case, we don't have to do much. We actually don't want to, we don't want to include any health check. We just want to say, a kind of uh, the response of a ping, right? So in this case, we're saying uh, just false. By doing that, we are excluding every single uh, health check, including the BongoDB one, and so that it would just come back to us as long as uh, as long as the REST API is alive, as the service is alive. Uh, so that's the way that you can do the live. So ready, we'll make sure that the database is uh, ready to serve requests. Live is just going to make sure that our site, uh, uh, our, our service is up and running. So with this, let's uh, run again. So I'll do F5. And I'm back into Postman. And this time, so let's let's see. So I'll query for, uh, let's see, uh, health uh, live. See what we get. So it says healthy. Um, it's expected because the service is, is up and running. Now I'll try ready. See what we get. So after about three seconds, we do get unhealthy. And this is because our uh, database Docker container is still uh, still down, right? As we did before. If I go back here, and I go back to my terminal, let's say this one, and I'll actually restart the Docker container. So Docker run, yep, should do it. 
So that starts a container again, go back to Postman, and he'll send, and I get healthy. Right? Because the database server and the database are, are there up and running. And usually that's good enough. So that's what you want to do to enable your, your health checks. Uh, but if uh, you happen to want a little bit of more information about uh, the, the health checks that you have configured, uh, you can actually customize the message that you're getting here. In this case is just a basic thing, healthy, but you can get more if, if you want to. And so let me show you how to do that. So back in VS Code, stop and close. We are going to look for our map health checks function. The ready one in particular is interesting. And what we can do is uh, take advantage of what's called the response writer. This response writer you can use to specify how to render the message that you're getting as you're uh, collecting the results of the health checks. So I'm going to say async context, oops, sorry for that, context report. Let's do this and then open court erases. And then uh, here I'm going to collect the result uh, of, the, of the check. So for that I'm going to say Result equals, I'm going to use this JSON serializer, the one that comes uh, with .NET. I'm going to serialize. Now I'm going to create an anonymous type here. So I'll just say new, and then we have to give it a shape. So this is the shape of what we're going to return back into Postman uh, to the color. So the first thing that I want to show is a status. Status we can get from report dot status. I'll just do to string, and then we want to get uh, the array of checks, uh, which should include our MongoDB check. So in this case, I'm going to say report entries select, and I'll say so. I'll, I'll project uh, each entry into a new anonymous type, and in this type, I want to show first uh, the name which is going to come out of entry.key. Then I'll get a status of this very specific uh, check, which is going to go come from entry value status to string. And then there could be an exception coming from the database. So let's actually capture that too. Oops, sorry. Exception is going to be entry that value that exception but we may or may not have an exception depending on the status of this check so what we're going to say is that if the exception is not null we will get entry value exception message but if we don't have any exception if it is null we will just say none finally one last detail it could be interesting is the duration that will tell us how long it took to do this health check entry value duration to string okay so I'll do this and now one more thing that we can do here is to uh, format that output so I'm go going to say context that response that content type equals media type names I'm missing something yeah dot application.json so that will let us render as a nice json a string uh, back in postman and finally i'll actually write uh, this information out so await context response write write async result yeah, using one name space there and that should do it so now we have customized how that message should be rendered. So I'm going to do F5 once again. And back into Postman. So let's see what happens when I try my ready endpoint now. So I hit send. And now, as you can see, the result is a bit nicer. So we do have a status of healthy, and then we can see the array of, of checks. In this case, we have MongoDB with a healthy state, no exception and a duration in there. And uh, if we wanted to get the, the uh, the sample with an actual exception you just you can just stop your docker, con docker container again docker stop mongo container stopped i'll try again back in postman 
send and after three seconds we should get yeah so now as you can see uh, the entire health check is unhealthy the specifically mongodb is unhealthy and yeah the operation has been cancelled so that's what we're getting from uh, from trying to talk to mongodb now one last thing that i wanted to show you is that uh, there's actually a bunch of uh, health checks already available for you and so just like we did uh, the mongodb one uh, let me stop and close this uh, if you remember we did uh, this here we did the, the mongodb one uh, just like this there's a bunch of other ones already available for you to try out uh, depending on the service that you're using and let me point you to this page here which is the page for the open source project that, that i mentioned that has these health checks so over here in this github project uh, you are going to see that uh, so this will tell you everything about how to use uh, these health checks but I, I wanted to show you that there's already health checks built in for a bunch of providers right so SQL Server, MySQL, a bunch of things, Cosmos DB, SendGrid, uh, a few Azure services, Amazon services, Google stuff, here's the one that we use MongoDB and um, uh, so yeah, so there's a bunch of uh, providers already available and there's even, uh, and here's a Nougat package that you can use. And there's even um, support for, let me show you, there's support for, for a UI. Uh, I don't usually use this one, but if you wanted to show a very nice UI with all your health checks, uh, with a breakdown for, for each of the checks, you can actually enable this, uh, this health check UI. Oh, sorry. And that yeah, and that will just uh, stand up another endpoint in your in your service that you can go to and get all this nice UI being rendered. So that's something that you may want to try it out. Uh, I usually find there's some other ways that I uh, query for the health of my services as we're going to see as we move forward with these videos. Uh, but this is another option that you can try. In this episode of the .NET 5 REST API tutorial, we will start our path towards getting our API deployed to a production environment. We will learn about the traditional challenges involved in getting the API bits deployed outside of our developer box, how Docker can help us address these challenges, and how to turn our existing API into a Docker container. Today you will learn the challenges of deployment, how Docker works and why you should use it, how to turn your REST API into a Docker image, and how to run your REST API as a Docker container. So the way that things are at this point, you know that we do have a REST API up and running in our local box, and there's also a MongoDB database running next to it uh, as a Docker container. But now we need to figure out how we're going to share this REST API with the world, right? Either uh, how to share the REST API with people inside of our local internet, or how to share the REST API uh, with the world, perhaps in the public internet. And that place where we're going to share things is what we're going to call the production environment. This production environment could be anything from uh, some uh, server uh, running in your in your building uh, or in your house, or it could also be some server running somewhere in the internet, right? But for our, for all our cases, this is the production environment. This is the place where people will be able to access the uh, REST API without having to uh, get access to your local box, your developer box. And one of the first things to think about when we want to pick this uh, this server for, for production is the operating system. So we will need to figure out, uh, we need to find um, uh, the, the right uh, server with the correct version of the operating system that our REST API is able to support. So in the case of, of a REST API, it's not really that much of a big deal because .NET 5 is cross-platform. So what we have built so far, it should be able to run in really in a bunch of operating systems. But still, uh, we need to settle on some operating systems. So if we say that we're going to be running this on, on Linux, then we would need to go ahead and make sure that we have Linux available, the correct distribution and version of Linux uh, available in that production environment. Then uh, we also know that uh, we do need the .NET 5 runtime to be able to run a REST API. A REST API is built on .NET 5, therefore we do need the .NET 5 runtime it, and all the corresponding files of it, they need to be placed in the right place in that production box. On top of that, our app may have a bunch of dependencies uh, like the MongoDB driver that we've been using to talk to Mondo, MongoDB. So like that, it may have a bunch of dependencies that they also need to be placed into the production box so that finally, 
a REST API can be placed alongside all, all of these other components and it can uh, run uh, happily. So it is at that point that we can, we can consider that we have all the files necessary for the REST API uh, to be running in production. But then also we have to consider that we also have database requirements, right? So we have a database that we need to place somewhere in this production environment and it will have its own requirements in terms of operating system and uh, dependencies that MongoDB may have, the MongoDB engine, all these things that we need to run the database in production. So that by itself presents uh, another set of requirements. So as we think about all of this, these things that we need to uh, that we need to happen to get our production up and running, so we need to think about a few, a few challenges, right? So the first thing is going to be uh, preparing a box. So what you really want is to make sure that whatever box we use for production uh, has everything that we that we have had so far in our developer box, right? And then, uh, but you also have to think about, so are we going to pick a physical machine? Are we going to pick a virtual machine? Where virtual machine is really just a virtualized version of operating system running on top of some other physical uh, machine. So, uh, and if regardless of if, if it is a physical machine, virtual machine, we need to figure out, well, where are we going to get this machine from? Where are we going to host it? Uh, who is going to be taking care of this machine? A bunch of questions just regarding uh, this, this machine. But also we need to figure out, okay, so uh, is, is it going to be Linux or Windows? Uh, who's going to put the right version of the OS in there? Who's going to make sure that it has the right set of patches? And who's going to maintain this? Uh, really, somebody needs to take care of these things. Then also, uh, how are we going to take the files to the production machine, right? So we have, we have all these files in our box and somehow they need to land in production. How are we going to do this? Are we going to be using perhaps some FTP protocol uh, to be able to talk to and send the files to production machine? Are we going to put the files in some uh, USB or pen drive and then just copy them using it into the production machine? Are we going to send the files to some person from operations via perhaps some email and then that person will place the files in there? Uh, how are we going to make this happen? Uh, the, the files need to get there so one way or another. What happens, I mean, in this case, we are thinking of placing, let's say, the, the database server just next to the REST API. If you're going to do that, how are we going to make sure that uh, all of the dependencies of the database and the dependencies of the REST API uh, have the right versions even when we only we're placing everything in the same machine right so there could be version mismatch between the the things that are needed in the mongodb database and the things that are needed in the rest api right starting from the pretty system how do we make sure that all the dependencies are the right version for both of them and if they're if they cannot be we have to figure out okay so perhaps we need to split this rest api into one machine and the database server into another machine which would not be that uncommon but we have to think about all these things. Also, what if we eventually decide to move to a new version of .NET, right? So let's say .NET 6 is out. We have to, we want to move to the .NET 6. Uh, what does that mean? Do we have to bring in a brand new set of uh, servers, physical or virtual, that are already enabled for .NET 6? Uh, do we want to uh, just update the version of .NET in, in, this, um, in the existing server and then somehow make sure that the app does not break by, by making that change? How are we going to make that happen? Also, how do we uh, start the recipe on the machine? Because it's, it is not just about copying the files in there, right? So somehow we need to start the, the .NET app into the server and uh, somebody has to do it, right? So we have to bring in some sort of automation, some sort of scripting, something needs to happen in that machine uh, to be able to start this API and not just start it, but start it fast. We want to make sure that as soon as we put the bits in there, uh, the, the application just starts quickly so that it can start serving our users. And finally, what if one instance of the app is, is not enough? So what if we start having so many users and just having one web server for a REST API is not enough. And now we need to bring in yet another, uh, let's say VM, a virtual machine for, uh, for a REST API, and then another one, and then another one. So who's going to take care of provisioning all these VMs uh, for us? And what about the database? What if we actually need multiple copies of the database server to be able to handle the load? So how is all of this going to happen? So do we need to th think about all these uh, challenges? Do we need to, to deal with all of this, or is there a better way? So luckily, here's where Docker can help us. So now let's go back to our local box. So yeah, so we have our, our local box, has REST API and the, and the database currently, and we need to get to production. 
But now, instead of uh, starting to worry about how to copy all the things in, in, into production and how to make sure that production has the, the right things already in place, uh, we can start using this thing called uh, a Docker file. So a Docker file uh, is kind of a template of uh, uh, all the things that are needed by your, uh, in this case, a REST API to get it deployed into production. So in the Docker file, you will declare things like the operating system that are going to uh, need. So you're going to say, I run in this specific version on this specific distribution of Linux, let's say, or in this specific version of, of Windows. So it is already declared in that file. And uh, so you're saying as, as long as that version is available in the production machine, I am, uh, I am going to run just fine. And not only that, you can say, well, I actually need the, the ver version 5.0 of the .NET or ASP.NET Core runtime available in there. And uh, by doing this, as long as I have uh, all the dependencies of the .NET Core runtime, I am able to run uh, my, my REST API. Right, so you can declare uh, the the runtime that you're going to be running on. You can also declare, or you can prepare all the dependencies that are needed for your app, right? Like the MongoDB driver and any other DLLs or any other dependencies that need to be presented in there. You can specify how to place the files that you want to put in that in that production environment. You can say how where exactly you want to put them. And you can also tell it exactly how to get started or how to start that REST API. So that scripting that is needed to say how to start it, it can also be set in this Docker file. So just by using the Docker file, you get a, you get you're already handling a lot of the challenges that we were talking before because this Docker file is clearly declaring um, exactly how the uh, how the environment needs to be built for your REST API to run properly. And so, but then. Um, it is not, not enough to just have this Docker file. So now that you have Docker file, what you're going to do is use this thing called the Docker engine to actually prepare what we call a Docker image. So what happens here is that the Docker engine, which is just a process running in, in, your, in your box, the Docker engine is going to take that Docker file and it's going to tag it and, and build what we call a Docker image. Uh, tagging is, is really just um, kind of a synonym for uh, creating a version for your image. So you're going to set a version on that image and then you're going to build it. So building a Docker image means reading that Docker file line by line and executing all those instructions uh, to prepare the environment where your uh, REST API is going to run. And that goes all the way back to ensuring that all the, depend the exact dependencies are in place, put the files in the right location and starting the app. Right, so all of that is encapsulated in that Docker image. But then once you have the Docker image, it is not enough to just have it running in, in your machine, right? So what you really want is to make it available in production. So how do you take it from your box into production? So enter the container registry. The container registry is a place that could be anywhere going from some server in your, again, in your internet to somewhere in the cloud. Uh, it is the place where you can place your Docker image. You can push your Docker image so that it eventually becomes available for uh, your production uh, environment. So this container registry, I mean, you don't necessarily have to be the one that pushes the Docker images in there. There may be some, some other uh, images already available in container registry. So for instance, in the case of uh, MongoDB, there we've been using a, 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 an instance, uh, uh, the Docker image of MongoDB uh, since a few episodes back. Uh, we did not actually create that image. The image was already there. And that image is actually available in a specific container registry called Docker Hub. So Docker Hub is a public registry uh, where many vendors place their Docker images for public consumption. But just like there's a Docker Hub, there's also other container, uh, private container registries like uh, Azure Container Registry, Google Container Registry, Amazon, um, ECR, I think is the name. There's also these days um, GitHub Container Registry. So there's a bunch of versions uh, of this available. Uh, but all of them are able to operate with your Docker images in the, really the same way. So once you have pushed your Docker image into the container registry, then you're able to have your production box, either physical box, virtual machine, whatever it is, it is able to pull uh, your Docker image into it. And by pulling it and executing that image, it turns into a, what we call a Docker container. So the Docker container becomes uh, kind of a living version, uh, an are executable or running version of your Docker image. So the Docker container, so 
the Docker container just has uh, it just uh, has all the files and all the dependencies that have been, de have been declared in the Docker file and executes the REST API the way that you have declared it in the Docker file. And just like what well, well, just like how we stand up the Docker container for the REST API, we can stand up the Docker container for our MongoDB uh, uh, Docker image. And then, of course, these containers can talk to each other. And all of this magic, I mean, it, it only works just because you also have the Docker engine, uh, the same Docker engine that you have in your box, you will have it available in the production environment. So here, as long as you have uh, the Docker engine available in whichever machine you want to go ahead and run your Docker image, then your Docker image is guaranteed to, to be able to run as a Docker container in that environment. The only thing that you need is a Docker engine. And that brings a lot of benefits along the way. The other thing is that uh, you not only just can just run one instance of your Docker container, you can actually run multiple instances of your Docker container. So as you need to scale up more and more, uh, perhaps because you have too many users, then you can just start spinning up more and more copies of that Docker image into Docker containers in production without having to in uh, incur into a lot of uh, hassles to be able to provision more and more environments. So. Lots of benefits uh, about Docker really here, and starting with efficient use, uh, resource usage. Uh, so as opposed to the case of having to stand up uh, new virtual machines or new physical servers, uh, you don't have to really incur into a lot of new resources. Spinning up a new Docker image does not take a lot of RAM, does not take a lot of uh, this space, because there's a lot of caching happening in there by, by this thing called layers in, in Docker. So a lot of caching, uh, memory is going to, is going to only going to in increase in terms of what exa what exactly is needed by for your um, for your for your image for your service for your REST API, and so you can really fit much more instances of your REST API and in this case also of your database, and many more instances in the same production box uh, as you could before just fit one instance of your REST API or your database or your MongoDB container uh, or the MongoDB database in uh, the same production box, right? So you can fit much more uh, 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 by using containers. There's also fast start uh, because because uh, the, Docker, the Docker engine is able to cache all these, these layers uh, only the very first time that it needs to uh, pull down uh, the Docker image, it will do that with all the layers, but from there on, it will be able to ca uh, just pull only the layers that have changed. And so that allows it to really start very fast. And so you don't have to, also you don't have to boot up an entire operating system uh, just to boot uh, your uh, your app, right? So the operating system is already in place, you just need to, to start your app. And Docker is able to do that very, very fast. There's also isolation. If each of these containers is running in a, in a completely isolated way, so it doesn't matter what's going on in the actual production host machine or what's happening in, with any other containers running in the box, each of the containers are running in isolation. And so from their point of view, they are the only thing happening at that point in time uh, in that environment. Uh, so that, that gives you a lot of benefits from that side. And then uh, also you can, you can think of, of these containers as being able to run anywhere. And because, like I said, as long as there's a Docker engine running in your production machine, uh, you are guaranteed to be able to run your Docker container in there. So lots of portability. And finally, scalability, like, like I mentioned, uh, in the same in the same space where before you, you will be able to run just one instance of your uh, REST API, like in the case of a virtual machine, now you can actually run multiple instances of your Docker container with using much, much, a much less amount of resources in there. So you can really scale uh, significantly by using Docker containers. Let's see now what we need to do to containerize or Dockerize our REST API. To create a Docker image for our REST API, the first thing we need to do is create a corresponding Docker file. However, before doing that, and to keep things simple, we will update our REST API so that it no longer performs HTTPS redirection and allows the use of the HTTP address only. The use of HTTPS from here on is a topic out of the scope of this tutorial. So what does this mean? If you remember, we do have two URLs configured for our REST API, and those are configured uh, in our launch settings file under properties, launch settings.json, application URL. We do have HTTPS localhost 5001 and HTTP localhost 5000. And the way that 
things are configured right now, if anybody tries to access HTTP localhost 5000, they will get redirected into HTTPS localhost 5001. If you want to test this, what you can do is just launch the app. So I'll do F5 here. And I'll open Postman. And normally we will go to HTTPS localhost 5001, but I'll change this into HTTP localhost 5000. And in this case, I'll actually open the Postman console down here to see what's happening behind the scenes. And I'll do send to query for items. The query succeeded. But then if you see, there are two calls in here. The first one for HTTP localhost 5000 slash items actually returned a 307 code, which means a redirect. And then that was followed by a call to HTTPS localhost 5001 slash items. So that's a, the redirect that has been configured right now. And is what we want to change for the Docker case at least. So how do we change this? Going back to VS Code, and I'll just stop the app and close this for now. This is configured in startup.cs. Under the configure method, we have this line here, app that uh, use HTTPS redirection. So it turns to be that when you run inside the Docker file, well, sorry, inside the Docker container, the ASP.NET environment switches from development into production. And this is what we can use to uh, put a conditional on this, on this line. So what we can say is if m dot is development, then we will allow the HTTPS redirection, but otherwise we will not allow it. That's the only change that we're going to make here. We, we will see how this works actually when we have the Docker container ready to go. At this point, I'll just close this. And now we actually want to generate or actually to create this Docker file. So there's two ways to create a Docker file. Either you can create it manually or you can generate it. For this tutorial, we will, and to speed things up, we will generate it. So to generate a Docker file, what I would recommend if you're in Visual Studio Code is to use the Docker extension for Visual Studio Code. And that you can find if you go to the extensions hub, you can just type Docker here, and then you will go ahead and install the extension. And now I'll close this. And now what you can do is just say view command palette, and then you can type Docker add Docker files to workspace is the first option there. So now you get to pick the platform of the Docker image we're going to create in our case will be .NET ASP.NET Core. Then you got to pick the operating system of the container. In our case, it's going to be Linux just because it's the most popular option most of the time. And then you got to pick uh, the port that you're going to be listening in within that container. In our case, that's going to be port 80. And finally, if you want to generate a Docker compose file, we will not use this in this tutorial. So just hit no. And now if you go to our uh, explorer here, you're going to see there's a, a couple of new files. We have the Docker file and the Docker ignore file. So let's start by looking at the Docker file. In the Docker file, each line that you can see here represents a uh, one set of instructions that are going to be applied as the Docker image, our Docker image is going to be built. And uh, each of these lines will also generate what we call a layer uh, that represents the changes that are happening from one line to the next line. And that's what uh, helps a lot in terms of a uh, caching of steps as we do subsequent builds of this Docker image. So the first time when we build it, it, it will take time. And then subsequent, ti subsequent times, it's going to be much faster. Now let's go one by line by line here uh, to understand what's going on. So the first thing that's happening is that we're saying that we, we will be building out our image based on the .NET ASP.NET image, specifically version 5.0, right? So that's that's the way that you, that you start by saying, uh, where do you want to go from? By specifying .NET ASP.NET, you are guaranteed to be building uh, your image based on uh, uh, um, and a working ASP.NET environment. In this case, a 5.0 environment that has all the dependencies that are needed to run an ASP.NET app. And not just that, the ASP.NET uh, image has, in, in, has uh, at the same time, has been 
uh, built based on the correct OS, based on where, where you're running your image. Uh, in our case, since we're going to be running it in a Linux machine, uh, that will include all the dependencies to run an ASP.NET Core app or, or the .NET 5 app uh, in Linux. Now we're also saying this is 5.0 as base. This means that this is going to be uh, our first stage uh, of the of building the container. This is uh, a good segue into uh, the concept of multi-stage builds, which is what's enabled here. This means that there will be more than one stage on the, in the build process, and in each stage, uh, you can specify a different set of instructions that may have nothing to do with the instructions uh, executed in some other stage. So for instance, here we're saying, so this is the first stage, and we'll call it it base. And in this stage, we'll go from uh, .NET ASP.NET, which is the runtime image for ASP.NET 5. Work there is going to be slash app, means everything that happens after this will happen in the in the app directory. And then that we expose uh, port 80. This line actually means does not mean much. It's just a kind of a documentation field. The way that you expose a port is a bit different, actually. Uh, but it is, it, it is a, there's a convention to specify the port that the app is listening in. Now that temporarily f uh, finishes that first stage, and in the next line, in line five, we are going into our next stage that we're calling build. And the interesting, build, the interesting part about this stage is that uh, it comes from uh, another base image. If you notice, this is coming from .NET SDK. So .NET SDK 5.0 as opposed to .NET ASP.NET. So .NET SDK is the image that has all the build tools and all the libraries, uh, everything that's needed to build uh, a uh, .NET 5 app, which is not the same that you need to just run uh, a .NET 5 app, right? So this, uh, whatever is coming in this SDK image is potentially much bigger. There's a much, much more files, compilers and stuff in there that are needed for building the, the container, but not needed for just running it. So that means that your final image that's going to go actually from the base image uh, is potentially going to be much smaller than the image that you're going to use to build uh, your container. So we start with this stage. In this case, the work there is going to be a, a slash SRC. So that's where we're going to uh, place any files from here on. And that's exactly what we're doing in, in the next line. We're saying, okay, so let's copy the catalog.csproc file, the one that, that defines our project, into uh, the root of the current location. And then we will run a .NET restore uh, on that project. So that brings in all the NuGet packages that are needed. Then we say, okay, so we have restored all the packages. Now copy every other uh, file that's needed uh, for our app. So that includes all the files that you can see on the left side, except or a few exceptions, but most of the files are included here. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then um, there's this line here that's actually uh, not that much needed because as you can see, it's pretty much the same as the as line six. So we will actually delete this in a moment. And then we go into the actual build process where we say, hey, go ahead and perform a .NET build on catalog.csproc. We are modifying the current configuration to not be debug anymore. We want a release version of the app to optim optimize it for the production environment. And the results of that build should go into the slash app slash build directory. So currently that finishes our build stage. So it's this section here. And then we're switching to yet another stage that we're calling it publish. In the publish stage, what we're saying is actually we're going to go from the build stage. So notice now we're going from build is the stage that we just created. And we will go from there and name it as publish and just execute the .NET publish command with similar set of parameters in the previous one, just changing the output directory. So .NET publish, what it does is uh, it creates a, a new folder, in this case called publish, with all the files that are needed uh, in the right shape to just execute the app. Now at this point, uh, I'll, I'd like to point out that I find a few of these lines a, bit, a little bit redundant. So we could simplify things a little bit here. So I don't think we need to separate both a build and a publish stage. So I'm going to make a, a couple of changes here. So I'm going to actually remove this uh, work dear source um, line because we already have this in line six. So I'm going to remove that. And I'm going to also remove .NET build just because .NET publish also performs .NET build for us. So there's no need for two separate lines. And I'm actually going to completely remove the publish stage because our build stage should be good enough for what we, we need here. 
So now we just have one stage called build, well, one second stage called build that will end up by running .NET Publish and all the files that we need should end up being in app publish. Now in 9.12, we go back to our initial base stage, build stage, and we're going to be calling it as final, right? So now we're pretty much finishing what's, what's going on here. So we switch again to the app directory. And then what we're saying, what we're saying is, uh, okay, so now let's copy from the publish uh, build stage, we not, which in our case is no longer there. We actually opted for build. So I'm going to actually copy this and change it, it into build. So from the build stage, go ahead and copy whatever is in the app slash publish directory. The one that where we place all the files, copy all of that into the current directory, which would be slash app. And finally, we we'll define the entry point for our app. So this is how we define how to start uh, our uh, REST API. And in our case, that would be just by hitting the or executing the .NET command with the catalog.dll file. That's all that's needed to start our, our REST API. With this Docker file, we are pretty much ready to build uh, our image. But before doing that, what I wanted to do is just show you about the .dockerignore file. So this Docker ignore file, what it does is uh, it defines a series of files and directories uh, that you want to exclude from the, the Docker image. So there may be a one or more files that you don't want to include in the Docker image because it makes no sense. For instance, the stuff that we have under that VS code uh, is really only useful for development purposes, but it means uh, it, has, uh, it, it makes no sense to include that into the Docker image. So for instance, this line here, specifies, hey, just go ahead and exclude everything under slash uh, .vs code. And the same thing for a bunch of other files and directories. So a good file to not forget to keep in mind, otherwise your image will end up being bigger than, than necessary. So with that, we should be ready to start building our image. So what I'm going to do is uh, just open a, a new terminal. And to build the image, what you do is just use the Docker CLI. So what we're going to say is, Docker build, then you has you have to specify uh, a tag. Uh, I mean the name for the image and a tag for it. So that you do via the dash t uh, modifier, and then we will give it a name. The name will be catalog, and then you give it a tag, uh, which in our case let's say is going to be v1. And finally, you specify the the directory from which you're going to uh, execute the command. In our case, that's going to be the current directory, which is specified by the dot. So I'll hit enter, and that's going to go ahead and build the image. So first thing it needs to do is go ahead and download any of the base images. In our case, that would be the .NET ASP.NET image, the runtime image. So we'll go ahead and do that. And then for the second layer, for the second build stage, it needs to pull in the .NET SDK, a uh, 5.0 SDK, a uh, 5.0 image. Uh, which may take a little bit more because it, it's bigger. And then it proceeds to perform the actual build process within the, uh, the image. So Docker restore and the actual publish and then all the other steps that end up creating that image. So at this point, we have a, an image ready. And like I said, each of the lines, going back to Docker file, each of the lines here represents one layer that maps to each of the steps that you see here. So it says step, uh, yeah, a bunch of steps here. So step one of 13, two of 13, three of 13, each of these will correspond to each of the lines that you can see on, on the Docker file. So these are the layers that will be cached from here on so that you don't have to do them again. So in, in our case, if we don't have, if we don't, if we don't make any change, if I just try to do Docker build dash T, uh, the same command again, I hit enter really, mostly nothing happens because everything is cached. So only if you make some changes, then those some of these layers may need to be executed again. Now, one thing to remember is that uh, this is not the only container that we need for our REST API. We also have the MongoDB container, which is the one that handles, that acts as, as our database server, right? And which is the one that has our database. So we need to make sure that uh, our new container for the REST API is able to talk to the MongoDB container. And the way to do that, at least in the local box, is by setting up what we call a Docker network and having both containers join that, that Docker network. 
So how do we deal with this, this network? To create a network, the only thing that you have to do is just say docker network create and you just give it a name. So we will say net5 tutorial and that creates a network. If you want to see the, the existing networks, you can do docker network ls and you will see we have the, our net five tutorial network already created. So now when we run our, our containers, we should take advantage of that network. So what I'm going to do is first make sure that I'm not running the MongoDB container yet. So I'll do Docker PS. The MongoDB container is running right now. So I'm going to stop it. Docker stop Mongo. So that's stopped. And I'm going to run once again the same command that we've been using so far to run our container. Let me paste that here. Same command. But I'm going to add one modifier here that says network equals and the network name that you just specified. In this case, net5 tutorial. So that makes uh, this container uh, join that network. So I'll say Mongo the name of the Docker image. So hit enter, and then the MongoDB container is running in that network. After doing that, we are ready to actually start running our uh, catalog container, which by the way, if you just do Docker images, you should be able to see our created image. As you can see, we do have catalog B1 uh, ready to be executed, as well as the uh, Docker images for the .NET CCK and the .NET ASP.NET runtime and Mongo. And so to run our Docker image, we're going to do something very similar to what we did with MongoDB. So we'll start by saying Docker run. And then instead of doing dash D for the dash, we'll do dash IT for interactive. That allows us to keep our terminal connected to the Docker run process, just to see whatever, whichever logs are coming out of that container. And then we will do dash RM so that whenever we stop the the container, uh, it actually it's, gets deleted, so we don't keep it hanging around. And now we specify the port, similar as we did with MongoDB. Now we have to specify which is the port that's going to be mapped from our local machine into the container. In our case, let's pick 8080. It doesn't have to be it. You can use any other valid port. And that needs to map to the internal port in the Docker image. Now, for uh, ASP.NET uh, uh, and .NET 5 images, um, the base image itself, the ASP.NET uh, runtime image, defines uh, or overrides the port where the app executes, at least for HTTP. So that port is 80. So regardless of the fact that we've been using port 5000 for local development, when we base our Docker image in the ASP.NET Core uh, runtime image, uh, the port is overridden into 80. So you will have to specify 80. And if you don't want to use 80, there are ways to specify the port that you want to use in your Docker, in your Docker file. But in our case, port 80 will be just fine. Now we have to remember that in order for our app to connect to MongoDB, we have to specify a series of settings, right? So if you remember, when we go to app settings.json, we have this MongoDB settings section where we specify host, port, and user. And not only that, if we remember going back to settings, MongoDB settings, we specify host port user and also password, which is coming from Secret Manager. So in this case, since we're trying to talk to, Mongo, to MongoDB uh, from within the container, we can no longer use just local host to reach out to it. Okay, remember that each of these, uh, uh, each of the apps running inside of the container, both our REST API and the MongoDB are running in an isolated way and they can no longer resolve things by local host. So for our REST API to talk to the MongoDB container, it has to do it via the name of the container uh, of MongoDB. In our case, remember that we, we gave it the name of Mongo. So we have to override the host name uh, to talk to Mongo. We don't have to touch AppSets in JSON file for this. What we can do is just take advantage of the configuration system of, uh, of .NET 5 to be able to override the settings. So this MongoDB settings section can be totally overridden by environment variables. And that's what we're going to do now. So as long as we follow the convention, we should be able to make that happen. So I'm going to say dash E, that's the way that you define an environment variable in, uh, in, in Docker. And I'm going to say 
I'm going to use MongoDB settings. So just copy that. And then I'll say colon host. And that host is going to be Mongo, the name of the Mongo container. So that's how you can override this local host that's specified here. Now, the same way that we did that, we need to specify a password because the password that we've been using so far is stored in the secret manager. And the secret manager is only being used for uh, development, uh, development purposes. It's only available in development environment. It is not available in production. And the Docker image, the Docker container is really going to be running in a production environment. So how do we feed that password? Same thing that we did uh, just now. We'll say MongoDB settings. Let's not forget to also add dash E. MongoDB settings, password, and then we specify the actual password. Pass bound word one, and that's it. And then let's not forget that we need to join also this container into the same network as the previous container, the Mongo container. So that's going to be network net5 tutorial. Make sure this is exactly the same network that you used before. And finally, the name of the container and the, and the, and the name of the image and the tag. So that will be catalog v1. And I think I may have a couple of mistakes here. So the first thing might be, let's see, yeah, so it should be dash dash rm as opposed to dash rm. And the next one would be, yeah, so this one should be equals as opposed to colon. And then I'll hit enter. So that has started our Docker container. And as you can see, our hosting environment has now changed it from development to production. So production is the environment that will be reflected when you run the Docker image as opposed to development anymore. So now let's see if things are working properly, we should be able to reach out to our REST API at port 8080. So let's open up Postman. And now let's just switch from port 5000 to port 8080. And let's see what happens. Send. And truth to be told, uh, the API keeps working. But now, as you can see, we're hitting uh, port 8080. So things are happening within the Docker container. Also, notice how we did not get a redirect anymore. So instead of getting a 307 like, like we did before, we got a 200 right away. So there's no more a redirect happening in there. We're just going via the HTTP um, endpoint. Now, to keep things uh, interesting, let's actually post one more item here via our post tab over here. And I'll do the same thing. I'll switch from HTTPS to HTTP, and then I'll do port 8080, 8080. And so let's say let's say that we bring in back that antidote we used so, some time in the past. And then I'll do price 15, and I'll hit send. And as you can see, now I'll just close the console now. The antidote has been created. Now, really, the interesting part about uh, uh, Docker and Docker images is uh, not just being able uh, to create them, right, but also to be able to share them so that they can be used by either uh, other persons or some other systems. So uh, how could we share this Docker image that we have in our box now uh, with some somebody else? Right. So. Just for the sake of, of this part of the tutorial, we'll do something very simple to see how this can happen. Uh, we're going to take advantage of a service called Docker Hub, which you can find. Let me open up the browser here. You can find at hub.docker.com. So this is uh, the place that uh, the creators of Docker offer so that people can uh, publicly share their Docker images. Uh, so creating an account here is totally free. So feel free to try it out. So you have to come up with some Docker ID. Uh, I mean, some it's kind of a username, an email, and a password, and then you can have your own account in Docker Hub. So how can I get uh, my image published into Docker Hub? So let's go back to Visual Studio Code, and I'll stop my Docker container now by doing Control C. And the first thing that I'm going to do is actually lo logging in into Docker Hub. So once you have an account in there. Uh, you should be able to do a simple Docker login to be able to start pushing image in there. So what I'm going to do is just say Docker login. So this is going to ask me for my user username. My case is WC, 
it will ask for my password and now I'm logged in so now in order to get our uh, currently existing image into Docker Hub we just need to do a little bit of a retagging to tell it where we want to place this image so let's list our images once again Docker images and so here's our image catalog b1 so we want we want to do is just retag this in, in this way uh, so let's do docker tag catalog b1 that's the current the current tag catalog b1 and then our target tag is going to be starting with our username my username in this case Julio C and then slash the name that uh, of the uh, of the image in docker hub when it gets to docker hub it's actually going to be called a repository and so that repository in our case is going to just be catalog it doesn't have to be you can choose but i'd like to keep it just the same as we had before so it's going to be julio c slash catalog b1 hit enter and like i said this is just a tag so if i do docker images again what you're going to find is now you have catalog b1 and julio c slash catalog b1 but if you notice the image id and you look closely you see that the id that both of these images have is pretty much the same so it's really you can think of these tags as just pointers into uh, one of, of, of the images but with this retag we are able to now actually push the image into docker hub so what i'm going to do now is just say docker push our new newly retag image catalog b1 hit enter and this starts the process to upload uh, not just our uh, REST API uh, Docker image, but all the layers that are composing this REST API need to go into Docker Hub. So remember that our Docker image is actually based in uh, the ASP.NET Core runtime image, and that one in turn is based in some uh, distribution of, of Linux in this case. So all of those things need to go into Docker Hub so that anybody else can in the future just pull that image and start using it. So this may take a while because it's a it's an upload uh, um, upload task. All right. So the image finished uploading, and now if I go back to Docker Hub, what I'm going to do is actually sign in with my account here. And as you can see, I do have my image just uploaded a few seconds ago, Julio C slash catalog. And uh, here's the one tag that we have right now. So tag B1. So let's see, now, now let's play the, uh, the role of somebody that does not have this image in their system right now and that they want to use it. Uh, in that case, what they can do is either do a, a, a Docker pull or just run the image. So let me show you what I mean. So the image is now available in Docker Hub. So I go back to VS Code. And what I'm going to do is just uh, completely remove the image that we have uh, currently in our system. So let's do uh, Docker images once again. And what we're going to do is just remove these two images so that it gets completely out of, uh, of the system. And to do that, I'll do Docker RMI, Julio C slash catalog B1 and docker rmi catalog b1 so now there should be no catalog image anymore in my system as you see only i only have these three images right now and so now uh, oh the other thing that i'm going to do is just do docker logout uh, to simulate somebody that actually has no access to my uh, docker con docker registry uh, but uh, since the image is public they should be able to pull it. So in order to pull the image, you can either do the docker, docker pull operation, so docker pull, or you can run it right away. So, and we can run it in the same way that we've run it before. So let me show you, it's going to be pretty much the same command line. So I'm going to actually copy paste here. But now instead of just saying catalog B1, what we can say is Julio C slash catalog B1. So, just keep in mind so I am at this point I am somebody that has never uh, that has never had access to the catalog uh, rest API service I have no access to the docker file or anything about how we build this image I just want to run it for the very first time 
So I do this command line and uh, hit enter. It says, yeah, I cannot find this image locally. So we'll go ahead and actually pull it from Docker Hub and then run it. And as you can see, it is already running. And if I go back to Postman and I try to query for items again, I get uh, my items from this Docker image. So that's how you can uh, publish or push your Docker image into uh, what we call a container registry, in this case, Docker Hub, and then it is uh, pulled back uh, potentially in some other machine. That's how you can share it. So we may end up using some other form of Docker registry in future videos, but for now, I just wanted to show you how you can do the sharing of Docker images across systems. In this episode of the .NET 5 REST API tutorial, we continue our path towards deploying a REST API to a production environment by introducing Kubernetes. We will talk about the implications of running containers outside of the dead box with no downtime and how Kubernetes is a perfect fit for this and the many other challenges of running distributed systems resiliently. Today you will learn why a container orchestrator is needed, what is Kubernetes and which are its basic components, how Kubernetes enables resilient distributed systems, how to stand up a basic Kubernetes cluster in your box, how to deploy your REST API and MongoDB to Kubernetes, and how to scale a Kubernetes deployment. So if you remember from the previous video, we talked about this um, orange box, which so far we've been talking about, it is the, the production environment, right? Uh, in this case, let's just call it a node. Uh, but in the end, this is the, uh, this is the either the physical or the virtual machine where we're going to be running our Docker engine, right? And it is thanks to this Docker engine that we're able to run a, a bunch of containers in this node. Uh, this could be either our REST API containers or also our MongoDB container or many other containers, right, that we want to run in this node. However, uh, a few interesting questions start arising as we uh, move forward with this approach, right? For instance, who takes care of pulling and running the containers? Right? So, uh, I mean, you can imagine that without any further uh, sort of automation, somebody will have to come to this box and actually start doing Docker run uh, for each of the containers that we want to run in this box, right? So that's an interesting question. So either some automation, somebody, some, somebody has to take care of this. How to run the containers, uh, right? So uh, who knows or where is it written uh, all these different environment variables, secrets, and different common uh, arguments that we have to feed into Docker Run to be able to run the containers exactly the right way for each of the cases. And what if uh, what if we don't have enough uh, container instances, right? So what if we need more? So something or somebody has to start spinning up more and more instances uh, as as needed. Uh, both for our REST API containers or for any other containers that we want, we may have in this box, right? And then uh, also, uh, uh, we may we, we may not be able to fit just. I mean, we can only fit so many containers in a box, right? So at some point, uh, we may need to introduce yet uh, more nodes, right? And then. Uh, Somebody has to decide if the containers that are going to be created are going to go into, in this case, into node, node two, node three, into node n, right? So who decides these these things here? So do we have a a, a person that is, is looking at the different stats for each of these nodes and just decides to do Docker run in each of these in each of these machines? How does that work? Also, uh, are the containers healthy? So what happens if one of these containers crashes? Uh, what do we do? Uh, who is uh, on point to make sure that we bring back uh, this failed container and so that we keep having as many as we wanted in, to start with. Uh, also, where do we store all the secrets? Where do we store the database files for our, for our uh, MongoDB database? Where do we put all this? Uh, how do we enable containers to talk to each other? Right, because we know that our REST API containers need to talk to our MongoDB container. But how do we enable that communication? In so far, we've been using this Docker network, right, to make them communicate. But um, as we have more boxes, more containers, how do we make sure that they can all talk to each other? 
And one more thing, how do we uh, reach these containers from the outside, right? Because all of these containers are running in the box, uh, but all of them are running with some port uh, opened locally. Uh, but then what if somebody comes from the outside? What, what would be that public IP that somebody from the outside will use to talk to these containers? And if they talk to them, uh, which of all the instances would serve the request? Because we have so many instances in there. Who decides which is the, the right instance for the request that's coming in? So all of these questions, how can we solve all these challenges? So this is exactly the, the reason why we want to introduce an orchestrator tool like Kubernetes. So enter Kubernetes. Um, so as we describe what Kubernetes can do, let's uh, think again about these, uh, these nodes, right? So we have, let's say we have these three nodes and we need to start uh, placing containers in them. And we have to do a bunch of things to get these containers uh, up and running uh, in, in the right way. And so instead of having to have uh, an individual person or some sort of a script that needs to run uh, uh, to be able to allocate and to make sure that everything is going properly in across these nodes, uh, we're going to be introducing this component called, uh, well, actually a series of components that we call the control plane in Kubernetes. So the control plane has uh, several components that take care of all the, um, the, it's kind of the brain of Kubernetes. Uh, so it decides how to schedule uh, the, the containers into the different nodes. It decides what to do if one of these, uh, one of these containers uh, is destroyed how to bring back one, one more, how to let them communicate to each other, and a bunch of decisions, right? So for instance, um, when we want to get uh, one new container deployed to one of these nodes, what we can do is, uh, via the control plane, we can create a, a deployment. So what this deployment is going to do, uh, deployment is, by the way, one of the resources inside Kubernetes. And so what this deployment can do is go ahead uh, find the image that we need in the container registry and then allocate uh, uh, what we call a pod uh, for that uh, for the container that we'll be we're pulling in. Now the pods are really the, the smallest deployable unit of computing that you can create uh, and manage inside Kubernetes, right? So the pod, it, it has a similarity to uh, what we call, a, uh, if you think, a pod of wells right that i guess that's the the, the symbol for uh, for docker but it's a group of one or more containers that are sharing uh, storage uh, and network resources and it, it, the, the pod also declares how to run the containers inside them right so you will always be working more with pods than with containers you can really uh, work with the containers directly you will always be working with pods so for instance in this pod we will have, let's say, one container, which is a very common case to just have one container per pod. Uh, but you don't have to have one. You can start standing up via this deployment object. You can start standing up more, more than one container for, let's say, this is for our uh, catalog REST API. But uh, in this uh, first node, we don't have to just have this catalog API, right? So we could have some other pod uh, for some other service that in this case has not one, but two containers inside of it. And more than that, uh, we will have also a, a pod for our Mongo, for a Mongo container, right? That we need to also pull in, and uh, that has access also to this database. Database needs to get uh, granted access to some uh, storage uh, to be able to store the database files. But then the thing is that the, the these catalog pods don't have to be just in node one, right? So when we run out of space, we may want to take advantage of, of, of other nodes like node two here, right? So again, the control plane will take care of deciding where to put these, these pods across the entire set of nodes that we have here. So in this case, we just seen three, but you can think that this can be an entire farm of tons and tons and tons of nodes. And then control plane will decide which is the node that is uh, the perfect fit for the pods that need to be allocated, right? If deployment declares that it needs three pods, so this may be one, uh, one way that the pods are distributed. If deployment says, no, I need four pods, then we may want to deploy yet another pod, uh, pod four into node three, because node three is just free at this point, right? Same way with some other pod, it may want to be allocated somewhere else, there's no space in node one, so let's just put it in node three, let's say, just because node three has so much uh, memory available, right? 
The other thing is that uh, uh, pod three, let's say pod three wants to talk to uh, actually all of our catalog pods. We want to talk to the database, right? So how do they do that? So there's this object called the, the, the service in Kubernetes and the service allows us uh, to reach the other components that are available uh, somewhere else in the cluster. Uh, so in this case, I'm saying, well, I'm going to reach out to the Mongo service and via that Mongo service, I, I, I am actually able to reach to the database. And in a similar way, if we have uh, an external client that wants to talk to our catalog uh, REST API, uh, how can it reach it? So again, we stand up a, a catalog service, uh, which can be reached in, in our case for now, it's just in the local host, but eventually it could be a public IP. And then uh, this client can reach to, the, to this service and via that service, it can reach uh, not just one, but all of the pods that are running behind uh, behind this service, right? So it's a way to uh, to route to those uh, to those pods. So all of this is what we call. I mean, all of these components is what we call the Kubernetes cluster, right? The sum of all these components. And now uh, what I'm what I'm showing here is really just uh, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of all the possible resources. And um, uh, and the series of configurations and the capabilities that can be uh, used within Kubernetes. Really, it, there's a lot that can be done with Kubernetes. And but here we will just explore just a few of them to understand how it works. And so, in terms of benefits of using Kubernetes, uh, one of the, the main things uh, about this is the ability to turn desired state into active state. So, like I said, uh, we create a deployment object where we say, "Hey, I want three copies of the catalog uh, service." Uh, so that's a decided state. So Kubernetes via the control plane will have to figure out how to make those four, uh, four instances of the catalog container available as pods somewhere in the series of nodes that we have available. If you have three nodes, just find space in those three nodes. If you just had one node, so figure out how to allocate that in that one node. Or we could have hundreds of nodes, right? So turn decided state into actual state is a key feature of, of Kubernetes. Then, uh, like I said, select nodes to run the pods. So it, it, the control play has knowledge of uh, the, the stats of each of these nodes. So depending on the, the, the amount of CPU or the amount of RAM available in each of the nodes, it is able to allocate the pod in the right place. It also allows for self-healing. Uh, and so if it detects that, that one of the pods, let's say uh, pod three is just uh, uh, is just uh, destroyed for any reason, it should be able to automatically bring back uh, another pod. So let's say that uh, node two, the entire node just goes down, right? If that happens, then uh, uh, the control plane will know that it is able to, uh, I mean, that is missing one node, uh, sorry, one pod, and then it needs to allocate that pod somewhere else, either node one or node three in this case. So this is the self-healing capability of Kubernetes. That's super handy. It also is able to store configuration and secrets. So it has a it has a place to store all the configuration that you need for for the services, and also to store so safely store um, uh, sensitive information and like secrets so, somewhere in there, so that they cannot be compromised. Uh, like I said, it provides service discovery and load balancing. So when the client comes and talks to the catalog service, it is able to be directed to the right uh, to one of these nodes, following following some algorithm to load balance uh, across them. It also ensures no downtime because whenever it, um, it let's say that we want to deploy a new version of our catalog uh, uh, Docker image, right, across all of these pods, it will not just destroy all the pods at once and bring back a bunch of pods with a new image. It actually does, uh, will, will uh, uh, slowly uh, roll out the new version of the, uh, of the image as, as new pods as it starts destroying the older pods. So only when it confirms that um, new, the new instances of the pods are available, it will start uh, getting rid of the older ones. So that way it keep, I mean, it makes sure that uh, there's no downtime for our, for our clients. And uh, it can also uh, auto scale. So uh, it, Kubernetes can be configured to say, hey, if uh, there's so much CPU being used across the across all of our nodes, uh, just uh, spin up even uh, more pods uh, in uh, any other available nodes uh, to satisfy the demand. So 
uh, within this tutorial, we will, we will be doing a scaling exercise manually, but Kubernetes can be also configured, be configured to do this scaling automatically for you. Uh, it also it is able to on-demand st uh, auto storage, so you can easily declare that you want so much storage for your pod, and Kubernetes will, I mean, without having, you don't have to know exactly where that storage is going to be, you just have to say, hey Kubernetes, I need storage, and Kubernetes will be in charge to figure out where to find that storage and make it available for the pod. And finally, it provides uh, what we call gradual rollout and rollback. Just, just like I said, uh, it will gradually start bringing in new pods as needed. And also, if there's some issues with uh, some pods, it is able to roll them back uh, to uh, a previous uh, healthy version. So now that we know what Kubernetes is, let's see how to get our catalog REST API and the MongoDB database deployed into a local Kubernetes cluster. To get started with Kubernetes, the first thing that we're going to need is a Kubernetes cluster. Luckily, if you're already using Docker in your box, you already have an easy way to stand up a simple local cluster for development purposes. Let me show you how. If you go to the Windows taskbar, you should be able to find this Docker icon. You can right-click this icon, select Settings, and this opens Docker settings in your box. I'll maximize this. And here, what you're looking for is the Kubernetes section on the left side and then enable Kubernetes over here. So I'll just stick on it and then I'll click apply and restart and then click install. Now this is going to take a while if this is the first time that you're enabling Kubernetes because this is going to set up a, a local cluster, simple with just one node, uh, but still it is a local cluster uh, that uh, Docker needs to download a bunch of Docker images for all the components of Kubernetes into your box, so that, so that may take a while. In my case, I already have all these images downloaded, so it was a bit faster. Once it's complete, what we're looking for is this message here that says Kubernetes running. It should say running and it should be green, and then you know that you're good to go. So I'll just close this window now. With the Kubernetes cluster up and running, one of the first things that I'd like to do is to make sure that I am connected to the correct Kubernetes cluster. And that we can do via the kubectl command line tool, which is the command line tool to interact with Kubernetes. These tools should be already installed for you with your Docker installation. So you, you should be able to start using it right away. I'll open up a brand new terminal. And what I'm going to do is just type kubectl config current context, hit enter and that is giving me back Docker Desktop. So indeed, Docker Desktop is the, is the name of the cluster installed uh, by Docker uh, once we enable the Kubernetes cluster. So we are good to go on that side. Now it is time to start creating uh, or declaring uh, how we want to deploy the components uh, into Kubernetes for our REST API and the database. And to do that, we'll need to uh, write a few YAML files. To make this simpler, what I'd like to do is to take advantage of the Kubernetes VS Code extension. So to do that, I'll first just close this terminal and I'll go to the extensions hub and I'll search for Kubernetes. This one here should be the first hit. I'll just say install. It should take a few seconds. And now it's ready. So I'll close this. What I'll do now is go back to our file explorer and I'm going to create a folder to start storing uh, all the files that we need to deploy our resources to Kubernetes. So this is going to be our Kubernetes folder. It can really be any name as you please. And then the first file I'm going to create here is going to be named catalog.jaml. And I'm naming it this way because this will declare all the resources that we need to deploy our catalog REST API to Kubernetes. And also to keep things simple, uh, to speed up the process, I'm going to take advantage of that Kubernetes extension that we just installed to generate a little bit of code uh, here. So I'll just say deploy, and that pops up a little bit of IntelliSense, as you can see. And then uh, we just have to click it, and that will give us a basic shape for a deployment resource. Now the deployment resource is what you would use uh, to declare the desired state of the, the containers, or specifically the pods that you want to get deployed into Kubernetes, for, in this case, for a REST API. So let's understand what's, what this file means. 
So if you see, the first line declares what we call the API version. This is something that all the Kubernetes resources will, will have. And this allows you to specify uh, what is the API surface that you want to take advantage of in Kubernetes. So depending on the version that you pick here, you will have access to more or less features of the resource that you're configuring. In this case, a deployment resource. Um, second line declares the, the kind, as, as we know, it's a deployment object. And then we go to metadata name. Metadata name defines the name for this deployment. So in our case, we'll just name it catalog deployment. And then we go to the spec section. The first part of this spec section is the uh, what we call the selector. And the selector is what we use to specify how is this deployment going to select the pods that it's, it is going to manage. So in this case, it is saying, well, I'm going to, uh, to manage all the pods that have the following labels. And in this case, we just have one label. It is called app. And then there's a value. The value that we're going to assign here is going to be catalog. So all the pods that have an app label named for, with the value catalog will be managed by this deployment. So then we keep going into the template section. So here is when we're going to declare uh, all of these, uh, the containers that are going to be included in the uh, in this deployment. So one of the first things to declare here is the uh, the label or the labels for these uh, for for the pods. In this case, we're going to name uh, these these pods as catalog. That's going to be the label. So that's the way that we can identify all the pods that are related to catalog in this case. And this one has to match exactly uh, the label that we just typed a moment ago so that the deployment can actually manage these pods. Then we move forward to the most interesting section, which is a spec under template. And the first thing that we are going to find here is containers. So here we declare the list of containers that are going to be included in this deployment. And the first thing that we have to do for this very first container is, uh, well, give it a name. So again, to keep things simple, we'll just name it catalog. And then we have to declare which is the image that uh, we are going to be deploying. In our case, we're just going to be using uh, that image that we created in the previous video that we deployed to Docker Hub. And then in my case, it was Julio C catalog B1. So we are saying we are going to be pulling down into Kubernetes this image named Julio C catalog B1. That we were saying there but you could specify any image that, that you want here. Next, we go into the resources section. So here's where you declare what resources, uh, and specifically in terms of memory and CPU in this case, what resources are needed from the Kubernetes node uh, in order to run your REST API. In this case, I'm just saying, well, I'm going to be needing 128 uh, megabytes, which by the way, one megabyte would be equivalent roughly to uh, 1,024 uh, kibibytes. And so that's a default value here. You could change this uh, according to your needs. And then on the other side, we have the CPU, where we are saying uh, that we want to use 500 milli CPU. So this is an interesting notation. Uh, what it really means is uh, this is similar to say, uh, I'll just type here, would be kind of like 0 0.5 uh, CPU. So roughly, half CPU, uh, just to understand it better. Um, so 500, um, so basically we're saying we, we are good to go with uh, one half CPU for our REST API, which should be definitely enough for us. Next, um, let me just scroll down a bit. We have the ports. So here's what we declare, which is the port that, uh, that our container is, is exposing and that uh, we can communicate to in order to access the, the REST API. In our case, we're going to do just as we did in the previous video uh, when we mapped into the into port 80 because we said that the, uh, the our base ASP.NET uh, core image uh, overrides uh, our port and, and by using port 80. So we will be using the same port, port 80. So that's a port inside the container uh, where we can reach the REST API. The next thing that we're going to need in this deployment is uh, a few environment variables. Because if you remember, uh, when we run our container, we had to specify both uh, the host to be able 
for it to be able to talk to our MongoDB container and also the password uh, for the user that connects to that, um, to that database. So how do we specify environment variables in this case? It's fairly straightforward. We can use the env section. So you just type env and then uh, you have to declare key uh, name value pairs for each of the environment variables. So the first one we're going to declare is uh, the one for host. And then if you remember uh, in app settings JSON, which I'm going to open right now quickly, we have this hierarchy of settings, right? We have MongoDB settings and in MongoDB settings we have host, port, user, and password. So I'll go back to catalog YAML and we have to follow that same hierarchy. So I'll do MongoDB settings. And then the way to separate uh, and to go into the hierarchy in, um, in this YAML file will be via double underscore and host. Remember when we run, uh, when we pass the variables into the container, we use colon, uh, but in this YAML file, the convention we're going to use is going to be double underscore. So that's how you address these different settings. And then we'll give it a value. The value for the host in Kubernetes is going to be MongoDB service. And we'll see in a moment uh, how we define this MongoDB service. But for now, uh, so yes, this is how we can address uh, the MongoDB container that we're going to declare later on. Next, we need an environment variable for the password. But before we can declare it, we actually have to create this password uh, and, uh, in Kubernetes. And luckily, Kubernetes has this built-in support for secrets, um, uh, sensitive information like that. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do is just open my terminal and I'm going to actually use a shortcut here, Control J, that opens up the last terminal we used. And I'll scroll down this a little bit. And then what I'm going to type here is uh, the kube control uh, option to be able to create a secret. So that will be kubectl create secret. And then I'll type generic. Generic is the is a type of circuit that we can use in this case, but there's a few other options that you that you can also use. Generic is fine for us. We'll name it catalog secrets, and I'll use plural just because you can actually put multiple secrets in one of these uh, secrets here. Uh, but we're only going to be using one. And in order to type it directly in the command line, what you do is say from literal, and then you actually specify and the name and the value for the secret. So the name is going to be MongoDB password and the value is going to be just like we did before pass pound word one and then I'll hit enter. So that created the secret. Now that we have created the secret we can actually go ahead and um, declare it uh, and feed it into an environment variable. do that, we'll do something similar. So we'll say name. And again, we follow the, the, the hierarchy, right? So MongoDB settings. In this case, double underscore is going to be password. And then in this case, we don't want to just type the value. We want to read it from the secret. And to read it from the secret, what we can say is value from, so enter, and we'll say secret key ref. So we are referencing a secret that's named name. It's going to be catalog secrets. It's the name that we gave the secret. And the actual key within that catalog secrets is going to be MongoDB password. So that's how you can address a secret from the declaration of an environment variable in Kubernetes. That's looking good. I'll close this terminal again, have more space here. And the next thing that we want to specify here is our, um, our health probes. So the health probes is the mechanism that uh, enables Kubernetes to constantly monitor the health of our REST API by using the health checks that we already defined. So if you remember a few episodes ago, we declared some health checks in the REST API. So now it's what gonna, we can actually is when we can actually use them uh, to let Kubernetes know if our containers are in good shape or not. And if you remember, we had both a lipness and a readiness probe. So both of them we're going to be using here. 
So I'll start with the Leibniz probe. And to declare it, what you can use is Leibniz probe. And then um, the kind of probe, that there's a few kinds of probe. And what, I'll, what I'm going to be using here is the HTTP, HTTP get type of probe, which is just going to call some HTTP path uh, with, with a get verb into the API. And so the path that it needs to use is, if you remember, that would be held live. And it needs to use uh, port 80 uh, for that one. And that's it. That will be the Leibniz probe. And I'll just copy this to define our readiness probe. The readiness probe is going to be very similar, but it ends in ready. So if you remember, we would use the Leibniz probe to tell if our REST API is up and running, and the readiness probe to tell if any dependencies uh, of the REST API are responding correctly and are ready. And, and basically, the REST API is ready to serve requests. So with that, we have uh, properly declared a deployment for our REST API, but it is not enough. Uh, so this will go ahead and create the pods, pull the, pull the containers, and with environment variables and all that, but still there's no way to reach, um, for anybody to reach into this container from the outside. And to enable that, we need to bring in another component that's called a uh, service. So that service we could either create in another YAML file or we can just declare it right here, which is what I'm going to do. And the way that you separate these two different resources in the YAML file is by using um, three dashes. And then you can go ahead and start declaring your resource. So I'll do some intelligence again here. So I'll just type service and that brings up the Kubernetes service intelligence uh, here. So I'll click on it and that will scaffold a little bit of, of uh, pieces in there that we can take advantage of. So, uh, so the service is the is the type of resource that you use to be able to address uh, a resource within Kubernetes, either internally or externally, which is what we need at this point. The service we need to give, uh, we also need to give it a name, just like we did with deployment. So we'll name it catalog service. And then one piece that's not listed here, that, but that is important for us is the type. There's a few types of uh, services, but in our case, we want to use a type named load balancer. Load balancer is the one that uh, allows Kubernetes to request um, uh, an actual IP uh, or an actual, or not, I guess not an IP in this case because it's localhost, but it requests a way for to uh, to open kind of a window to the to the outside so that people can actually reach out to our REST API from the outside. So we'll see how that uh, that name resolves uh, when we run this. But yeah, load balancer is the one that we need to use. Otherwise, we cannot reach the service from the outside. For selector, we have to specify uh, the pods, uh, well, the label for the, the pods that we have declared before. If you remember, these pods here, when we declared the template, we said that the labels for all the pods that are going to be managed by the deployment is going to be catalog. So that same label is the one that we have to use when we declare the service. When we declare the selector, we're going to say, well, we're going to, this, this service is going to be able to target any of the pods that have the app label with the value catalog. So that's how you connect the service with the pods. And then you also have to specify, okay, so which is going to be the port that uh, that from the outside, uh, the people can reach uh, into our API from the outside, and that has to be mapped into a port in the in the container. So that port, in this case, is going to be we're going to be using just 80, just because it's the default port for HTTP. So that will allow our clients to not even have to specify a port; they will just be able to just go directly into the API. So they will go into port 80, and the target port has to be the port that we have to specify for the container. So remember, over here imports, we declare container port 80. So container port 80 is the target port that we want to use here. So it's really mapping 80 to 80, but it doesn't have to be like that. We could we could have said, let's say 80, 80 maps to 80. That would be totally fine, just like we did with the container, but it is more usual to just say port 80. So now we should be uh, ready to start uh, deploying this, uh, well, to, to deploy these, both these resources, both deployment and the service. 
So how do you deploy this into Kubernetes? So we have to go back to our kub control tool to be able to do that. So I'll open up my terminal again, control J, and I'll switch to my Kubernetes uh, directory. The command to apply this, this deployment is, uh, well, this, this YAML file is kub control apply dash F and then the name of the file. Hit enter and you should get a, a couple of messages st stating that the, the deployment has been created and the service has been created. Now, if you want to see uh, which is this deployment or what's the state of the deployment that, that should be created, what you can do is just say, keep control, get deployments, and that will give you a list of all the created deployments. This case is saying we have a uh, one deployment named catalog deployment, and uh, Currently, it is saying that zero of one of the bots is it is ready to go. Uh, so it means that it is not really ready yet. And so uh, let's dive in a little bit more and get details about the actual bots that got created. So what we can do is say kubectl get bots. And so as you can see, all uh, the, the one pod that we have declared here, uh, the name starts with the name of the deployment and then uh, it gets a name for what we call the replica set, which we've not, we will not talk about in, in this video. And then finally, some identify for the actual pod. And then uh, indeed, the pod is not ready. So this is saying zero of, of one pods are ready to be used, right? To be reached by the outside. Um, but still it says running. So this means, what this really means is that our, um, our liveness probe, right? You remember we have a liveness probe, is, is reporting a healthy status but our readiness pod is not reporting a healthy status. So to find out a little bit more of what's going on here, and I'll expand this a little bit more, uh, let's actually get some logs from that uh, catalog pod. So kube control logs, and then the name of the pod, hit enter. And then we're seeing something interesting here. Let's, let me scroll up a little bit. Uh, yes. So here, as you can see, the our MongoDB readiness check uh, is failing with status unhealthy. The operation was cancelled, and as you can expect, this is uh, well, this is totally expected because we have not really deployed any database yet. Uh, but this is great. This this confirms that our uh, readiness health check, uh, both health checks are actually working properly. And we just need to make sure that we fix this problem with the database. We bring it up and then uh, we should be able to have an, uh, a REST API up and running. Let's close the terminal and let's actually declare what we need to declare for our database. So I'll go back to my Kubernetes directory and I'll say new file. And this file is going to be called mongodb.jaml because everything we're going to declare here is just for the deployment of that MongoDB database. Now, the type of resource that we're going to create for MongoDB is actually called a stateful set. And since we don't have a way to generate the skeleton for a stateful set uh, yet, uh, we're going to use the deployment template for this. So let's just do deployment, select Kubernetes deployment. And then what I'm going to do is just switch from deployment to stateful set. So a stateful set, it has similarities with a deployment, but it is actually meant for stateful applications. Uh, so a stateful set uh, provides guarantees about the ordering and uniqueness, uh, uniqueness of pods. Uh, so when you see the pods that are created by a stateful set, they will not have random, uh, random names. They will actually have uh, some very specific order names. So for instance, in the case of this one, it may be called MongoDB1, MongoDB2, MongoDB3. And more than that, if one of these pods dies, let's say MongoDB1 dies, and when it comes back, it will come back as MongoDB1 once again. And this is pretty important in the case of MongoDB because uh, we will attach a, a persistent volume to it, uh, with, which will have the database uh, data files. And we want to make sure that those files don't just get lost uh, as, uh, as the pod is reconstructed in the case that it needs to be killed for any reason, right? So we want to keep it around. So the right type of resource to use for a, for a persistent service like MongoDB would be a stateful set. 
So just like we did with the deployment, one of the first things to do here is to assign a name to the stateful set. In this case, we will name it MongoDB stateful set. And then one important thing that's not being generated here is what we call uh, the service name. And this service name is used to give uh, some identity both to the stateful set and to the pods that are going to be uh, managed by it, uh, which is not actually needed for deployments, but for uh, stateful set, it's, it's a requirement. The name that we're going to give here is um, MongoDB service. And we see how this service is tied later on to the MongoDB service and back to the catalog later on. Then also, just like we did with the deployment, we need to define uh, which uh, are the labels that the stateful set is going to be using uh, to select uh, the pods that it's going to be managing. So in this case, let's say that our pods are going to have the MongoDB, uh, the MongoDB value in its app label. And if we're going to do that, then we have to make sure that in the pod template down here in labels app, uh, we have to be using the same value. So all our pods are going to have an app label uh, with a value of MongoDB. And then the stateful set is being configured uh, to manage all those pods with the MongoDB value in the app label. Now we keep going down into the container section inside the spec. And then let's just give uh, the name of the container. Let's just name it again, MongoDB. And then for the image, we'll, be, we'll use the same image that we've been using so far. It's just Mongo, the latest version of, of Mongo. Then we keep going down into the resources section and we will leave these resources. They should work just fine for us, but it's up to you to modify uh, how much memory and CPU you expect to be using for your MongoDB server and your MongoDB database. Moving on, we have to declare the, con the, the port where the MongoDB uh, container is listening on. And by now we know that this port is 27070, right? So that's the port that we have to use to, con to connect to the MongoDB service inside the container. And once again, like we did with, uh, with Catalog YAML, we have to define a couple of environment variables to be able to talk to the, well, to be able to start up our MongoDB uh, container. And those are the username and the password for the, uh, for the user configured for, for MongoDB. So let's declare an, sorry, let's declare an M section. And here let's start declaring. Uh, so the name of this environment variable is mongo init db root username. And the value that we're going to assign to it is uh, the one that we're using so far. Mongo admin, and then for the for the password, we're going to be using really the same secret that we use in catalog. So I'm switching to catalog here, and uh, I'll just copy our password section into MongoDB, paste here, and fix indentation. And then, uh, as you see, we're reading from the same location, but the name of the environment variable is just a little bit different. Uh, it's going to be mongo init db root password, right? So that's a, that's a username and password environment variables that the MongoDB container is expecting. The next thing that we need to define in the case of the MongoDB container is uh, what we call a persistent volume, right? So we need to uh, declare uh, some store. We, we need to ask uh, Kubernetes for some storage space to place uh, the the data files for our, our database. Uh, otherwise, uh, I mean, yes, a database will exist within the MongoDB container, but when the container uh, and the pod that contains this container is killed for any reason, the data will just uh, disappear, right? So we don't want that to happen. Uh, so to do that, we create what we call a persistent volume. And to create this persistent volume, uh, we're going to use what we call uh, as a volume claim template. So let's do that. And let me make sure I pick the right place for this. Uh, yeah, it should be here. So let's say volume claim templates. And really the volume claim templates is a way to declare or, or to ask Kubernetes uh, for some space, some storage space in the node where the, where the pod is going to be uh, executed, right? So I need some space and we have to declare uh, some details about that space that we're going to reclaim. So first we're going to set up some metadata and we 
pretty much just need the name here. So what's the name that we're going to give to this, uh, to this volume? Uh, that's going to be data. And then we have to specify uh, the spec, specifications for the volume that we're going to ask for. So that goes into the spec section. And then here we have to uh, specify uh, an access mode, access modes. So access modes declares uh, which way uh, is this persistent volume going to be going to be mounted into the node. And actually, this should go in the previous line. Uh, we'll do it like this. And uh, for our case, the mode of read, write once. Uh, once should be good enough and really this one here means uh, that the volume that's going to be created that's going to be mounted uh, is going to be mounted as read write and for a single note so meaning that just one note can uh, read and write to this volume at a time uh, if you wanted to you wanted to have more than one node be able to write to this volume you will have to use a, a different kind of access mode and then finally, we have to define uh, uh, the, the resources that we need here. So in this case, we'll declare resources and then uh, requests. And finally, uh, storage. And here's where we declare how much space we want uh, for this volume. And for our case, uh, let's go for one. I think the, the term will be gbyte, uh, similar to one gigabyte. Uh, that's going to be as much storage as we're going to reclaim for this volume. We'll save this. And so with this, we have reclaimed space in the node, right? Uh, for this, uh, for, for MongoDB. However, we still need to tell uh, our container that such a space exists and we have to map that space in the, in the host machine to a space into the container. And to do that, we're going to declare a volume mount. The volume mount needs to be declared inside uh, the container spec. And so I'll just type here, volume mounts. And here uh, we're going to specify uh, a, a name for it. And this name will have to ma match exactly the name that we have specified uh, for the in the volume claim template, right? So we said uh, it's going to be data. And so data is the name that we should use here. And then the mount pad is the pad where traditionally MongoDB stores its data files right inside the container. So that, that space is going to be uh, slash data slash DB. So what this really means is that when MongoDB, MongoDB container writes into its data DB directory for the data files for the database, those files are going to end up into the, uh, the, vol the persistent volume that has been declared on, on this side here, right? So the data gets written outside of the container and into the, uh, the persistent storage in somewhere in the host. So this way, if the container goes down, if the pod goes down for any reason, uh, the data is not is not lost, and it will come back as the pod comes back with the same identity in this stateful set. The next thing that we need to do, just like we did uh, with the with catalog YAML, is declare a service, right? A service that allows us to address uh, or to get to this MongoDB service. And so I'll just do this, and then I'll type service for Kubernetes service. So it generates just like we did before. And uh, just like before, we, we have to specify some name for this service. Let's call it MongoDB service. And then one important and missing piece here is this thing called the cluster IP. So cluster IP is what you would use to specify the IP address for your service, right? And so by default, um, uh, any service will get uh, a local IP uh, that, that can be used uh, to talk to other services within the cluster. Uh, but in our case, uh, what we want to create is what we call a headless service. So we don't want to assign an IP to the service uh, because uh, in a stateful set, uh, we want to address each of the nodes, uh, sorry, each of the pods individually. So in this case, we're going to say uh, none. So we don't want an IP in, in this case. So it turns it into a headless service. Now for the selector, once again, we have to specify uh, how is this service going to be uh, mapped into the pods that exist uh, for, for MongoDB, right? So for that, we have to go back once again into the pod template. So pod template, metadata labels, app. Uh, the label that we're looking for is app and the value is MongoDB. So we go back, copy that into the selector, MongoDB. So Anytime a request comes into this service, it will find the nodes that, uh, sorry, the pods that have been uh, tagged with the MongoDB a value in the app label. 
and then that that's what how, that's how it is going to find them. Finally, we need to specify the ports, and so just like we did with the container, we're go just going to do a simple mapping of 27017. So any request that comes into 27017 should go, should be redirected to the port where the container is listening on, and that that port is again, as you can see here, 27017. So I'll just copy that over here. Now that we have done this, uh, it should be ready to to get uh, to get started with this MongoDB container. So I'm going to open up my uh, my terminal again. Control J, opens terminal. I'll scroll down this a little bit, and then um, I'm going to switch to the Kubernetes directory. And here I'll just do kube control apply dash f, and then our YAML file. MongoDB YAML, and I'll hit enter. So both the stateful set and the service have been created. And so at this point, let's see uh, uh, how does this stateful set look like, right? So let's do kub control get stateful sets, and that gives us uh, the one uh, stateful set that has been created, MongoDB stateful set, which seems to be ready. Uh, it, it's healthy, it's in good state, and it's ready to be used. Now that we did that, let's take a look at all the pods that we have right now. So once again, give control, get pods. And as you can see, now we have uh, our catalog pod. Uh, uh, it is actually ready. So it's no longer reporting zero of one, it's reporting one out of one. And that is because the it is because the uh, the ready uh, the readiness probe that was trying to reach into the into our, our MongoDB database, it is now able to actually do it. And that's because we now do have the MongoDB service uh, available. If you remember when we were in catalog YAML, we declared that the MongoDB settings host was going to be MongoDB service. It was not available yet, but now that we have declared it and we have deployed it, we do have the MongoDB service that I can reach out to, and then uh, that allows our health check to pass. So we can connect to the database successfully. And just like we have that pod, we also have the pod, uh, the MongoDB stateful set zero. So as you can see, it is not a random uh, a random uh, ID as it is in the case of the deployment. It's more of a very specific numbered and ordered uh, index for these uh, stateful sets, right? So if it dies, it, it needs to come back with that same number. Let's now see if our REST API is working properly now that it's running within Kubernetes. So let's open up Postman. And last time that we did a get against our uh, REST API, we did it over port 8080, so because that's a port that we exposed when we run it is as part of Docker. Uh, but now we have switched to port 80. And we can either uh, query the API like this, or we can just remove 80 because it's a default HTTP port. So this should be good enough to do a get against the API. So let's see what we get. And sure enough, we don't get any results because remember, this is a brand new database uh, that is now hosted inside uh, Kubernetes. So it's expected to not have any data, uh, but we can go ahead and create something in there. And so I'm switching to the uh, post tab here, and um, I'm going to also change this to just be HTTP localhost items. And then for body, let's come up with something quickly. So let's say we're going to create a potion again, price 12, and then hit send. And sure enough, the potion has been created. Uh, we can create yet one more thing. Let's say an antidote uh, with price, let's say 17, uh, hit sent, and has been created too. Go back to the get, hit sent, and we are getting our two items now. So the REST API is working properly, but everything is now running within Kubernetes. And so we talked about this capability of Kubernetes to self-heal. Right, so it should be able to always enforce that desired state, regardless of what happens to the pods. So let's see um, uh, how how that exactly works. So I'm back in VS Code now, and what I'm going to do is just to get a little bit more space here to be able to visualize things better. So I'm going to move this left side all the way to the left, and then what I'll do is I'll uh, spin up another terminal with the split terminal button, so that now we can have two terminals side by side. And I'll move things around a little bit like this, perhaps right there. And so what I'll do is on the left side, I'm going to be watching for the bots with 
git control get bots dash w so that lets me see any changes that happen uh, across the the currently existing pods in there and on the right side i'm going to simulate the uh, the killing of one of these pods so let's say uh, that yeah i mean let, let, let's imagine that the pod had some bug and that causes the the pod to crash right that then what happens so let's do give control delete pod and so let's try our catalog pod, our only catalog pod. And I'll go ahead and, and, and delete it. So I'll hit enter and see on the left side how right away, uh, as soon as it uh, starts terminating that pod, it immediately starts spinning up a, a brand new container, right? So that's the capability of Kubernetes to always detect this discrepancy between the desired state and the uh, actual state. And as soon as it detects this situation, it, it needs to do whatever needs to be done uh, to bring back things to consistency, right? So in this case, the new pod is up and running. And then I'll just do Control C and I'll do get pods again without the W. And you can see that now we have, again, our two pods. But now we have a, a catalog pod with a different identity. Right, you can see it's not the same identity as before, and that's because uh, deployment type uh, the deployments uh, create pods are ephemeral in ephemeral in na nature, right? So they are just stateless. Now that's not the same case as for uh, our stateful sets. As we said, our stateful sets should be uh, persisting across uh, the lifetime of of a pod, right? So if we just have this MongoDB stateful set zero here, uh, what happens if we delete it? Right. More than that, what happens with the data that is being held by this MongoDB pod? Because we already have data in there. So would it survive? Would the data just still be there? Will the pod come back? So let's try it out. Uh, so I'll do, I'll wash again for the pods and I'll copy the name of our stateful set. And so I'll do kubectl, uh, kube control, delete pod, and I'll do MongoDB stateful set. Let's see what happens. And see on the left side, the pod is indeed getting terminated uh, but right away, Kubernetes detects that it needs to bring it back. And it needs to bring it back with the same identity, MongoDB stateful set zero, because this is a stateful set, right? And we don't want to lose uh, the, the data that's being held by this pod. And in fact, uh, if I just control C this and okay, I'll do get pods, we have our two pods. And now we should be able to verify that the data uh, is not gone. So it should still be there. So if I go back to Postman and I query for the data once again, we can see that the data is still there, so it has not gone anywhere. So, uh, so that means that indeed uh, a persistent volume got created, and the data is being stored outside of the container and into the host, and that's enabled by our stateful set. So I'll go back to VS Code now, and uh, we also talked about this uh, capability of Kubernetes to easily scale. Uh, the, the pods and the containers inside them uh, without really much, much trouble, right? So if we, out of somewhere, uh, out of nowhere, we need, uh, we have much more uh, requests in our website and we need to have not just one pod for catalog, but we need to have three, uh, what, what would we do? Uh, how can Kubernetes uh, help us with that? So once again, let's monitor what's happening on the left side, get pods. And then what I'm going to do here is just ask Kubernetes to scale the deployment. So to scale the deployment, what you can do is, Cube control scale deployments and then it will be catalog deployment and then you have to say how much right right now we have one now we want to have three so i'll hit enter i notice on the left side that it immediately starts provisioning uh, a bunch of new uh, pods uh, to enforce this new decided state right and this happens blazing fast Right. So if I just do control C now on the left side and get pods again, you can see that we already have uh, three pods uh, where we only had one just seconds ago. So here you can tell uh, like the power and of the combination of Docker uh, containers uh, and Kubernetes, right? How we can bring in a uh, much more uh, instances of our containers of our, of our REST API in this case, without really much trouble, just running one line. We now have three copies of, of the container running. And now uh, the whole point of having these uh, three replicas of the pods is so that we can do some good load balancing between them, right? So when a request comes, it should land in one or another of these pods. And how can we ver verify that? Uh, 
Well, unfortunately, we don't have uh, a good means to do that right now, uh, but I think we can easily introduce a little bit of logging into the pods so that we can easily tell uh, to which pod the request, uh, the request is landing in. And so to do that, what I'm going to do first is uh, just, I'll just close the terminals for now. And then I'll go to our explorer, I'll go to our items controller. And here I'm just going to add a little bit of logging. To add logging, what we can do is bring in the standard uh, iLogger interface. So I'll do read only iLogger of items controller. And let's call it logger. And so iLogger is. Uh, is a, a standard uh, object available uh, in, in .NET 5, uh, so pretty much in any application .NET 5. And um, so what you can do here is just do dependency injection as you do with uh, any other uh, service, uh, built-in service of .NET 5. Yeah. And I'll capture the logger instance right here. And now that we have that, uh, what we can do is just uh, pick one of our APIs and do some logging. So I'll go for the easiest one, which is going to be our uh, get items API. So in this case, I'll just open up here uh, one line and I'm just going to log a little message that says uh, how many items uh, we found, right? So to do that, what I'll do is just logger.log information. And then let's do a little bit of string interpolation here. Uh, first thing I'm going to put here is uh, the current uh, current time, and I'll do that via the daytime class. Uh, I'll use the UTC time to string, and then we'll show uh, just the time uh, in the format of hours, minutes, and seconds. Okay, so I'm time formatted there, and then I'll just do colon and I'll just say retrieved. Um, items that count uh, items okay so just for for us to verify that things are landing in different pods so I'll save this and then then with that change what we have to do now is to create a new version of our uh, docker image so I'll open up our terminal now and I'll delete one of these so that we only have one and here I'll do what we did uh, in, in the last video so I'll just uh, run our docker build command and uh, I'll be publishing this into docker hub so I'll be I'll keep using the same format as before uh, using my username first and then the name of the image and then the one thing that I'm going to bump here is the tag because uh, this is a new uh, a new version of the image so we should be bumping it let's say to a b2 uh, this is necessary so that kubernetes can later tell that uh, this is a new image and that it needs to pull it down from docker hub otherwise it will not be able to tell so then I'll say dot I'll hit enter and then I'll just miss I'll just miss one parameter here which is the dash t for the tag he'll enter again and this is going to build the image uh, it's going to uh, reuse some of the cache layers and then it's going to build just the piece that is needed okay so the image is built now I'm going to do uh, I'm going to log in into docker hub docker login And now I should be able to just push the image over there. So I'll do docker push wc catalog v2, hit enter. And then again, some of the layers are going to already exist in Docker Hub. So only the layer uh, that's missing, which is my little change uh, of, of one line of change here, uh, is the one that is, is included in this image and is the one that needs to be pushed into Docker Hub. Okay, so with the image in Docker Hub, uh, we should be able to tell Kubernetes that we want to start using it. So for that, I'll go back to Catalog YAML and I'll say, hey Kubernetes, I don't want to keep using uh, the image version one, I want to use version two. Save that. And then uh, back in the terminal, I'll switch to our Kubernetes folder. And here, uh, I'll, I'll just apply this uh, file once, once again. So cube control apply dash f and then uh, we'll do catalog yaml okay and so now if we, if we do 
could control get pods let's watch see what's happening and so as you can see uh, the the all uh, the old containers the old pods are getting destroyed and new pods are, are getting immediately uh, being st stand up uh, for the new image the new image version that we need to be using so this should take just a few seconds and so I'll control C now and I'll see the actual status of the pods let's see what we got uh, so yeah, so we have uh, three new copies of our uh, catalog REST API, three replicas of the pod, and so now we should be able to tell if we are load balancing across them. So to do that, what I'm going to do is, again, I'll just make some more space here. I'll expand this terminal. It has even more. And I'll split the terminal now in three so that we can uh, tell the logs of the of the three pods. So first here, uh, now I'll go back one directory, and I'll say uh, could control get pods, so we get the names of all the pods, and then I'll do a one by one. I'm going to do uh, keep control logs for this one, and then I'll do dash f so that we can tell the logs. And then I'll do the same here, so which is our second pod. Let's take a look. It's going to be this one here. Dash F. And then the third one is this guy here for our third terminal. To control logs dash F. Okay, so now we're tailing uh, the, the three pods. And I'm going to go uh, back to Postman and perhaps we can accommodate this into here, just on top of the other one to see what's going on. Yep. And uh, yeah, so one more thing actually that we have to change in Postman is uh, our headers. Uh, let me actually maximize this for, for a moment uh, because uh, the default behavior of Postman is that it's going to send this uh, connection header uh, with the value of keep alive. And what that's going to do is actually uh, set up a, a persistent TCP connection between Postman and uh, our pods. And that will actually prevent our little exercise from allowing uh, the subsequent connections to go into different pods. Uh, so just for our testing purposes and to see how, how things work, I'm going to disable that uh, that header here and, and see how this, these things work. And uh, yeah, so with that, I'll minimize this in this way and let's send one request and see where it lands you see it landed in, in the, our first pod on the left side and uh, retrieve two items at 704 52 let's send again and now it landed in, in our second pod let's send again oops again in the second pod and then at this point is going to be a little bit uh, random uh, I mean the algorithm that's supposed to be using is round robin uh, but uh, really things can land in any pod at this point. So there you go, uh, load balancing in Kubernetes, uh, fairly straightforward uh, without you having to do really uh, much work on it. If, and if you scaled into dozens of pods, then all of them will be serving your requests appropriately. In this episode of the .NET 5 REST API tutorial, we talk about unit testing, test-driven development, and how to implement them to raise the quality of a REST API. Today you will learn what is unit testing and why it is so important, what is test-driven development, also known as TDD, and why you may want to consider it in your projects, how to unit test a REST API controller via the XUnit testing framework, how to mock dependencies via the mock framework, how to write better assertions via the Fluent Assertions library, and how to implement TDD in practice. So what is unit testing? This is a topic that I'm very passionate about and to understand it, let me introduce a quick analogy. Imagine that you're a member of the team in charge of testing this SpaceX rocket for the first time. The engineers have used dozens, maybe hundreds of different parts and systems, some not even produced by SpaceX, to assemble this awesome vehicle. Everybody put their top game to build the rocket and now we would like to see if everything works as expected. Launch day is here, and then... Yep, 
Yeah, that didn't go as expected. Turns to be, you can't just assemble a bunch of parts and test them all together the very first time the rocket is launched. Fortunately, this is not how they usually test a rocket before launching. Without getting too technical about rockets, because I'm definitely not an expert in the area, I just wanted to show here a simplified diagram of the parts of a rocket that I got from the NASA website. All of the different components and systems, like the payload system or the oxidizer, are also individual units of this entire vehicle that all need to operate properly before the rocket can lift off from Earth. And the engineers don't just build these units and send them to the assembly team to put them on a rocket and after everything is put together, figure out if all the parts work or not. Each part of the rocket is tested in isolation, likely several times, way before being sent to the final assembly into a rocket. This gives certainty to the teams behind each part that as long as it is used according to specifications, that unit will work as expected. And the same goes for the team assembling the entire thing. They know that they can connect all the parts according to specification and the rocket should fly. This saves time and money for everyone and likely saves a few lives along the way. So in terms of software engineering, we can define unit testing as a way to test every piece of code in isolation without external dependencies. Now, coming back to our catalog REST API, even with as simple as it is at this point, we do have a few components that talk to each other, like the items controller, our items repository class, the Mongo client instance, and finally the MongoDB database. Each of these components are made of a bunch of methods that represent the behavior that we can get out of them. For instance, the items controller has, has functions like get item, create item, update item, delete item, and we will certainly keep adding more in the future. These are the different granular units that must individually work correctly to ensure that the whole service provides the expected functionality. Therefore, for each of them, we need to write a series of unit tests that really exercise every aspect and every corner of each of these methods to give us enough confidence on their quality way before trying out the whole service from Postman or from any other client. Beyond this, unit testing has a bunch of benefits that you definitely don't want to miss. With a unit test, you can quickly verify your code without having to worry about dependencies. For instance, you can make sure that your repository class can retrieve items from the database without having to stand up or talk to a database server at all. And such a test can give you results in milliseconds as opposed to seconds or minutes. You can make changes without worrying about introducing regressions. After you have a unit test in place, you can refactor your code as much as needed without concerns of breaking the service because you know that the unit test will provide you with that safety net. Unit tests will catch bugs at the point where it is easier and cheaper to fix them, which is before merging your code to the code base and way before getting it deployed to production. Fixing something that is already impacting, impacting customers in prod can have an enormous cost, both in human hours and of course in the amount of money lost by anybody that uses our service. And unit tests, if done well, can be the best documentation of your REST API since every use case should eventually turn into a unit test and those tests can't lie. They must represent the way that the system works. Now that we know what unit tests are, let's also talk about test during development or TDD. So what is TDD? Simply put, TDD is a software development approach where you write a test before you write just enough production code to make the failing test pass. This translates into a cycle made of three phases. A red phase where you write a test that represents your software requirement. This test fails because you have not implemented any production code yet. In fact, the test doesn't even compile at this point. A green phase where you write just enough production code to make the test pass. You don't need to implement anything beyond what's needed to pass a test and inelegant or ugly code is allowed at this point. Finally, if needed, you refactor the code you just wrote while you keep running the test to make sure that they stay green. It is at this point where you eventually arrive to code optimize it for readability and maintainability. You keep repeating this cycle for any new piece of functionality. This is a basic cycle of TDD. Why would you want to embrace TDD? Well, there are a lot of benefits of embracing this practice, but there are three aspects I like most. With TDD, you start by focusing on the requirement not on the implementation. This gives you a lot of freedom in terms of trying to properly address the requirements because you are not constrained by an already implemented piece of code. 
When you implement the code first, you end up writing tests that verify only as much of the implemented code as you have time or patience for, because you already invested a lot of time and effort in that code. You get increased test coverage because, by definition, you would have not written any more production code other than needed to pass the tests. Again, when you don't do things the DDD way, you might end up with multiple corner cases that, might for that you might forget or might not have time to test properly, reducing the test coverage. Finally, clean design is enforced from the start. As you write the test, you will naturally start designing the pieces of the production code in such a way that leads to a passing test. The classes and methods emerge from the test and you naturally avoid the pitfalls of writing code too coupled to be tested. There are three main unit testing frameworks in the .NET ecosystem these days. NUnit, NSTest, and XUnit. They all fulfill the same purpose of allowing you to write and run your unit tests in an automated way. However, for any new projects, I strongly recommend you choose XUnit. This framework comes from one of the original authors of the popular NUnit framework, but it was written to be more closely in line with the .NET platform and to help write clearer tests. It is also more intuitive than MSTest, which requires more attributes in test classes, some of them not straightforward to use properly, especially for developers new to the platform. Let's see now how to implement unit testing and TDD in practice. It's time to add a new test project for our unit tests. But before we can do that, I think we should restructure things a bit to give our REST API a more specific directory that will live side by side next to our upcoming test project. So I'll start by going to our Explorer view on the left side, and I'll just look for an empty section over here. And I right click and I'll say new folder. The new folder is going to be catalog.api. And now let's move most of the directories and files over there, except for the VS Code, Bin, Catalog API, and OBJ. So let's grab everything else into Catalog API, move. And now that has all the files for the Catalog REST API. Now let's close this, and then let's delete this directory. We don't need this Bin directory or this OBJ directory. Those are gone. Now, just to match the folder name, let's rename the project name into catalog.api. And then we'll have to make a bunch of renames in a, across a bunch of files just to match this new project, project file name. So I'll copy this name here, close this, and then I'll go to search and replace. And we're going to replace catalog.csproc into catalog.api.csproc. So let's just replace all. Then we'll do the same thing with the DLL. So catalog.dll, it's the output DLL. It's going to be renamed into catalog.api.dll. Let's replace these, all the files. Now let's look at the namespace. So today we have this namespace catalog, and that should turn into namespace catalog.api. And then for every, every of the classes that are using that namespace, let's make sure they use the new namespace. So using catalog should turn into using catalog.api. Let's do that replacement. Now let's look at our um, let's see, a VS Code that's a JSON file where we have this uh, workspace folder slash catalog API. It's time to change that, so replace this with slash catalog.api slash I'll do just in this file replace all all the entries it's all done and now let's go to launch.json and do a very similar replacement so workspace folder into catalog.api workspace folder slash catalog api replace all in this file and I think that's all we have to do so I'll just close this too and then I'll do control shift B to make sure everything is building properly yeah, looks like it is. I'll close this. I'll run this one here just so that nugget packages are restored, but everything looks fine. So I'll close terminal. Now, among the things that we modified, and I'll collapse this one, is the Docker file. So the Docker file is now pointing to uh, so catalog api.csproc. So I'll just I just want to make sure that this is still building properly. So I'll rebuild our Docker image now. So I'll open my terminal. Let's open a brand new partial terminal. And given this new directory structure, I'll have to go into 
catalog.api and here I can run my docker build command again. So I'll just do docker build dash t and then it's going to be will you see slash catalog b3 and dot okay so b3 because we were creating a new version of this uh, docker image which was b2 last time hit enter okay so the new image is created i'll do docker images so yeah it's right there the image was created so everything looks just fine so this is great i'll close terminal and i'll close this file so now we can actually create our test project so i will uh, collapse this for a moment. So we want to create a new test project just at the same level. Uh, so I'll go back to the terminal actually, and we're going to go up one directory. And to create a test project, you do it actually very similarly to as how you do for the creation of the web API. So you just, you just use a .NET CLI, so .NET new. And uh, like I said before, the preferred test framework for test project is a X XUnit. So I will go for XUnit. And let's name this project catalog.unit-tests. Okay, hit enter. And our, our unit test project has been created. So it's this one over here. It has a project file and an initial class, uh, test project class over there. Now, one interesting thing that we have now here is that we need to build uh, not one, but, but two projects, right? And so anytime we want to make sure that everything is building properly. However, our VS Code environment has not been configured uh, for that yet. So if you do look at task.json, and I'll close this, uh, it is configured to build only the catalog API CSPRO. So how can we make it so that anytime we build, it builds both projects? So there's a handy a way to do this um, that I'll show you. And what I'll do is I'll create a new file at the root here, just at the root, uh, that's going to be named, we will call it just build that prog. Okay, and then uh, I'll collapse this for a moment. And this file is going to allow us to build uh, all the projects in, in one shot. So how do, you, how do you do that? So let's declare the following. So you will do project SDK. And here we're going to be using the uh, build travels, traversal SDK. So to do that, you just type here microsoft.build.traversal. And then you specify a version. So because this is actually going to pull a Nugget package down into your machine. Uh, the last version that I found last time was 3.0.3. So I'll do that. Okay. Let's go ahead and also close this. And inside this section, you have to specify an item group. So item group. And I'll close that item group. And here you have to reference all the project files that you want to compile. So for that, you want to type project reference include equals, and then we'll just do this, this expression. So everything, so star dot star proc. So any files that end in proc uh, are going to be compiled by this file, okay? So with this file ready, let's go back to Explorer. Um, let's actually go ahead and into task adjacent and let's ask it to no longer just build catalog API CSProc, but instead it's going to build build.proc. All right, so with that done, I'll do Control Shift B. Yep, and now let's close this, let's close that. Uh, you can see that both, uh, let me just do this for a moment, uh, catalog.api DLL and uh, catalog unit test DLL have been built by this one command. Um, so notice that you don't need uh, a Visual Studio solution for this at all. Uh, this is this is my preferred way of building uh, like all the projects in a solution in a solution. So build that prog, just include all the project files, and that will do the that will do the trick. Right. So I'll close these two now. And then our test project here will need, of course, a reference to our API because we're going to be testing the API controller. So let's make sure we have that reference. So open terminal again. I'll switch to my PowerShell terminal. And then let's see, I'll go into catalog.api, sorry, catalog.unit-tests. And then I'll do .NET add reference. 
and then we're going to go into catalog.api catalog.api.csprop right so that adds the reference if you look at unit tests close this uh, it will have that project reference right here okay so now the project the test project can use any of the files or reference any of the files in the uh, api project close that and then we're going to need a couple of additional nuget packages in this test project let's actually open this again uh, and these are going to be uh, first we're going to need the nugget package for uh, extensions login abstractions so let's do that .net add package microsoft dot extensions dot login dot abstractions and this is because we are going to be uh, using or well, trying to test our controller class which uh, if you look at it quickly the controller class does receive a, a logger in constructor over here so we're going to be uh, needing to use this iLogger class and for that we need that nugget package that we just added the other package is .NET add package uh, it's called mock M-O-Q and this is, uh, and this is a little framework that can help you uh, actually mock your uh, your classes the classes you're using in your controller so that uh, you can uh, test only the pieces uh, that you care about in controller but you don't have to worry about how to uh, create or or how the dependent or external dependencies of that class uh, work and we're going to go into those details uh, in a moment but yeah those are the two nugget packages that we need for now so i'll close terminal again and then let's start focusing on our uh, test class. In this case, you need test one. Uh, let's rename this class into a more appropriate name. So rename this into items controller tests, right? So the convention that we're following here is that if the controller is named items controller, that's a class name. Uh, we're going to be using the class name with the suffix of tests for the test class. So items controller tests. That's the one that we have here. And that's the one that we're going to use for the uh, for the class over here. Items controller tests. I'm going to collapse this navigation pane now. Uh, I'll do a control shift P, make sure everything is building properly. And then if you happen to be getting uh, any of these red squiggles here, uh, which it should not be there, but if it happens, let me just close this. What you can do is just do Ctrl Shift P and do Omni Sharp Restart Omni Sharp, or you can type that there, Omni Sharp Restart Omni Sharp, and that should uh, take care of that. Now, notice this fact attribute that was added to our auto-generated test one uh, method here. So, fact is the attribute that you have to use to declare that uh, 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 one of the methods in this class is actually a test method. So that's the only way for the test runner to recognize that it has to execute this test. So just don't forget to add fact to each of your test methods. There are other ways to declare or to decorate uh, your methods as test methods, uh, but for this tutorial, we'll stick with fact. So now let's go ahead and start writing our first unit test. But before that, let's look uh, again at our items controller class and let's see what should be unit tested. Uh, we will write unit tests for all of our, all of our methods over here, uh, but let's start with get item async, uh, just because there's a couple of um, simple and nice cases that we can go uh, across this, this method. Uh, in fact, as for receiving an ID, as you remember, uh, we will be able and we will try to find the item in the repository. And if, I can, if we cannot find it, uh, if it is new, we will return not found. Otherwise, we will go ahead and convert the item into a, a DTO. So let's write a couple of unit tests uh, for to verify this method. So going back to our test class, uh, one thing that I'd like to encourage you is to use a uh, is to use a good naming convention for your unit test. This is very important because it helps. It really helps to identify what is this test supposed to do. What it, what is it really verifying without having to go into the uh, all the details about the unit test. So one one good naming convention that I like is the following. Uh, you want to use three parts here. That's going to be unit of work, state under test, and expected behavior. Right? So first part, unit of work. So what is that you're testing? What is the function that is going to be tested by this unit test? That's unit of work. Then state under test. So under which conditions uh, are you testing this, this test method, right? 
and then uh, finally the expected behavior so what do we expect from this uh, from this unit uh, uh, as we execute this test after we execute uh, the action part of this test so now translating that into our get items async method uh, let me just copy the name here uh, the unit of work is in fact the name of the test method so get item async and the first case that I'm going to test is uh, what happens when uh, we cannot find the item. So the item, the item is null, right? This section here. So in that, for that case, I'm going to say with an existing item. So the item does not exist. What will be the expected behavior then? It's returns not found. Okay. So that should be a, a good uh, name for our unit test, our first unit test. Now, uh, within the body of your unit test, there's also some other another good convention that uh, encourages to encourages us to write the test in this way. So there's going to be three sections here. The first one is called arrange. Second one is called act, and the last one is called assert. This is also uh, uh, named as AAA, arrange, act, assert. And the idea is that you're going to first have an arrange section where you're going to pretty much set up everything to be ready uh, to execute the test. So just before executing the test. So this includes any sorts of uh, mocks, variables, uh, any inputs that you're going to need to before executing the test. Then we go to the act section where we actually execute the test. We perform the, the one action that we are testing here. And finally, the assert section where we verify whatever needs to be verified about the execution of, of, the, of the action of the unit. Okay, so how does that translate into our unit test? So we want to test items controller. And for that, we'll have to, of course, create an instance of items controller. However, remember that we need two parameters here. So we need a repository and we need a logger. Now, one thing to remember here is that for the purpose of testing this unit, this uh, get item async method, we don't really care uh, about the internals uh, of how rep the repository, for instance, the repository behaves. So we don't care what happens uh, normally when you call get item async. As you know, that will go ahead and talk to the database, retrieve the item and all those things. But we don't want to test that. We don't want to test the repository. We just want to test the get item async method. This is the, the one unit that we want to, to test. So you have to make sure that uh, you find a way to exclude those dependencies and the, the, the behavior of the dependencies from this test and just focus on testing what's, what's right here. So to do that, uh, of course, we cannot use a real, uh, an, a real item repository or a real logger. And here's where we have to introduce uh, what we call, uh, what we call uh, stops. And so a stop is going to be a kind of a fake uh, instance or a fake version of, of these items, uh, of these uh, classes that are going to be used just for the purposes of the test. So let me show you how that how that looks like. So in this case, I'm going to say, uh, so we need a repository, right? So let's, I'll, I'll say repository stop equals new mock. And then mock is, it comes from the, from the mock library that we installed a moment ago using mock. So this is a library that allows us to uh, mock any of the, a mock or stop any of the uh, different dependencies of our class. So luckily, our controller, as, as we looked at the previous videos, we made it in such a way that we can do dependency injection in there. So the controller really doesn't know what kind of repository is coming in, in here or what kind of logger comes here. It just look, it's just looking at interfaces, as you can see. So that gives us a flexibility to fake these both dependencies from, our, from the unit test. So I'll go ahead and say, okay, so this is going to be a new mock of I items repository. Okay, let's see if I'm missing a, yeah, missing a nice space. Notice that I'm naming this uh, as a stop and not as a mock. And that's a slight difference that I like to make because uh, when you do a stops, you will not verify anything on the, on the, on this object itself. When you do mocks, you will, in the assert section, you would go ahead and actually verify something that happened to the mock across the test. Uh, so it's a slight difference, but, uh, but it's good, to, it's good to, uh, to do the proper naming here so that you understand what is the purpose of, of the variable that you're using. Okay, so now the expectation is that when we call, let's go back to controller, when we're going back to our method, when we call the get item async method, uh, the idea is that it will return a null 
and so when it returns null, we should return the controller should return not found. So we need to set up that scenario. So how do we set up this method in the mock so that it returns null? Going back here, what you can do is, is this repository stop dot setup, and then you're going to say let's say repo repo dot get item async, and then comes a parameter. Now, at this point, it really doesn't matter what's, what's the item that we are going to be passing in here. Uh, it's irrelevant because what we want to, to, uh, to evaluate is what happens uh, with, with the return value. So for, because of that, what you can do is just say it is any, which is a function provided by mock also, any good. This means uh, whichever value comes in, it doesn't matter. So mock will take care of providing some value in there. And then that will do, uh, it should return a value of null. That's what we want. That's the expected behavior. And then, uh, but uh, just so that mock does, doesn't get confused, we have to cast this into uh, the item entity. And let me add a proper namespace right there. Okay, so this is setting up the scenario for our test. So we're saying, again, we're saying when whenever the controller uh, invokes a get, get item async with any, any GUID, which mock is going to provide, uh, you have to return a null value. That's what we need for, for this case. And then similarly, we'll do something with the logger. So we'll say logger stop equals new mock. I'll say I logger of items, items controller. Okay, let's see if we're missing something again. Missing that, we're missing the controller's name space. Okay, so now we have two stops uh, ready to go. And now we need to create the actual controller. So now we can say controller equals new items controller. And then we pass it the stops. So repository stop, but we need to get actually the object property of this because that's the, the real uh, object that's going to be passed in, not just the mock, the mocked object. And then uh, logger stop that object. So that covers the arrange phase of this unit test. For the act phase, uh, here's where we execute the action. And this is normally just one line where you execute what you're going to be testing. So I'll just say salt equals await. And yeah, now that I'm using await, let me remember uh, that we have to use a proper return time for this unit test. Since we're going to be calling an async function, this test should actually switch to be an async task. Let's see, yeah, adding that. So now we can do await controller.getItemAsync. And then, uh, like I said, it doesn't matter with what, what GUID we provide here. So I'll just say GUID new GUID. And that's the action. And then finally, we'll go ahead and do the assert. So with XUnit, uh, you have a bunch of assert methods available. So let's just use assert. And then uh, what we want to verify here is that what we got was indeed a not found. Uh, and the not found, uh, there's a class that represents not found. So what we can say is assert that is type not found result. And then let's see if we're missing something. Yeah, let's add that. And then uh, what we're going to pass here is result dot result. So the result object, the result variable represents the action result uh, uh, that we received. And the result property inside that result represents the actual uh, type of result that we got, which in, in our case, it should be not found result. And now that we have that, uh, it, we can go ahead and uh, actually execute the test. And so there's a bunch of ways to actually run this test in VS Code. Uh, one of the, the, the ways that I use frequently is uh, by the, via using the code lens. As you can see over here, there's this, this set of annotations, uh, which is which is introduced by code lens, this to code code lens. And you have to, what you have to do is just click on run test and that should go ahead and run the test. So let's see what happens. It's a running test. And the test has passed, as you can see. The one test that we have passed which is good. Now there's another way to run the tests by do using directly the .NET CLI. So if you go to terminal, I'll switch to here. 
uh, make sure that you are in the catalog unit test directory. And here, what you can do is just do .NET, .NET test. Yeah, so that will go ahead and run not just not just one test, but all the tests that you have across the test project. So this becomes more handy when you have you just start having more and more tests for this test project. And as you can see, yeah, it passed. Zero failed, one passed. Now, as the number of tests increases, uh, you may want to have a better way to visualize the overall status of your test suite, which cases are passing, which ones are failing, and, and so and so. So to do that, there's actually a, a nice Visual Studio a code extension that you can uh, install to provide that visualization. So let's go to our extensions hub, and let's expand this a bit, and let's look for .NET Core Test Explorer. Just yes, the first one here. I'll collapse this for a moment. That is Cortex Explorer by Jun Han. It's the best one that I've found so far for these kind of tests. So I'll go ahead and install it. And what you need to do about this extension is to tell it where to find the, the test project. And if we go to Explorer for a moment, you'll remember that we have our tests in this catalog.unit test folder, catalog.unit test CS proc. So we need to provide that location to this extension. To do that, you can click in this gear icon over here. Just click on that, extension settings. And if by any chance these settings that you see over here are not showing up for you, uh, what you can try is just closing Visual Studio Code or closing the current uh, folder and reopening it, and then these things should show up. It may happen the very, very first time, but after that, it should be just fine. Then what you want to do is go all the way down where it says uh, Donate Test Explorer, Test Project Pad. This is where we need to specify the, the path to the test project. But also, uh, you want to go not into the into the user section, but into the work, workspace section. By doing that, uh, you are going the, what you're going to type in here is going to live alongside your project, uh, as opposed to so in some place in the in your user profile. So that's good, so that you can keep uh, everything uh, everything together. So here, what we want to specify is just a simple expression. So let me type that. So it's a glob pattern where we're going to say, just search all over the place in, inside of our catalog directory and in all subdirectories, and then look for tests.csproc. Okay. And after doing that, we can close this. And if we go to these three dots here, there's now a test section. And as you can see, there's our one test is already showing up over there. And then to run it, you can either click this play icon here, or you can just click the play icon on the top, and it will go ahead and run all the tests that are available there. So as expected, it is green. And you can see the green mark also in, on top of the test. And if there was any error, that you will get some red squiggles in the location where we where the test failed. So yeah, so we'll be using this extension across this video uh, to, to see the status of, of our tests as we are uh, adding them and executing them. Okay, so now that we have that in place and that we have a test for checking for the unexisting item case, let's add another test for the existing item. So what happens when the item actually exists? So let me actually collapse this for a moment. So I'll do hide sidebar. And let's add a second test here. Uh, I'll, I perhaps I'll just copy the header of this test. So I'll copy that over here. Here's a new test method. And this one is going to be called get item async with existing item returns expected item. Okay, and just like before, we will do the AAA arrange act and assert. Now, for this test, it is very likely that we're going to need, uh, again, our, our repository and our logger stop, both stops. So instead of copying the, copy the, the instantiation over here, uh, why not just declare a class level, a couple of class level fields, and that way we can reuse them in this test and in any future test. So let me do that. So I'll go here. So I'll declare private read only going to be mock of i items repository. Then I'll just copy this piece here. Although I could just do this. And then uh, private read only mock of i logger 
of items controller and then it will be the logger stop we can just do this and with that we can go to our initial test case and just simplify a little bit by not having to declare it here declare the stop there or the stop here okay and so going back to the new test case for this test case we will actually need to uh, have an item that we can use uh, uh, across the test because let's go back to the controller quickly items controller hide this and if you remember get item async in the case uh, that we want to hit which is the the one that returns the dto we need to have an item uh, we need to have the repository get and um, return an item and then uh, we need to convert it as dto and return it so to do that we'll have to set up that item beforehand in our test so that it can be used uh, over here so i'll go back to the test and instead of just uh, creating it on the fly for this test case i'm thinking that we should have some sort of helper function that we can use not not just in this test but in, in, instead of future tests uh, to create some random item very quickly so i'm going to go ahead and create a private function so private item is going to return an item let's call it create random item and this is going to say just return new and let's specify all the properties for the new item so it will be id let's make it good that new good because we don't really care uh, what id it uses the same way we don't really care what name this random item uses it should work with any any name so new good to string and then for the price what we want to do is probably just generate some random number so that we don't get fixed into any specific price so for that what, that, what I'll do is I'll actually create a random a variable uh, and let's put it at the top over here. So I'm going to declare private read only random and let's name it just rand. It's going to be new. So this will be able to use in, in a couple of places. So now we can go back here and we can say rand.next and then I think we said that the price should be between one and a thousand and so let's just set a maximum value of a thousand should be enough and create a date is going to be daytime offset dot UTC now okay so now that we have this handy method let's go back to our test case over here and in terms of arrangement what we have to do is first prepare the item that we're going to that the repository is going to return so we're going to say var expected item is create random item then we have to do the setup for the repository and that's going to be a little bit similar to what we did in the previous test so i'm going to copy this this first line from the previous test there so when we call get item async uh, again with any GUID what we want to do now is return that item so returns async expected item okay and then we'll go ahead and do pretty much the same thing that we did in the previous test so copy this this couple of lines over here so we declare the controller uh, with the two stops and then uh, we get a result right by invoking get item async with any GUID it doesn't matter and then it is time to uh, assert uh, what we got. So what would we like to assert here? So probably we want to first make sure that we got the actual DTO and not some other uh, result like not found or bad request or something like that. So I'll do assert that is type item DTO. And let's add any missing namespace. And then we're looking at result dot value because it is the value property the one that actually should have the DTO in this case okay and when we have asserted that what we can also do is what we should do is verify that all the properties of the return DTO match the expected item so for that let's first take out that DTO so we can do that by doing some casting here result as action result of item DTO that value and then we can do assert dot equal expected item 
that ID should equals DTO.ID. And just like that, uh, we would need to go through every single property, right? So expected item ID, now expected item uh, dot name should equal DTO dot name. And, um, and well, we'll keep going and going with uh, the other properties. But uh, at this point, imagine that you don't have just a couple of properties, but you have dozens of properties, right? As, as I say, objects can, can get complex. So, so this is going to be become very cumbersome to just keep asserting, asserting, asserting. And in fact, it's not a very good practice to be asserting too many things in this case. You should try to assert or get close to assert just one thing uh, in each test. That's kind of the best practice. And uh, so to do that, what we can do is instead of doing all this, we, we can switch to a very handy assertion library that's called Fluent Assertions. And that one will allow us to do this in a much more straightforward way. So let's bring in the terminal. I'll do Ctrl J. And I'll go to PowerShell. And here's what I'm going to do. So make sure that you are in the catalog.unitests uh, directory. And then you can do .NET add package fluent assertions. Okay, so with that, I'll just close terminal. So now we can do something a little bit different. So let me show you what we can do is now we can say result that value. And then should and then let's import the fluent assertions namespace be equivalent to the expected item. Okay, and then I'll remove this. And what this uh, is, is expected to do is that it should compare the, the values of the properties of uh, the, the resulting DTO with the properties of the expected item, the item that we created over here, right? So that way, with this very handy method, we don't have to go property by property. It will just go ahead and compare the entire thing for us. But then the only issue here is that since expected item is uh, actually a record type, as you remember, the item is a record type, uh, record types are ready uh, or write the equals method uh, of, the, of the object. And that will make it so that this method doesn't behave very well, right? Because it believes that it has to compare the DTO to the entity directly as opposed to comparing the, the properties, which is what we care about. So to, so to address this, we'll specify an additional option here which is going to be options, options dot comparing by members of the item of the item class. With that, we are saying, hey, don't compare the DTO directly to the to the item. Uh, just focus on the properties that each of them have, and as each of them have, and as long as the property is the same name, compare the values of those properties. So that way it will go ahead and, and it should go ahead and uh, tell us that the objects are the same. Yep. And so with that, let's go ahead and uh, run this test case and see what we get. So we'll go ahead and click run test. Yep. And this case is passing. And just like we did this, uh, just to keep things consistent, let's also modify the previous test to also use fluent assertions. So in this case, this is going to be result that result should be of type not found result. Yep, that replaces the previous line. Okay. So let's just verify that all these cases are passing. I'll go ahead and run this in the Test Explorer here. And yes, it's all looking good. Okay, and so now let's move ahead into our next uh, unit test. So let's go back to the controller briefly and let's see what else we got there. Collapse this. And uh, back in the controller, uh, what we want to test now is our first method here, the one that returns all the items available uh, in the REST API, in the repository. So remember, this item will just go ahead, retrieves all the items, transforms them into DTO, and then it returns them. That's all it does. So what we want to verify is that uh, for any of the items that we that we set up for this repository, that we have to set up with the repository, they have to be returned as DTOs and they should match exactly the items that will obtain from the repository. So let's go ahead and write a unit test for that. So back into the test class, again, I'm going to copy the header of this test case 
and I'm going to scroll down, down here, copy that. Okay, and so here, uh, let's do the proper naming. So this is going to be named get, I get items async. And it's going to be, uh, yes, with, exi with existing items. It will say returns all items. And uh, again, let's bring in our arrange act and assert sections. And in this case, uh, what we need is, of course, to get a, a series of items from the repository. So what we have to do first is to declare such a set of items. And we will, for that, we will create a simple array. So what I'll do is I'll say var expected items equals new. And this is going to be an array. And we're going to be using our create random item method here. Uh, a few times, perhaps let's bring in three items. Yep, so that will do it. Very handy method. And now we can go ahead and set up the repository to return those items. So I'll do repository stop setup with repo with repo dot get items async. So get one get items async is invoked. It should return the expected items. And then we have to construct the controller. So I'll do it very similar to what we did with the previous test case. So I'll just go ahead and copy this line over here. And then we will go ahead and do, uh, yeah. So var actual items equals await controller dot get items async. Okay, so that should retrieve the items. And now we have to do the comparison. So once again, uh, we can use that very handy method of fluent assertions to do just an equi equivalence of com comparison. So we can say actual items should be equivalent to expected items. And once again, we'll have to do the options because we're like, uh, again, we're dealing with record types. So Otherwise, things will not work right. And then uh, options that comparing by members item. Okay. Okay. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and run this test. Let's see what we get. Yep. Test passing. Awesome. Close that. Okay, now let's move forward back to items controller. It's time to test our create item async method. So this is the one that goes ahead and creates the item in the repository. So in this case, we have to provide and create item DTO uh, as an input. And then what we can verify is that we should be returning, we should be uh, receiving as a return uh, a DTO with the created item. That's, that's what this method is supposed to do. And in fact, that return item should uh, include the ID because the ID is not provided in the create identity. So the return item will have an ID and it will also have a created date. So let's write a, a test that can verify all these things. So back to items controller tests. Let me again grab the header of the test. Perhaps I'll, I'll grab the, the entire thing. Just copy this and then uh, yeah, remove this piece and, and remove this piece and I'll remove this other piece. Okay, now this method will be called uh, just starts with the name of the method, which is create item async. And then this will be, uh, in this case, the current state, let's name it with item to create because we're going to be providing the item that should be created. And then the expectation is that it returns the created item, right? Now, in this case, uh, the range piece involves preparing the uh, create item DTO. So in this case, it's going to be, it will be tricky to try to use a, the created random item as we've been doing so far. So we'll be, we will be explicit in this case. So we will say item to create equals new create item DTO. And here we'll provide the elements of the create DTO. So we need to provide a name, which is just going to be 
Nucoid, Nucoid, string. We will provide a price, which again is going to be just run that next uh, with a 1000 again. And I think that that will be it. So let me go quickly to create an to. I'll do F12 to make sure I've covered the properties that we need. So yes, the name and the price. Yep, back here. Yep. And then in this case, I will actually not need to set up anything in the repository uh, because uh, it is not interesting uh, what happens. I mean, it, for, for the terms of, of this test case, it is not interesting to see what happens when the repository is invoked, if the repository is invoked to create the item. So if you look back at uh, items controller, what's really going to happen here is that yeah, repository needs to call create item async and that will go ahead and create the item. But I would encourage you to be a bit careful about what you're going to be testing here because uh, you could also decide that no, I want to make sure that the create item async method is called in the repository, right? So that, so that yeah, I mean, it should get created. Um, but that's going a little bit too much into the details of the test case. Uh, so you are getting, you will be making your test case too, uh, very prone to needs changes in the case that the implementation of this method changes, right? So uh, ideally you want to treat each of your test cases in such a way that they only provide some inputs to the method and, that, and then eventually they validate the outputs of the method, uh, but they don't try to make assumptions of what is going to happen inside. So in this case, we are not going to be caring about this method at all. So in fact, we're not going to be setting it up and we will go ahead and yeah, back to the test case, we'll go ahead and just invoke, invoke the action. So we will say var created item. Sorry, it's going to be var result equals await controller dot create item async. And we provide the item to create. And then we can go ahead and, and do the assert. And the first thing we're going to do here is try to retrieve that item DTO. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll do created item is the result that result as created at action result. Okay, that's a type of result we're going to re uh, receive here is a created at action result. And from that one, we want to get the value and that value will turn it into an item DTO. A little bit convoluted for, for this case. And now we can do the same equivalence thing that we've been doing so far. So item to create should be equivalent to created item. Okay, and then we provide options. Like we said, it will be options that comparing by members. And in this case, the title we want to use here is actually item DTO. Okay, which is the, uh, the type of the object that we received from, from the test of the created item. Okay, uh, but additionally, we want to do one more thing here because uh, uh, both of these uh, uh, DTOs don't have the same members. If you remember, if we go to F12 to item DTO, this one has four properties, as you can see. Uh, but if we go into create item DTO, this one has only two properties over here. So that means that if you try to compare things like this, it's going to fail because it's going to say, hey, one of your items has more properties than the other. So this, this doesn't make sense. So in these cases, what you can do is say, uh, only look at the properties that are common between the two objects. And that will simplify things in, in this case. So that's all we can do. And then uh, in the spirit of fluent assertions, we can just do dot excluding missing members. Yep. And that should do it for that for that one assertion. Okay, so we're comparing that the two objects are uh, equivalent, uh, but we will not pay attention to any members that are missing from, from any other. However, we may want to actually check for those uh, additional members. So for those ones, we'll be, we will be a bit more explicit. So, so created item, the, the ID should not be empty uh, because the, the method, it should generate an ID for, for this created item. And also created item that create a date should, uh, uh, we don't know exactly what what they were going to get in there, but we know that it should be, it should be close to the current time, right? Because this test just takes milliseconds to execute. So we will say 
daytime offset UTC now and then uh, just to be safe we're going to give it a range of precision uh, because we don't know exactly how much time the test is going to take although it should be super fast but we're going to give it um, 1000 milliseconds to uh, for, for the difference between the times of when the item is created and the time that we're checking here okay so that should be should be it for this test so let's go ahead and run it run the test see what we get yep so test is passing it's looking good okay so the next test that we're going to look at but the next case we're going to look at is the case of the update update item async so as you remember this method uh, gets uh, the item to update it will get it from the database uh, and and if it doesn't find it it will say not found and then otherwise it will create a copy of the item to become the updated item with the updated properties and then it will go ahead and update the item in the database and finally returns no content okay um, just to be uh, to not spend too much time here we're only going to be covering one case here which is the case of where the item actually exists uh, but you can you can imagine how to test for the not found case which is a bit simpler but then again uh, don't don't get into the trap of verifying that the item is actually uh, being sent to the update item async method of the repository uh, we want to we will provide an input which is these two parameters here and we expect the output of no content of, at, at the end that's everything that we need to verify here nothing else uh, we don't need to uh, worry about the implementation of, of the method so let's go back to items control test and let's bring in again just i'll do a copy of our last test over here and so this is going to be update item async with a with existing item returns no content okay and then we don't need this we probably need the controller we don't need that and we also remove these, these pieces at the end okay so for the range piece uh, as you remember from this controller we will need a when get item async is invoked it needs to return an item right so that we can move forward in the test case so i think that that situation we covered already somewhere else so let me go back a little bit up yep so this one here so we will grab this from the get item async uh, test case let me grab that here so that, that would allow us to have an item uh, be returned by the by the repository stuff so we will name this one existing item that's the item that exists in there and now we need to declare the uh, the actual item that we're going to provide to the method so the, the updated item yeah. so let's first grab the item id as a variable so the item id is existing item that id so we'll grab that there and then item to update is a new update item DTO and so we're going to provide a name so name is going to be good new good to string and perhaps do it in another line and then for the price uh, what we can do is just take the price of the existing item price and just increase it uh, by some value let's say by three okay so that becomes the update that we perform this item so we pretty much uh, we are changing the name because we're generating a new good and we're changing the price by adding three to it then we create the controller and now it's time to do the the, the action so we'll say result equals await controller that update item async and then here's where we provide the item id and then we provide the item to update and then finally we go for the assertion then this assertion is going to be very simple because like i said we only want to verify that we we get uh, no content so result should be of type no content result that's all it is 
So again, we set up the return of the item uh, from the repository. We prepare an item to update. We modify the properties. We invoke update, update item async. And at the end, if everything went well, we should be getting a no content result. So let's go ahead and run this test. All passed. So I think we're missing just one method at this point. Let's go to items controller. So this is delete item async, right? It's going to be very simple actually to, to verify and very similar to update. We get an ID. Uh, it will have to uh, find the item. Again, we're not going to check all the cases for this case, just the case where we, the item exists. So we'll make it so that it returns the item and then uh, it should return no content. And again, we don't care what happens with the repository or any of the internals here. We just care about the fact that it should return no content. So back to items controller tests. And I'm going to copy our last test case once again. And this is going to be named delete item async with existing item returns no content. Yeah, that's an appropriate name. Uh, this setup will work just fine for this case. But then we don't have to prepare any item to update. Just do that. Uh, create the controller with those uh, setups. And then uh, we'll do delete item async with the it will be just the existing item.id. And then the assert is exactly the same as before. Uh, the result should be of type no content result. That's all it is. So I'll go ahead and run this test now. And yeah, it is passing. And in fact, if we go to our test explorer now, let's go to the test section here and let's run this. And as you can see, we have a, a full suite of tests passing at this point. Okay, so this is great. We have a bunch of test cases covering many of the scenarios in, in our controller. And uh, what this gives us now is actually a lot of confidence on making any future changes across the, across the REST API. So uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, there's, there's been uh, a few changes that I wanted to make across the board, but I, I didn't didn't have a way to make sure that it didn't break anything. But now we do. So I'm going to make two radical changes here. One of them is that I'm going to switch our entity to not be a record type anymore. So remember here, here if you go to the entities item. So the fact that it's a record type is actually making things a bit inflexible. I mean, thanks because of this, we cannot just update existing items uh, in the update a operation in the controller and we have to create this copy that's not really needed so the, this entity should be actually be mutable uh, so we don't need this init stuff here really uh, so we'll switch this to be a normal class and we will also add a description property here so that we can provide some description for the items so let's make those two changes and let's see if our test cases can help us uh, prevent breaking anything so like i said this item is going to change from record to class and then we will not be using init here, but we will switch it to just set. So set in all of this. And now this is a, a normal standard class. And also, like I said, we're going to be adding a description, description for the entity. So with that done, uh, the other thing that I like to do uh, actually is to simplify the way that we use DTOs. Remember that we have these three files for the three DTOs. But it turns to be that there's a much better, nicer way to declare the DTOs as, as record types, which actually provides even more benefits that we are doing today. So what I'll do is I'll actually just get rid of, of all these files. Let me just delete this DTOs folder, perhaps collapse this a bit. And what I'm going to do is create a new file at the root of catalog API. Let's name it DTOs.cs. Okay. Let's bring in some namespace. The right name space, which is going to be catalog.api.dtos. Uh, we will declare all the DTOs here in line in a much more uh, nicer way. So let me hide the sidebar. So for the first DTO, it's going to be the item DTO. So we will say fully record item DTO. And then we will declare the properties as if we were creating a, like a constructor for, for this property. That's something that you can do. So we will say good ID. And then let's see if we're missing using system. And then we'll do name 
the new description property, the price, and the date time offset created date. Okay, so that's enough. That's that's what you need to do to create, to declare a record type in this other syntax. Uh, so as, as you can see, it's much much more simplified. Now let's declare the next one. It's going to be public record create item DTO. And then this is going to have uh, no ID, but the name, and then the new description property, and then uh, the price. But let's not forget that we had set up some attributes here to make, to make sure that we get valid inputs. So in the case of name, we want it to be required. Let's add the missing a space. And in the case of price, uh, what we want is to verify a range. So the range, yeah, it was from one to 1,000, okay? Uh, we will not require description and uh, we will not require, we will not add the required attribute to, to price because price is actually a value type. So it cannot ever be null. You will get some value there anyways. And we will just verify that the range is correct. Lastly, let's add our last uh, DTO that we're missing. I just copy that one, and this is going to be update item DTO. Yeah, so that's all we need. So now in one file, we have we are declaring all the DTOs that we're using across the REST API, as opposed to three files. Let's see what else we need to modify. So now that we make those changes, let's look at extensions. Let's see what's going on here. Yeah, so I'll hide sidebar. So now that we change the way that we declare our DTOs as record types, they have become immutable. We cannot go through this initialization anymore. We must create the DTO via the constructor. It's the only way to create instances of them from here on. And after construction, nobody can change the properties of the DTO. So we will say new item DTO, and then we will provide item.id, item.name, item.description, item.price and item.createDate. date. All right, that's all it is. Yeah, we can we could inline this uh, over here, but it may be too much to read. So we'll just leave it like this. Okay, let's see what else we have to fix. If we go back, so there's something going on in the controller. Let's see what it is. Yep, so there's an issue with update item async. Yeah, so we cannot use this syntax anymore uh, uh, because uh, the item is no longer a record type. Now it is a standard class. And in fact, this is this is good. This is actually exactly what we wanted to fix here because there's no need to create this updated item. We could just modify the existing item. So we will say existing item dot name equals item DTO dot name and existing item that price equals identityo that the price. Yep. So we don't need this additional guy here. Uh, yeah, we'll leave it like that. And then uh, for the update, we'll just invoke existing item. Okay. So yeah, there's no more breaks uh, around here. Let's see what else. So in the catalog API, everything looks good. In the unit test, let's see what's going on. Okay, let's hide the sidebar. Let's see. Yep. So create item DTO has to be, we need to specify the, the properties uh, inside the constructor. So we will have to provide this for the name. And then probably we'll do the same thing for the description and for the price, the random number. And perhaps, so I'll delete this. And then I'll do it like this so that, that, that is, it is easier to see. There. Okay. So let's see what else we have to fix here. Yeah, same case for update item DTO. So let me copy this line here. So we have to provide that. Then we provide a description. And then we provide the price, which is going to be existing item price plus three. Okay. Remove this. Yeah. And with that, I think we don't have any more breaks or, or nothing that I can see actually. 
And so let's go ahead and uh, yeah, let's run our tests and see what we get. So I'll go ahead and run the tests. Yep. And uh, interestingly, we do have something failing here. Let's see what's going on. So create item async is the one that's failing. And as you can see, we are getting the, the X over here, signaling that there's a problem. We get the squiggles here, signaling that there's something in there. And if this, if we see the message uh, over there, you can see it says uh, expected member description to be null, but found some value in there. Yep. And then, uh, so what could have happened? So let's actually go back to uh, our controller. So I'll do F12 from IDS controller. And let's go to the create method over here, let's hide this, hide sidebar. And uh, yeah, so what happens here is, if you can spot that, is that we have not uh, presented a value for the description. So let me actually close this, close that, and this. So back to the test. Yep. So when we declare the item to create, we did add uh, a description but when we create it, um, the, the created item does not have any value for description. And th that is because we have not specified that here anywhere. So that's something we have to fix. And that's that's a nice thing about using these uh, should be equivalent to, because as you add more properties, uh, you don't have to be remembering to uh, do the proper checks in the test cases, right? Otherwise, anytime you, you add a new property here, you have to go back to the test and add the properties in there to make sure that you don't forget. But with this, the test case is actually covering you, uh, making sure that you don't forget to add those properties in the place where you're implementing the, uh, the method. So in this case, I'll do description equals item DTO that description. Mm -hmm. And with that, let's go back to our test list and let's just run them again. And it's all green now. And then one minor improvement that you can also do here is to change the way that we're doing some comparisons across uh, a few test cases. So if you go back to uh, to this test case, get item amazing, we existing item returns expected item. Uh, if you see how we're doing be equivalent to here, these options uh, we needed to do them because the item uh, the item class uh, well, it, will it was actually a record type before. So that was causing issues. Now that it's not a record type, we can uh, stick to the normal behavior. So now we can just remove this and do the equivalent to this way. And free agents will know what to do uh, because this is just a standard class. The same way we can go to the next test case and change this thing. And that should be enough. And this is only because, like I said, because what we are comparing here is standard classes and not record type. So with record type, you still have to do the other way. So let's just make sure that the test cases are still passing. So I'll go ahead and run all the tests. And everything is still all green. Okay, so that's working pretty well. And now I wanted to, I'd like to uh, switch gears into test-driven development, TDD. So we talked about TDD, it has some very nice benefits uh, because it allows you to uh, start from the test, from the requirements really, and then move forward to implementation later on. So let's uh, let's see how TDD works in practice. And what we're going to do is, uh, if we go back to items controller, and I'll hide this for a moment again, uh, let's go back to our first method here, get items async. So as you see, this is the method that returns all the items. But a new requirement to our REST API is that we should be able to return uh, the items by uh, by the name. So if somebody specifies a name into, into such a method, uh, we should be able to return only the items where the name contains the specified parameter, right? So so if they, if the uh, if we have items that have, for instance, the word potion in them, like high potion, potion, mega potion, all these, all these things, uh, we should be able to return all the items that include potion in the name and not the other items. So it's a way of filtering things. So let's see how we can go ahead and implement such a method by using TDD. So I'll go back to items control tests. Yep. So let's grab, let's grab this method, get items, items async, and then I'll just copy that just under it because there, there are similar methods. Uh, but in this case, we rename it uh, to get items async. Uh, we will say 
with matching items returns returns matching items okay so in this case we're going to go ahead and uh, we will not be using the random item anymore because i actually want to specify a, a name for our items and in fact that's the only thing that we care about in the case of this test case i uh, want to be more explicit here so what i'm going to do is uh, rearrange this a little bit so that instead of this what we have is let's name this all items bar all items equals new and then i'll just move this to the next line it's going to be a bit more verbose yeah like this perhaps and then uh, uh, in each of these lines, instead of this, we're going to uh, create new items, new actual items. So we will say new item, and here we will provide a name. So let's use something that we can use for this test. Like I said, let's go for the potion, the potion case. So we will have a, a potion there, and then let's add two more. This second one is going to be named, let's name it something completely different like antidote. And then the last one is going to be high potion. So in this case, we have two items that, that have uh, the, the same the same term, potion, and another one that doesn't have it. And then we'll declare a variable here that we're going to say it's name, name to match equals potion. Now notice that we, we are already implementing the test case for this new method, but the method just does not exist at all. It has not been implemented. So and that's the right way uh, of doing TDD. So we will start with a test case that will actually fail because we don't have the method, and then we will move forward to implementation later. Okay, so now when repository uh, invokes get items async, uh, we will return all the items that we have prepared in here. Remember, this is the call to the repository, it's not the call to the controller, get items async. So then we go ahead and prepare our controller. And then uh, comes the time to, to make the call uh, to the act. Now here we're going to be a, a bit more explicit. The first is we're not going to be using bar on the left side because we want to signal to the uh, to C sharp and to VS Code uh, what we're going to receive from this new method, a method to be created yet. So in this case, what we're going to receive is a, an I enumerable of item DTO. And this is going to be found items. And are we missing something? Yeah, system collection generic was missing. And then uh, this is going to come by calling await controller get items async. But not the signature. We need a new signature where we can uh, actually items async. We need a new signature where we can receive the name to match. So we're going to pass name to match here, okay? And yeah, so yeah, that's a method yet to be created. And then as uh, as our assert, what we want to verify is that we only got items that uh, where their name match the name to match in this case potion. So to verify that, we will say found items should only contain. And then we can say uh, item where item.name should be equals to item. Yeah, it will be items sub, uh, sorry. So this is all items sub zero dot name, because that's the first one. Let's scroll up a little bit. So we had zero and we got one and, and two. So we, it should be that one or, and then we'll just copy this, should be item name, should be equals to all items sub two dot name. Okay, so that's a way that you can use Fluent Assertions to verify that the items in a collection match some condition. So whatever we got in, we get in four items, uh, the items should match either potion or high potion in this case. Okay, so if we go ahead and build this, so I'll do Ctrl Shift B. Of course it fails, because uh, we don't have such a method get item facing that receives some argument. So that's kind of the, the red face of TDD. And now to start moving into the green face, we need to move forward and uh, implement uh, implement this, um, this method. 
to do that, what we can do is just click here. I'll do a control dot and that uh, presents these options. So what we can do is just say generate method items controller get items async. So I'll do that. And then if I do F12 here, the method now exists. And I'll move this up just next to the one that we have already, the other overload here. Okay, and then we could go ahead and try to implement this, uh, but as you notice, these methods have exactly the same thing, but one of them receives a parameter and the other one does not receive it. So I think it's better to just put everything in this one method uh, as opposed to try to implement yet a second one. So I'm going to just take this parameter out of here and into there, over there, okay, and then uh, we are not expecting to always receive the name. It depends on what the color wants. Uh, so let's make so that this uh, can receive null. So it is allowed to receive null. Okay. And so with that, let's go ahead and run our test case uh, once again. Let's see what we get. Uh, I mean, at this point, it should build just fine. Let's verify that. It should build. Yeah, it does build. Now let's run the test. Yep, and, and, and as suspected, it is failing. Yep. It is failing because it is getting uh, more items than expected. Uh, and, and on this, as a result, found items is just getting all the items. It's not getting only the ones that have been specified here. So let's see how we can fix this. So let's try to get green. So what we're going to do is something very simple. After retrieving the list of items, we're going to apply some filtering if we have to apply the filter. So if string that is null or white space name uh, name to match actually let's let's just rename this to name as opposed to name to match that should be enough if name is null or white space yeah if it is not null or white space then we will apply a filter on the list of items that we already received so items is going to be items where item item dot name contain con contains the name and just to make sure that we don't uh, we don't worry about casing here uh, let's do string comparison dot ordinal ignore case with that it doesn't matter if you're looking for potions for with capital P or with a, a smaller P it should shouldn't matter we don't we don't care about that uh, so as long as as a name has been provided it will be used to to do a filter on the items so we get a filtered list of items and that should be enough to satisfy the condition so let's go back to the test let's run it yep and this time uh, it is passing so we are green and let's actually confirm that this is true by running the entire test suite now and making sure that we have not broken anything. So yeah, as you can see, everything is green now. And so uh, everything looks, looks great. So that's how you, how you can use a TDD. Uh, uh, we don't really need to do more refactoring here at this point, uh, but if you needed to, you, you feel free to go ahead and do more refactoring. But we have gone through the red phase, green phase, and now refactoring is not, not needed in this case. Uh, what we can do now is to verify that this new functionality actually works in the, in the, in the real life. Uh, so we will start our, our host and we will see uh, how to use this from Postman. Okay, so I'll go ahead and hit F5. And then I'm going to Postman yep, over here. So let's see, to start with, let's see what we have currently in our database. So I uh, have here uh, the, the URL to get all the items in the database. So I'll hit send. And at this point, we have Mega Potion and Antidote. And um, we are already verifying that things are not broken because we already invoked this method that has been modified. It can receive a, a parameter now, but it seems to be working just fine. So to properly verify that the new functionality is working, I'm going to actually add uh, yet another, another item here via the post action. So I'll just copy the URL and say plus, I'll switch this to post, paste the URL, and in the body, I'll do raw, and I'll do JSON, 
and then I'll just copy the body of something else here. Copy this. Notice that the previous items uh, don't have a description, and that's fine. And the new item will have one. Let's make sure we can add one. So let's do this. That. And then to keep things simple, I'll just name this guy Potion, and this is going to be stores a small amount of HP. And the price is going to be, let's say, 7. So let's pause this. Okay, it's there. And if we go back to our get uh, operation, I hit send. Here we can see that we have the three items now created. So now is, is when we can see if the filtering is working. So now I can say that name equals, and I'll, I'll be looking for potion, right? So potion. So this should only give me the mega potion and the potion. So I'll go ahead and hit send. And indeed, we're only getting these two items. Notice that it didn't matter that I use a, a smaller P here and not the capital P that we have over there. It was still able to find the items. So things are working as expected. So yeah, that's how you can use uh, TDD to drive your, uh, your process to add new functionality to your REST API. So as always, I hope this was useful. And if you're looking into diving deeper into what I have covered in this tutorial series, uh, please check out the link to my full online course in the video description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.